of different issues. So today, it's very much uh, an opening discussion about what the, European, the new European Bauhaus means, uh, both for the LIFE project, uh, the LIFE program, and more generally. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the engagement of citizens in uh, the new European Bauhaus and the sense of interdisciplinary uh, opportunity that exists across uh, different uh, professions, different disciplines, uh, different skills, um, artists. Uh, we know about the importance of uh, building design and we know about the importance of building materials, but the new European Bauhaus is also more of a lifestyle concept. So we'll be looking a little bit at that. And also when it comes to incentivizing behavioral, behavioral change, we'll be learning from life projects that are very much engaged with people at a grassroots level to uh, develop this concept of, of incentivizing uh, behavioral change and also monitoring uh, behavioral change. So this is the first of three Bauhaus radio slots uh, today. We'll be going up until 9.30 when the formal conference uh, gets started. Then we'll be coming back on air at 11.30 Brussels time for half an hour and then a further session between 1.30 and 2.30 this afternoon. At each time, we'll be reviewing uh, what's been going on in the conference and discussing various aspects of the LIFE program with various guests. And I hope that as more and more people come into this great venue here, this event lounge here in Brussels, which is very kind of bauhaus -y in a sense. I don't know if that's really an adjective that I can, I can use. I've rather invented that one, but it's very bauhaus -y, very trendy, very post-industrial. Um, and uh, we have... Many, many people attending on site today and hundreds more attending online. So it really promises to be an absolutely fascinating discussion. I'm very pleased to be at the center of this um, in terms of bringing people together, learning from them about their contributions to the LIFE program historically, historically but also learning about how uh, the LIFE program can intersect and become very much uh, a part of and at the center indeed of the new European uh, Bauhaus movement. Well, of course, it's the breakfast show. I have my cup of coffee in front of me. I have fizzy water. Uh, but of course, the first thing you learn on radio is that you don't eat while you're on air. So I'll be looking forward to my um, full English breakfast or rather full extra community breakfast um, after the first. Jonah Malbasic, who's uh, from Nemo. And now, for those of you who know all about the LIFE program, well, you'll know not what NEMO is. But first of all, Yvonne, it's great to have you on. Um, can you explain our role uh, in, the, in the LIFE program? So we are monitoring LIFE projects uh, that are implemented in all EU member states, as you know. So currently, I believe I have around 170 colleagues all across Europe. And then we are a small coordination team here in Brussels. Uh, uh, of which I'm also uh, a part of. Uh, we are kind of in between the, um, uh, the Commission on the one hand and the beneficiaries on the other hand who are implementing the project. So, of course, we are monitoring, you know, doing formal monitoring, uh, checking whether projects are implemented uh, in, in a way they are, they are supposed to be implemented. We also help the beneficiaries explain uh, you know, the, the, the complex, sometimes, uh, rules of the LIFE program. We try to help them, you know, to bring the policy feedback uh, back to the policymakers here in, here in Brussels. So this is what we would say is a core of, of our business. Um, we also organize this kind of event, so we help the Commission organize uh, this kind of events. In our jargon, we call it the platform meeting. So it's a thematic, uh, thematic event where, you know, projects who are have something in common, come together to discuss life, horizon, uh, you know, um, uh, sometimes interact other projects uh, as well. We also have uh, a lot of communication activities. You met some of my colleagues here, uh, Claire and, and her team and, uh, and Gopacon team as well, which is very much involved in the organization of this event. So we are also doing um, uh, a lot of publications, a lot of outreach, you know, trying to spread the good word about uh, interesting activities that the uh, LIFE projects are implementing across Europe. So in a nutshell, that's what we, uh, we do. Yeah, indeed. And, and you mentioned the communication side of things. We'll, we'll come on to that um, probably several times during these, these three days of radio discussions because clearly um, the LIFE program you know, has lasted so long because it's been such a good news story, I guess, because it's engaged people at, at the political level but also very much at the grassroots level. Um, and, and it, it packs a punch way above 
you know, what it, what it uh, is in effect allocated. It really delivers value. I think nobody would really dispute that. When you talk about the LIFE programme, though, I mean, what we often hear in the news is more about the nature side of things, but you're very much focused on, on the environment side of things. To what extent do those two elements interact within the LIFE programme? Um, and, and can you explain more about how the um, environmental side of the LIFE programme has developed, particularly as we look towards more and more climate sensibility? If you look at, um, if you look at the LIFE strands as they are now, you know, so the nature side, environment, also climate action, governance projects, you know, they are now integrated projects which are implemented on a much larger scale, you know, they are um, approximately 10 years along, they aim at implementing a particular piece of uh, strategy, for example, the, the river-based management plan, for, for example, so they're, they're, much, they're much larger. If you look at, for example, a lot of nature projects also have aspects of climate change adaptation. You know, we are going to discuss the nature-based solutions here on the third day uh, of the conference. So, of course, in our world, you know, the, the things are interconnected, you know, and, and in the context of this conference in particular, we started looking at life projects in a different way, you know, so we also realized that uh, quite a lot of um, uh, environment projects had these aspects of behavioral change, you know, and uh, not only governance, where, you know, we sort of knew it was happening uh, much, much more, much, pro much more prominently than in, um, than in some other projects, but it is also the case for the environment, for nature. So in reality, of course, things are interconnected, you know, it's, you don't have these clear cuts as we do uh, and for the administrative purposes, I would, uh, I would say. Um, of course, certain you know, projects are very specific in what they do. So, um, you know, if they're developing a particular technology to, you know, um, uh, find a solution for wastewater treatment, clearly they are, you know, very much focusing, uh, focusing on that. But uh, I think we have quite a lot of life projects that are, you know, addressing several issues or looking at issues, environmental issues or climate change issues in a more kind of holistic, holistic and comprehensive way. Let me ask you also about the circular economy, because this is a concept that we hear an awful lot about in, in, in policy circles. Do you think that, I mean, to what extent do you see society actively engaging and in, in, in embracing this concept? And to what extent do you think it has to be driven by, you know, policymakers? I mean, we're in, we're in Brussels, the heart of policymaking. Are people waiting to be told how, to, how they should be approaching these aspects of, of, of climate adaptation and mitigation? Or are they actually leading the way for policymakers, in a sense, to follow? I mean, how do you feel that balance is, is going? In my view, it's a kind of dance, you know. I mean, policy always sets the, uh, you know, sets the tone, sets the priorities. Uh, this is then followed usually by some kind of, you know, budget and that kind of, that kind of support. But I think for, uh, and I think for, for many life projects that is the case, especially those that work on the um, community level or that try to engage the, the local communities, I think there is a recognition more and more nowadays that, you know, we need to live more sustainably, you know. I think it's not a... Um, it's not that you only have to have sort of financial incentives. We are going to discuss about these issues today uh, uh, in, in the course of the day uh, to you know, encourage people to behave more sustainably. I think this has become a kind of major discourse now and that it has become more, uh, uh, more accepted than maybe, uh, maybe a while ago. So I don't know if you would agree with me, Yael. <laughs> yes, yes, well, we, we have, <laughs> yeah, Yael Maros has kindly joined us as well. And um, your, your colleagues, I mean, Yael, perhaps you can just ex explain your role um, as, as it uh, relates to the LIFE program. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Yael. I've been a LIFE program monitor for, well, almost, almost 20 years now. Um, and um, in the last uh, few years, I've been also engaged in this uh, the organization of such events. So going beyond the monitoring and helping, supporting projects, supporting the agency or the commission. So we are doing these uh, horizontal tasks in NEMO, uh, trying to provide more uh, ample, wider forums for um, discussion and to, to get some insights, both for policymakers, which is the... Um, the aim of this uh, event here, but also for the potential applicants and beneficiaries on how to best address their difficulties or to reach more effective results. So I'm also uh, in, in NEMO team. I'm also part of the governance uh, hub. I'm the leader of the governance hub, which is uh, why I'm also involved in sp 
specifically in the organization of this first day of the Bauhaus event, uh, because uh, in governance projects, the strand in life is, uh, is aimed at uh, instigating changes in behavior of different types of stakeholders. And actually, this is where I get back to what Ivona was mentioning before. You will see in, in this first day that how we have all types of stakeholders and types of beneficiaries, types of people um, that can instigate this change. We have the policymaker, we have uh, local community, grassroots organization, we have NGOs, we have associations, maybe industrial part is a bit missing, but there are also private companies, usually they're smaller ones. Um, and um, so this dance that Ivona was mentioning is, uh, is very much going to be evident today, for sure. I like the idea of a dance uh, this <laughs> yes. early in the morning. It's kind of <laughs> unusual. Um, let's come, come back to this announcement that was made in September 2020 about the new European Bauhaus that was made by the president of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. What did you think... Um, I'll ask you first, yeah, but I'm, I'm also very interested in Ivona's view on this. I mean, what did you think when it was announced? Did you think, wow, that's really something we need to, to get to grips with, you know, as, as the life project? Or did you also feel, well, in a sense, that's already a little bit what we've been going towards, and, and it's, it's a great way of elevating that. I mean, where, where was your thinking on this? Well, let me give you a third option. <laughs> <laughs> I was a bit puzzled because for me, the Bauhaus... Uh, okay, my, as maybe you know, from, you, you see from my name, I'm originally from Israel, and many of the Bauhaus architects fled Germany to Palestine at the time, and there are a lot of Bauhaus-oriented uh, uh, buildings in Tel Aviv. So for me, the Bauhaus is this. So I was a bit puzzled. I mean, wh what are we talking about here? And I must say that also the, some of the speakers whom I, I interviewed, so to say, uh, for this day, they were a bit, but the Bauhaus, isn't it about architecture and the school from the 20s? And so this was the first reaction. Then when you go into it and you listen to it carefully, you actually find um, a source of inspiration because um, it's, it's very important to, to highlight that it's the new European Bauhaus. It's not the Bauhaus. So, and it's nice that you take some of the principles of the older Bauhaus, so the social building and these kind of things and construction, and you add to them questions of sustainability, of course, for which at the time were not so... Uh, so prominent, were they? No. Exactly. And of course, also um, questions of beautifulness, but it was already back then uh, evident. But now I think the question of making things beautiful for everybody, it's, um, it's even more, I think, uh, urgent, because yeah. seeing the gaps in society between uh, different uh, layers and so why is beautiful only should be accessible to to the rich people yeah indeed i mean the 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 slogan behind this this conference is, is beautiful sustainable together and i think that that you know that very much underlines the 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 social component of of, of Bauhaus as well i mean ivona um as yael was saying you know this is a new european Bauhaus. It's also i guess the stress on the european in the sense that the previous the the initial the original Bauhaus was a german concept that Really, um, you know, we weren't an integrated continent uh, at that time. It was, it was after the First World War. There was, in the Weimar Republic, it was a very liberal environment, but that wasn't the case ac across Europe. I mean, this is a chance to bring those principles, you know, throughout. You're from a, a newer member state yourself. So, I mean, maybe this is something that can be applied in, in, uh, across Europe. Well, indeed, as, as you said, I'm originally from, from Croatia and uh, actually used to be the proud owner of the uh, <laughs> apartment in the Bauhaus building in, mm -hmm. in Budapest. So, you know, the style <clears throat> is very much evident, you know, in, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. So I was actually very excited when I saw this uh, initiative and I think also a bit puzzled, you know, when we were asked to help organize this conference, I was thinking, oh, <laughs> you know, what do we have to say about this? But then, of course, when you start reading about it, when you start learning more, you, you, you realize uh, what Yale already explained, that it's uh, inclusive, that's European, there are of course now this, all these elements of the uh, uh, sustainability and, you know, sort of coming together. Uh, so it was quite interesting for us, I think, as an experience also to look at life projects from a different perspective, you know. I think we realized very quickly when we started, you know, discussing about what life and certain horizon projects have to 
offer here, apart from the obvious, you know, energy efficiency and, and circularity, we realize that are actually quite a lot of common common elements, and there are quite a lot of, um, you know, good case studies that can be uh, that can be shown uh, in this event, but also to the uh, to the wider yeah. audience, hopefully. Yeah, you were, you were mentioning, um, you know, that, that a lot of architects left um, Nazi Germany uh, after the, when the, when the Bauhaus movement effectively ended. Uh, in the 30s. Can you just give us a, a, a picture of, of, of how the Bauhaus sprang up and what, what it was like in the 1920s? Um, because, you know, historically, um, it's, a, a, you know, a, a concept that we, we, we hear about. Then it was more design-based, I think, wasn't it? I mean, now we're looking at, at, at um, the new European Bauhaus <coughs> being, being a more, uh, let's say, all-embracing concept. But then it was you know, what what looks good, and there was this marriage of, of style and sustain of and not st sustainability then so much, but mm. style and, and substance, wasn't there? Yes. There was. I, I it's not really my I'm, I'm a political scientist in my <laughs> by background, so but actually I've I've been talking to some of the speakers who are, for example, one of the speakers in the first session today, Maya. She she did her. Um, dissertation about the Bauhaus movement. So she, uh, she explained some things oh, wonderful. to me. Wonderful. Well, we, 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 must, we must grab... <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, she, she, she might... Get her uh, on the radio. <laughs> I, I, I will try to convince her to come at, at around lunchtime. I've already started to do it. But, but uh, yes, um, it was more about design. Yeah. And, uh, yes, and being beautiful and uh, pragmatic in the, in, in the way that uh, the construction is made. For example, okay, maybe you can talk to her about it, but she mentioned that uh, one of her um, criticisms in the dissertation was that it's very male-oriented. Uh, it was a male movement. Right. Men. Okay. So this is another thing that this new European Bauhaus brings into the picture, I think, because we have a lot of women speakers. Yes. <laughs> and it's really... And I think what... It, it also I, it made me think what Yvonne said before, that yes, we have the LIFE project, but actually LIFE is a community of people. So actually many of the people that will speak today, yes, they will speak about their project, but actually they represent this chunk of society that actually wants to do more. So it's not really just a project, but it's who they represent, this community of doers and of like, changers. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really interesting. Um, Ivona, on, on that issue, perhaps you can give us some insight into you know, that kind of very special in, environment, that atmosphere that life has generated over 30 years, because you'll be seeing old friends here, um, but you'll also have people who are coming for the first time with a sense of wanting to engage with the LIFE programme. Um, you know, everything that I've done with the LIFE programme has, has marked it out as, as a very kind of, um, almost like a family-oriented place. And, and there's so much learning, isn't there? There's so much um, that you can absorb from other people in terms of their projects and their outlook and the partnerships. It's, it's like almost, you know, the more you get into it, the more you discover there is to discover. I think it's partially, of course, due to the program design, you know. Um, if you talk to people who are interested in, um, you know, in enhancing our environment or the nature or changing things for the better, you know, in the, in the environment in which we live, they're usually driven, I think, by certain passion, you know, of course, we all have jobs, but I mean, we always say this is for us more than a job, you know, we really care about our environment, we care about, you know, uh, the nature, we care about uh, all these issues that are addressed by, by LIFE program. So, you know, once the project ends, uh, LIFE has also this kind of feature of sustainability and uh, potential for replicability. So the intention is really for these good results that to last, you know, after the project, after the project ends. And uh, this is maybe more particular for, for nature, like you need to see, you know, you need to have activities or, or actions on the ground for many years to see, to see the improvement. So once this process starts, typically, you know, people would like to, you know, keep being engaged and keep doing, uh, doing the things that lead to, you know, improvements in our, in our environment. So I think this is, this is part of the reason, you know, yeah. that I think the program by design attracts this kind of, uh, um, you know initiatives and also you see that you see the enthusiasm on the ground really when you when we visit projects you know every year the monitors visit projects every year okay now in the corona times it's been virtual but I think this is the point of our job where you really see what's happening on the ground especially if you have a chance to talk to some of these 
um, uh, you know, we call them stakeholders, but you know, to us, these are people who really become then the part of the this 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 wider community and family, and who want to see the change, real change on the on the ground. So it's very inspiring, I think. Yeah. And yeah. I think this is what then gives you back this good energy and willing to continue and uh, um, be engaged with the uh, you know the program or the project or the community one way or another. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I'm not going to. Um uh, let you get away with easy questions today, I'm afraid. I'm fascinated by your role in, as, as leading the governance hub. Yeah. And I'd like you to tell us a bit more about that because clearly you have um, uh, various interlocutors in the, in the European Commission um, who are leading the policy process, the governance process. We've discussed the, the projects on the ground and you have levels of governance between there and the European level. You have local governments, district uh, governments, you know, who are very much engaged. Can you, can you just explain a little bit more about, about how that works for you? Okay, I will just explain where it, where it comes from. Because um, in our um, contract with the agency and the European Commission as monitoring team, we were asked to provide some sort of a horizontal um, thematic, uh, because usually we are regional. So I'm, for example, part of Team Assist, which is the, the team in charge of monitoring Italian, Slovenian and Maltese projects. Okay. So we have very good local, national knowledge, but there was something missing at the, um, let's say, horizontal uh, aspect. So we were asked in this contract to provide for this kind of uh, knowledge, so decentralized horizontal knowledge. And we came up with a list of, uh, I don't know, Ivana, how many are there? But 17 now? Yes, yeah. there are um, almost 20 hubs, so 20 themes, topics on which uh, we identify for each, we identify the leader that has to, um, uh, first, we, are, we were engaged in the last year or so in a mapping exercise. So it means that I looked at all the governance projects since 2007 that were financed by the LIFE program. Mm -hmm. So first it was a different name, it was called Information, but uh, it basically was, let's say, the, the grandfather of the current uh, <laughs> governance project. And um, so I mapped all of them, and really, you see there, you see the, the local municipalities, you see them, the, the regional, uh, you see the national governments. Uh, but uh, after this mapping exercise, me and Yvonne actually, we, were, we work on this together, on this hub. And uh, we, we came up with an idea. We say, let's look at which kind of interesting projects there are in the governance hub what kind of a workshop we can organize for policymakers and it, it happened that at this period, that it was a year ago almost, uh, there was the re ongoing revision of the um, Environmental Crime Directive. So this is just to give you an idea of what can be done in these hubs. Um, so we gathered all the projects that were dealing with environmental crime, so we're talking about trafficking of waste, we're talking about trafficking of wildlife, hunting, uh, illegal hunting of course, all these kind of a lot of uh, aspects of environmental crime, we collected all of them. We brought a proposal to DG Environment and DG Justice, so here enters the European policymaker, of course. And they said, look, we're interested in hearing the NGO's point of view on this uh, directive. So we gathered from these projects all the NGOs and uh, we, we organized this workshop as part of the hub's work and uh, we provided, we helped to provide this forum to provide feedback to the policymaker on the revision process and it was a very successful event and it, it helped the revision of the, of the directive. So this is one example of what can be done with these hubs. Mm -hmm. There yeah. are now other um, ideas in the, in the sack but we'll <laughs> keep them uh, <laughs> for now. I, I, I mean environmental crime is an interesting one because I believe that um, Member states now have an obligation uh, to um, to criminalise certain uh, act, acts against the environment, which is obviously a big step forward from from be, being a civil offence. Um, I can also remember writing about a life project on uh, storks. Mm. Um, I think you probably can remember this one in Poland, where there was a problem with storks flying into electricity lines. Oh, this uh, um, quite a. Yes, the white stalks. So, I mean, the, the breadth of life projects is truly astonishing. I mean, you, you must be Thanks. discovering things all the time that you just, you know, um, amazing the sense of, of, of commitment as well. Um, I want to ask you about this, Ivona, because obviously you've both been involved with, with building this conference up and, and putting it together. 
Um, you know, what are people telling you about what they're hoping to get out of the next three days here in Brussels? Well, one big aspect of any event like this is, of course, networking. And especially for those who come physically, I think um, they are happy to have, you know, to join a, a physical meeting after, uh, you know, the, the lockdowns and the pandemics. Uh, of course, this is a hybrid event, so we are still going to have a large online audience. Uh, this is one aspect. Another aspect which I, for, for us was quite curious, I think, um, is to look a little bit wider, you know, to connect with people who are maybe doing something different. We have quite a lot of Horizon projects this time in, uh, in the event. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, this is, this is another aspect to learn a little bit from, uh, from others what, uh, what they are doing in, uh, in their respective fields. But also the hope is to give, uh, you know, feedback to policymakers. This is usually the, um, uh, you know, one uh, important aspect of, of, of such events to see what are the good solutions on the ground, you know, how can they potentially be uh, implemented on the larger scale, uh, you know, is there something that should be maybe included in the future calls for proposals, there is quite a lot it, already available now but also in the making. Life only is committing, um, uh, I believe, 30 million uh, euros um, uh, to the projects related to the Bauhaus. Uh, Just to this new European Bauhaus indeed, uh, indeed. initiative. And there are many, there are many, many others, many, many Horizon, uh, uh, Horizon uh, projects also that are going to be dedicated to uh, or have certain elements of the new European Bauhaus initiative. So I think that's that's also one. Uh, yeah, Horizon one is just just to remind um, everyone. Horizon is the EU's research and development program, which has quite a lot more money than the Life program does. But nonetheless, um, it's uh, it's focusing on um, related but but a different, more let's say high tech. I, I would say um, areas of, of research. Um, but it's interesting that you're also bringing together colleagues from Horizon Project so that you can um, develop uh, synergies. Um, I want to ask you, uh, Yale, about, uh, to go back to this, um, to, to, to the governance hub. I mean, mm -hmm. so, can you tell me some of the, the people who will be participating in person here who will be able to contribute to some ideas, concepts, um, shared experiences and best practices on this? Okay, so one of them I think you know already and you will also interview at lunchtime, I think. That's Eleonora de Sabata. Yes, indeed. From Clean Sea Life. So this is an example of an excellent governance project, for example. She will be speaking today at the first session. Um, this is, so for example, this is a project that you would say what is the link to the Bauhaus? Because it's about marine litter. Donc, okay, so th wow, this project encouraged... Pour voir. She will talk about it later, but... Um, uh, the pour voir, raised pour awareness on the need to collect waste uh, crier, quoi. on the sea. But since this first day of the event, we will dedicate to how can we change the mindset of people? So, since this project has been extremely effective in doing this, and I'm talking really cross categories, it's uh, fishermen, schools, scuba diving schools, um, policymakers. Uh, she will tell you all about it, but I think they reached the, um, the parliament with a new law, it's called Salva Mare, Save the Sea, and they helped to create lobby for this law, which I think now it's going to be maybe approved in the Senate, but she will give you all the details on this. They created also um, changes of policy at uh, municipal level. So this is an example of a governance project, which is it's not about just sharing information and awareness raising. It's about changing, changing behavior yeah, and yeah, mindset yeah. and of, of all types of stakeholders. So this is one of the best, one of the best projects in the recent years. But we have also other um, projects. I just I don't remember all of them now. There's but, a huge uh, list, actually. And there I mean, is a I mean, huge list. It's, it's, it's amazing that also the breadth, because, I mean, you, you mentioned clean sea life. And, and quite rightly, you might say, well, what's this got to do with, with the built environment? But, but here, it's about engagement, isn't it? Exactly. I mean, that's what we're discussing today. So I think they can share a lot from their experience with how to engage with people and how to change behaviors. So mm. this is why we, we selected them. But uh, yes, the governance projects, I mean, we have um, many other examples of, for, for example, managing food surplus in cities and directing them from food banks to small communities and uh, needy people in need. You have uh, gov other governance projects. I'm interested to remember now. But, uh, no, well, the f you mentioned the food waste, of course, which is waste. obviously a big... A big um, yes. I think that one was in Italy as well. There was, um, one, in Italy, there was one in Italy, uh, Food Waste Stand Up, yeah. yes. 
There was one in London, Trifocal, also excellent about project. another excellent Indeed, project. Yeah. So Hungary, these are in Hungary. We actually had a conference about food waste uh, in Hungary a couple of years ago. Maybe four years ago, yeah. 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 So really there are uh, many, many topics. <laughs> As you said before, the breadth yeah, of the... It's, 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 it's really amazing. amazing. But yeah. the, So yes, governance project is not just about social media posting and it's it's about changing behavior so through really sometimes very innovative also ways uh, well one of the questions that that we're going to be asking when we're talking about incentivizing behavioral change is the difference between the carrot and the stick approach uh, and i'm kind of interested in this because i, I mentioned ivana a little bit earlier this um this dual approach of of, of you know whether the, the role that policymakers have and whether you know, society is at the point now in, in considering the climate emergency, in considering the necessity of environmental protection, where actually you get this impetus coming from, from the ground up rather than coming from, from the, the, the top down. I mean, how do you see citizens' engagement and, and this sort of difference between the carrot and stick approach with, with projects that you're monitoring? I think it very much depends on the issue. Um, so one thing I, I often hear it's okay, when is all this organic food going to become more affordable? You know, this is like a common, uh, not complaint, but I would say, you know, the real, real concern, yeah. uh, concern that people have. Uh, it's uh, quite often you hear this uh, talk about the cost. You know, recently, I'll just give you an example. I had a conversation with a dentist who told me, you know, I would really like to reduce, you know, the plastic that I produce in my practice, but it's uh, expensive for me, you know, or it's, then I have to wash it, that has other costs, etc., yeah. etc. So clearly there is, you know, aspect of, of costs where, you know, uh, where you cannot really, I think we cannot expect uh, the, you know, the population at, at large uh, simply to embrace uh, more sustainable practices if it really has, you know, an impact on their, uh, on their budget, uh, let's say. Yeah. But on the other hand, you see, uh, I think there is a, a genuine willingness, you know, for uh, uh, the change of behavior and change of change of practices. Uh, one, as you mentioned food waste. I think for me this was really interesting uh, example from the uh, this event that I mentioned in Budapest. The, we had one of the participants from a large retailer in Poland, and uh, we had similar discussion. You know, how do you encourage your staff to, you know, not to throw away food, but to, you know, check whether it's expired or not and to, you know, give it yeah. to the right piece of purpose. Like, how do you, you know, encourage them to do that? It, it does create more work for them. And she said something which I thought was really interesting. She said, we don't have issues motivating people because they see it as something good. They see it as doing something good for their, for their community. So I think it really, it depends what the issue is here, you know, whether you need uh, more I would say we are also going to discuss it during the session. You know, under which circumstances you need maybe more formal measures to uh, legislative framework. Exactly, yeah. exactly, and yeah. all of that kind of uh, policy incentives. And and sometimes you know you have we are going to talk about aspects such as pre prestige, culture, or simply when something is perceived as, you know, it's not a lot of effort for me, but I'll be doing some good for the uh, people in need. So, um, in in these kind of circumstances, sometimes it becomes easier to encourage. Um, if I can add something, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe tomorrow we have uh, the project I Share Life. Are they on the list? Because this is a kind of a win-win situation, where you have private um, uh, transport companies that give the, they created several business models for um, car sharing services, and they incentivize their use, the users of these different models. So you have the touristic model, the, the, car, um, the car service for the company home, company train station. I mean, there are different kinds of models and they created this model where you, you pay the subscription to use the car service, but you also earn points and these kind of things. So everybody actually earns from this kind of, uh, let's say, has an advantage for this kind of a scheme and it's been really 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 successful and they have been they also replicated so this is another adjective and a, a verb and a, the noun that replication that we always mention to our projects they replicated it quite a lot uh, throughout Italy and in Croatia also too so this is a way of in providing incentives, so you earn points and then you can use, you have reductions and this kind of thing. This is one example of how you can provide these incentives to people 
but also thin. Economy, um, away from uh, the the sort of um, there's a phrase in it is, is it uh, use um, I can't remember now it's too early in the morning <laughs> well it's actually five past nine and yeah. um, well I'm going to have you on as long as you're willing to stay on Yale and Ivana but um, I will just say first of all have a very happy birthday to Claire Taylor who's done an awful lot to organise this conference too oh, really? and is no doubt rushing around uh, downstairs trying to get everyone in place. Um, but of course, this uh, being Bauhaus Radio, we're upstairs in the event lounge building. And if you're listening in the building, uh, we'd love to have you on uh, Bauhaus Radio to talk about your projects, to talk about your areas of expertise, your perspectives on the new European Bauhaus. So please do come up at any point. We have three programmes going on during the day. Uh, in the morning, 8.30 to 9.30. Uh, in the mid-morning, 11.30 to 12.00 and then 1.30 to 2.30, and we'll be reviewing some of the issues that are discussed in the formal sessions that, of course, if you're attending online, you'll be able to watch uh, on our, our web platform. Just to come back to um, the new European Bauhaus, um, Ivona, um, how do you see, um, you know, w w where is the interest as you perceive it from the projects and the people you you've talked to? Because you mentioned the aspect of energy efficiency, which from a climate perspective is obviously um, central. Um, but, you know, we can build, we know how to build energy efficiency, uh, energy efficient buildings. And you said to me the other day that, um, you know, we have a zillion technologies out there to deal with these issues. Um, you know, it, it goes beyond that. Um, what are people saying to you about, about how um, this concept of the new European Bauhaus can best uh, be, be, be integrated, if you like, into the LIFE programme, which, of course, is a very long-standing programme. Um, you know, do you see that as, as, as something that, that people want to, to hear about this week? I, I think so. We were, um, we were actually surprised, I think, uh, it's a good word, about the enthusiasm we also got from the, uh, fr from the speakers. It took a while to explain, as Yael already mentioned, you know, what is this new European Bauhaus, uh, this, this new concept. But I think once, you know, um, once we explain the, the, the concept to the participants, those of course who are not architects, you know, and to whom it might seem a little bit far from what, yeah. from what they are doing, I think they really, embra they really embraced it. And, and I think one of the reasons is this kind of inclusiveness and looking at things holistically. I think we have come to the point of realization that, you know, if we are going to, you know, achieve a sort of change that we would like to see uh, uh, happen and which is, you know, very much a part of the uh, European Green Deal, we need to have, you know, comprehensive solistic, uh, solutions, but we also need to implement them on the larger scale. And I think that's a real challenge. You know, we have a lot of, I think, it's going to become evident uh, in the course of these three days, we have a lot of good examples happening in various locations uh, uh, around around Europe, but I think the challenge will be how to implement them on the larger scale, on the ground. You know, uh, of course, yeah. you know there is EU funding, but this is only one part and like a seed funding basically. Uh, so the the hope is that um, you know the concept is going to be embraced by the member states also and by the local communities and by the local governments, yeah. and that they would kind of you know be a, a part of. Um, uh, you know, em embrace it in a sense of uh, implementing the uh, good solutions uh, on the on the ground. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, th this concept um, has been has been promoted as you know um, addressing global concerns at a local level, but that's in a sense something that the Life Program has been doing for thirty years. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, can, you, can you just elaborate a little bit on, on you, you have your, obviously your governance perspective, but, you know, these are often projects that are dealing with a very specific, I mean, on nature, very specific territorial area or a species area. Um, but, you know, the vision is global. Yeah. Um, that, that's going to be very much the, the approach of the new European Bauhaus, as I understand it. Yes, absolutely. And, well, yes, your, uh, light, the LIFE programme has always been doing small things, small scale things, but it's also true that in the last, let's say, 10 years, the, the need to um, show in the proposal stage already that actually what you're doing has a 
an European added value and it, that it's replicable and extend and can be extended easily to other uh, sectors or regions is very important. So it's not enough to be local, you have to think global. So that's already part of the proposal, I think, drafting for quite some time now. Yeah. And I think another novelty in the LIFE program in the last, uh, maybe since LIFE 14 um, call, is the integrated project, also strategic project they're called. And they go, uh, they look at problems or issues from a, either a regional perspective or a national one. And actually we have one of, one of actually probably more than one of such projects in the, um, in the event. Today we will have the um, River Basin Management uh, Plan uh, project of Malta. Mm -hmm. They will be talking about how they incentivize <laughs> Uh, users to reduce uh, water and also energy actually use. This is one of your projects. So, yes, yeah. I also monitor them because they're in Malta. So uh, and this and they work on a national scale. So that's where uh, Life has decided to go, just enhance the scale a bit and try to to work on implementation of certain directives at a bigger scale. Yeah. And we have some examples of these projects uh, with us in this, event, in this event. I'm also interested in in you know. The, the, in the European scale, put it that way, because, you know, environmental issues don't stop at the external border of the EU. Um, to what extent can member states um, and countries on the other side of the external border of the EU, I mean, is there a place for, for these countries in the LIFE programme? Or if not in the LIFE programme, is there a place for them in, in, in similar structures? Because clearly... You know, the countries that aspire to join the EU um, have certain legal obligations with regard to the environment, um, but this is obviously also a very good way to integrate them into the thinking and the, and the philosophy behind the LIFE programme. Can you just explain a little bit about that? Because, uh, you know, to come back to, the, to, to, to where you're from, Croatia, I mean, it's a relatively new member state, and, and you know, uh, it, of course, borders several other, member uh, several other countries that are not member states. Indeed. Um... In, yes, if, uh, if for example, we have some examples of life projects uh, where you know countries that are not member states are also participating, and typically it involves issues as you just described are uh, cross-border issues. So, for example, if we don't have such a project, but I'm just now guessing, if there would be a project, you know, in Croatia addressing pollution of the Sava River, which is uh, you know the border between. Uh, uh, Bosnia as well. Then you know you could imagine certain activities on the on the other side of the of the border. So these, you know, that there are these kind of projects in yes, in life. I can I, think I of like several. But well, that's a very good suggestion. I, you'll probably be asked <laughs> to draw up a project proposal by lunchtime <laughs> on that one. Again. The bird migration projects are a typical example. We have a yeah. project I think with the Norwegian partners mm -hmm. um, that uh, you know because yeah it's important to. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, to address, you know, the the the, the issue. There's no Schengen area for birds. No. Is there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is this is. I think another example that I would. I mean, this is not really an example, but I think this is what we often hear from those who are outside of Europe that they really look at Europe and European legislation as a as a good example, as an inspiration for their own countries. This is something you will hear quite often. And another element which we didn't really talk about yet. Uh, LIFE also provides support to the um, operating grants to the largest European NGO networks. Uh, we will have some of them represented here, um, the European Environmental Bureau, for example, the WWF Central Eastern European Office is also going to uh, participate in this, uh, we have in this event. Today. We have ECOLIS today. Uh, we will also have the Mediterranean Information office from, from Greece, uh, representative speaking, so I'm just naming a few, mm. there, there are many more uh, grantees. And typically they're also part of larger networks, you know, so for example, Friends of the Earth Europe, it's part of Friends of the Earth International, so there are, yeah. you know, synergies uh, all across, um, and people talk to each other. I mean, we, we mentioned Horizon, yeah. of course, in scientific community, you have a, a, a lot of cooperation with, uh, you know, outside of Europe. Uh, yeah. So I think, you know, in this interconnected world, the, the ideas really spread uh, fast, even if we are talking about, you know, uh, what we perceive as a small, maybe, life project implementing locally uh, these good a, ideas, indeed, they spread. The value added is, exactly. is tremendous. I think, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, let me come back to a point you were making a little bit earlier, which, which made me think. You were talking about the engagement of, of private businesses and companies. 
Um, I mean, this happens in the LIFE project, doesn't it, sometimes? I'm, I'm thinking of Italy, where you do project monitoring. I remember hearing about leather companies that were investing in technology yes. and processes to um, clean up the wastewater that's produced yes. from the tanning. Yes, ceramics process. industry is exactly. another uh, typical Italian case. Yeah. Yes, yes, you have these projects. There are not so much governance. This is why I was mentioning before the, the problem of the engagement. Yeah. But uh, there are many private companies, usually small and medium size, I must say, yeah. that are trying to introduce innovation into their production uh, processes. Uh, I have my colleague Lorenzo Mengali, uh, maybe you will manage to catch him. We'll grab him. Tomorrow yeah, we'll morning. Have him. Come on, Lorenzo. Um, he, he, ha he was involved in a, a platform meeting on the ceramic sector, for example, so he knows quite a lot about this one. And um, I, I'm now going to monitor a project about um, extracting, uh, oh God, lubricants from uh, wastewater treatment plants. So, you know, there, there oh, are right, quite okay. a lot well, of uh, interesting, uh, interesting things. So, but it's, it's more about when I, it, the engagement part of the governance project, which, which are maybe the private sector is a bit missing. In the food waste uh, project that you mentioned before in Italy, they were involved. It's very prominent, yeah. Yes, because they were um, the retailers, Involved and it it was quite successful their engagement, and there were also the uh, agro food companies, so reduction through processes. Yeah, I mean yes. I, I suppose because it's in everybody's interests um, to, uh, to you know to, it, there is a common goal at the end of the day, um, and and in food waste obviously um, you know there are all sorts of reasons why one would want to uh, to tackle that from an environmental but also from a social. Uh, perspective. Well, Yale, uh, Ivana, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, we're at 9.17 and um, to take us through to the first session uh, we have Lorenzo. Yeah, uh, it's actually for the session of tomorrow. Because well, was, sure, yeah. but um, you'll probably be too busy tomorrow, which is why I've grabbed, <laughs> yeah. you, grabbed you now. Um, it's great to have you on. Um, thank you very much for joining us um, and perhaps you can explain a little bit about your interaction with the LIFE program with this family that we've brought together here again for, the, for this three-day conference. Yeah, uh, I, I'm working, uh, I've worked with the, the LIFE uh, uh, program and the monitoring uh, uh, of the LIFE uh, projects from about uh, 2011 and uh, I currently deal mostly with uh, projects dealing with urban um, resilience and transformation, that's why I was involved also in the, um, let's say, development of uh, and organization of the second uh, day. Right. So New European Bauhaus means something profound to you in terms of, of, of the built environment. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, of course, uh, for, for the session of uh, tomorrow, actually, uh, uh, I also uh, got help from uh, other two colleagues of mine. Ludovico Susani and Cristina uh, Rabozzi, who, who uh, are more uh, in, in the topics of energy performance in buildings and uh, the circular economy. But uh, all together, let's say, uh, the three of us dealt with uh, this urban transformation uh, topic uh, within the, the, the new European Bauhaus uh, initiative. Right, because tomorrow we have issues to do with, with energy efficiency, energy poverty. I'd like to be, um, to be exploring that with, with some of my guests. Um, but, but as we were saying with Yale and, and with um, Ivona just a little bit earlier, it's, it's so much more than energy efficiency. Yeah. There is a social dimension to this, right? Of course. I mean, um, what, are you, what are you finding out about the new European Bauhaus and, and where you think that life should be, should Hello, be Clara. orienting itself towards. Good morning. Yeah, I, I mean... think that uh, um, they, they are aligned. It's, uh, it's a kind of perspective where you Good have morning. to involve all the relevant stakeholders to somehow guide uh, uh, through these new uh, Green Deal uh, objectives. Hello? But uh, of course, uh, everyone uh, needs to do his own uh, part. And uh, the, the, the citizens uh, and uh, the people uh, need to be involved. And uh, so this uh, initiative within the new European Bauhaus also... Hello? Good morning. Uh, ...is aligned with life uh, and uh, tries to, to make all the relevant stakeholders speak 
and found, find solutions. Can you tell me a bit about the work that LIFE is doing with regard to construction materials? Because I think there are projects underway Hello, Clara. to um, limit the morning, amount of waste. It's a huge amount of waste. construction yeah. waste. Yeah. It's yeah. extreme. I think it's, it's a very big problem. The biggest in the European Union, I think, can as far you, as you know, volume is, is concerned. Um, you know, how, how much can we reuse? I, I am being muted. Can you hear me now? For whatever reason, want to tear down and, and start again. I mean, is that is 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 the building going to become as recyclable as that glass bottle on my table? <laughs> we we hope so. There are a lot of uh, innovative projects dealing with the different part of the, for example, construction uh, waste materials. Uh, uh, one of the most difficult thing is to sort all the different materials. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, trying to also find new uh, materials that uh, allow more and more uh, recycling and easier uh, solution uh, for, for this kind uh, of issue. Uh, of course, uh, all these projects uh, are still uh, in, in the development uh, uh, of the technology, so yes. uh, there are a lot of... Uh, our lights are just going on and okay. off because we've sat, we've sat so still. It's been such an absorbing conversation I've been having with you and your colleagues this past hour that I haven't moved at all. So the lights need to be activated. Okay. I, I'm, I'm sorry for that, but um, you were saying about um, about the need to sort and and the, and the need to identify. I mean, it's conceivable that buildings could, in a sense, have their own identity document ultimately, so that you know yeah. exactly what was. Also, all this uh, new digital transformation uh, uh, can allow to trace uh, better all the materials uh, and uh, to, to have uh, an easier life uh, in uh, recycling uh, all the different parts uh, for a new uh, use. And so, you're monitoring projects in a particular region or country? Yeah, mostly uh, the projects I deal with uh, are from Italy. Uh, I, I'm based there, and so. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, the, the life projects have uh, quite wide partnerships, and so also uh, one Italian project can uh, do activities uh, in uh, other countries. So uh, I also uh, visited other uh, plants uh, or or uh, cities uh, where some uh, solutions yeah. uh, were developed. But Italy would seem to me to be the perfect testing ground for the new European Bauhaus, because obviously there's the innate Italian sense of style. I mean, I speak as somebody who's married to an Italian, so you know, I, I appreciate this very much. But you also have a huge geographical area from the north where it's freezing cold yeah. to you know, baking hot Calabria and, or and Sicily. Very dense cities uh, yes. and a lot of historical cities, which is uh, a nice thing, but also a potential problem because uh, in uh, renovation of uh, historical uh, buildings, uh, you have uh, a lot of uh, uh, restrictions and, and so... Uh, we need also to figure out how to maintain uh, the aesthetic value, which is a key aspect of the new European Bauhaus, while uh, allowing uh, the reduction of energy consumption uh, and uh, also uh, making, uh, uh, let's say, more green uh, all, all the, the buildings so that also the, the climate aspects uh, can be somehow uh, tackled. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously, we're, we're, I think the Colosseum is a bit too far gone to be renovated uh, at the moment. But, uh, you know, th this is a genuine problem in, in historical centres, isn't it? I mean, how do you deal with the, the heritage we have, um, you know, when you need to heat or cool buildings or improve the efficiency of heating and cooling? Um, a lot of these buildings are protected by law, yeah. right? I mean, you... you is, is the LIFE programme looking at ways that that can be tackled from a regulatory and also from a practical... Yeah, there are, there are some uh, projects, uh, uh, not only in LIFE, also Horizon uh, uh, is a programme that uh, look uh, in that direction. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the solution is never so easy because uh, we have to to deal with the, all the restrictions by laws uh, and trying to find the most, uh, let's say, less impactful uh, solutions. 
What does being part of the LIFE program mean to you? Because we've talked about it before, this sense of, of community, of family in the LIFE program, of, of being able to learn from each other and, and to connect to each other in a very special way that, that is quite unusual, I think, across EU pro programs. I mean, what does it mean to you being involved? Yeah, it, so far, it was a wonderful experience because... Uh, uh, from one end, uh, uh, you can see that this uh, high-level uh, uh, um, public authorities uh, are actually doing something. And on the other side, uh, you see the beneficiaries uh, and uh, all the very interesting people that are uh, having new ideas. Uh, and so uh, uh, I'm very lucky to um, have... Uh, the opportunity to, to listen to all these ideas and also you, you see the people uh, that uh, somehow benefits for, from the project's uh, results that can see the, the let's say, the, the benefits uh, of uh, having uh, such kind of programs uh, at uh, European level that uh, somehow uh, try to improve their life. And in terms of what you want to get out of this personally, this, these three days here, you know, with your particular area of specialization, what, what are you looking for to, to take back to Italy with you? I hope that uh, we will manage uh, in these three days uh, to make all the relevant stakeholders talks uh, and to possibly uh, make also the, the policy makers uh, uh, have uh, a common uh, uh, goal, vision, really, vision yeah. and goal uh, with, with uh, all these uh, beneficiaries that are developing technical solution uh, in, in, uh, on, on site. Yeah. Well, Lorenzo, thank you very much for joining me this morning. Uh, you've been a very generous guest with your time because I know that you have other things to focus on and we're looking forward to hearing more about your, your presentation uh, tomorrow and uh, I may have you back on um, to follow up on that because there's so much interesting to discuss uh, this week just to take uh, our listeners through uh, Bauhaus Radio uh, we have three sessions every day and of course if you're listening uh, in the venue uh, as the conference venue starts to get ready uh, and we have uh, the moderators uh, warming up their voices no doubt you're very welcome to pop upstairs here in the event lounge to appear on Bauhaus Radio to tell me about your project to tell me about your area of expertise your passion and your knowledge um, and the way that that interacts with both the new European Bauhaus concept and the LIFE program uh, more generally. So please do come up uh, to, to see me during these three sessions every day for this uh, three-day conference um, so that we can include you, we can include your project and your work. And one of the things we can also do is hopefully match you to others who are interested in your particular area of expertise because there'll be a number of uh, blind dates for want of a better expression going on uh, during these three days here at the event lounge to put people together that's the whole purpose of the conference after so long without these in-person conferences the networking uh, the discussions the ideas that Lorenzo was uh, referring to so with that with the time coming up to 9.29 and just a minute to go before we start I hand back to our moderators
Good morning and a very warm welcome on behalf of the European Commission to this hybrid conference on beautiful, sustainable, together life in the new European Bauhaus. I'm delighted to welcome you, whether you're here with us in the room today at the event lounge or watching online via the conference website, social media, or this morning on the DG Klima website, which is streaming this opening session. My name is Jackie Davis. I'm going to have the privilege of being your master of ceremonies over the next three days. How to apply the new European Bauhaus concept in three key areas which will be vital for the green transition. Changing mindsets and incentives for behavioural change, transforming urban areas and promoting nature-based solutions. I'll tell you more about the programme later on. Just note for now, if you would like to tweet about what you are hearing over the course of these three days, and we do encourage you to do so, let's get that new European Bauhaus message out. Please use the hashtag new European Bauhaus. You can also use the hashtag life programme. So, European Commissioner for the Environment, Oceans and Fisheries, Virginia Sinkevicius, couldn't be with us this morning, but he did want to talk to you. So he sent us a video message. Let's hear what he has to say. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this platform meeting. This is your chance to inspire and to be inspired. You are the change makers that the European Green Deal Nature underpins everything we do, but if we lose biodiversity, it is an existential threat to humankind. So we need a new approach to nature. We need to see human activity through the lens of biodiversity and nature. It means urgent action to stop and reverse this loss. And why, that's why the EU has a biodiversity strategy to put nature on a path to recovery by the end of this decade. The nature and climate are closely interrelated. They have to be tackled together. And that's what we are doing with the European Green Deal. It's designed to help people and businesses benefit from a sustainable green transition. We need everyone on board because we all depend on nature and we can all be part of the solution. LIFE is the EU funding program for environment and climate action. Together with the new European Bauhaus, it's accelerating the implementation of the European Green Deal. The new European Bauhaus has the potential to make the Green Deal a cultural, positive, human-centered experience, helping us feel, see, and experience the impact of the green transformation, and showing how to live in harmony with our physical surroundings. By co-designing and co-developing new ways of living together, the new Bauhaus will enhance our quality of life. It means sustainability with a more central role for circularity, a new focus on quality of lived experience and more inclusiveness than ever before. And it means spaces that are accessible, places that people can afford. If we want society to be healthy and our economy to be strong, we need to look after our nature. Because the route to transformative change includes restoring our ecosystems and preserving our biodiversity. By joining forces, Life and the new European Bauhaus will do these things together with tangible solutions for real world problems. To help these changes happen, we are speeding the process and front loading funds. This year's life call includes 13 million euros pre allocated to Bauhaus projects. That's true to the spirit of life, demonstrating and promoting innovative techniques to deliver on the objectives of union legislation. Funding is one key part of the story. This platform is another. It's vital for pooling expertise and bringing together inspiring projects. It's also a chance to reflect on lessons learned and on the best way forward. With your creativity and your dedication, we are determined to make the new European Bauhaus a resounding success. Let's use it to design this future together and turn our beautiful, sustainable visions into a new reality on the ground. Thank you. So, Commissioner Sincevicus there, uh, telling us why we are here. He talked about it as a chance to inspire and to be inspired. And he said, you are the change makers that make the European 
Green Deal happen. You're the people it needs. And that's why these three days of discussions are so important. I'm now delighted to welcome Clara De La Torre, Deputy Director General in the European Commission's Directorate General for Climate Action, better known to those of us in Brussels as DG Klima, to talk to me a little bit more about the issues we're discussing over these three days and what she hopes will come out of this conference. Uh, so Clara, a very warm welcome. Uh, very good to have you with us today. Uh, delighted to welcome you here. Um, Clara, as I say, uh, from DG Klima, DG Klima web streaming this session. I'm hoping uh, that Clara is out there. Clara, can you hear me? Um, yes, good morning. Good morning, Clara. Uh, very warm welcome. And thank you so much for being with us uh, here today. Clara, I just wanted to go back to what the commissioner said at the outset of his remarks. When he talked about new European Bauhaus, he said, has the potential to make the Green Deal a cultural, positive, human-centered experience. Is that how you see it? How important is it? Um, for, first, for, for inviting us, Digi Klima, as you say, here in this conference, because it is very important. Uh, very important initiative, and as Commissioner said, and you 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 reminded us, is a cultural positive, human centered experience. The Bauhaus, which is fully part of the Green Deal, and it has exactly it's in the, in the same spirit. Because the European Green Deal is much more than climate policies. It provides, it promotes a whole change in society, a whole governance and government approach to all sectors of the economy, all generations. Um, for this green and digital transformation to happen in a way that is not, nobody is left behind. So the, the European Bauhaus Initiative, the European Bauhaus Initiative, connects the European Green Deal to our living spaces. What is it more human that, than the, our personal living spaces, personal and, and social living spaces? Um, we, the initiative of the of Bauhaus aims are shaping our thinking, our behaviors, also markets, new ways of living and new ways of building, and very importantly, new ways of doing public procurement. Public procurement is a very powerful, powerful means to change, uh, to change uh, our society. But none of this can happen top down, and therefore local, local governments, stakeholders, suppliers, citizens, are key partners of um, for turning the, the EU policy, the EU ambitions into, into, into a reality. And there are, as you know, many European initiatives and programs that support this acceleration to become climate neutral. And we have the EU Covenant of Mayors, a fantastic network of, of elected mayors that are very committed to this transformation, smart cities, marketplace, the New Horizon Europe mission for climate adaptation and the one for cities. We'll come back to them afterwards. So it's uh, that we have a panoply of initiatives that make this transformation that we need in our society all encompassing, leaving no one behind. Thank you very much. And so absolutely crucial as part of the EU's drive to make this transformation a living reality and underpinned, of course, by those new European Bauhaus values, sustainability, aesthetics and inclusion. Uh, we're going to talk about three different key areas over the next three days. Uh, and Clara, I wonder uh, if we could discuss each of those a little bit of in turn, starting with today's topic, changing mindsets and incentives for behavioural change. Uh, apologies there, my mic had a little glitch. Uh, we're going to talk about those uh, over the course of today. We have three panels on this topic. How important do you believe this issue of behavioural change, of mindsets, is going to be? Uh, and how can the new European Bauhaus concept, which is all about co-creation, co-design, how can this really help? We have seen that if we continue behaving, behaving in, in the broad sense of the world, of the word, as of now, we see where we are going. So it is clear that for this big transformation, we need a change in behavior. Legislation is meant to change behaviors. But beyond that, we need to have uh, personal engagement of the citizens of the businesses and the local uh, stakeholders. We have launched in the, in, the, in the European Commission, we have launched the European Climate Pact, precisely to make sure that everyone can help build- Recording in progress. 
and um, and support the the the, the, the achievement of the, of, of the policy goals that we have. And everyone has a role to play in this transformation. And every action, as small as it can be, counts. Citizens, governments, public and private organizations can join the pact and uh, do a pledge for climate, it engage in action for the, uh, for, the, for, for the climate. And the, the European Bauhaus projects can lead to, com to, to, to concrete commitment pledges. For instance, uh, green public buildings, uh, building with local materials uh, for harmonious coexistence with nature, commitments among, di among different cities mm. to support uh, sustainable ways of living. So the change of behavior, the change in which we do things are is essential to our to our ambition. So you mentioned the climate as the Fit for 55 package, uh, the adaptation strategy, the EU missions under Horizon Europe, a whole panoply uh, of policy levers and instruments and programs that can be used to drive that. When it comes to transforming urban areas, and you talked about the greening of our buildings, again, how important is this? This is central to the transition. Again, how do you see New, Europe, New European uh, Bauhaus fitting in with that? It is central to that because um, without the city, the city governments, uh, we can't do anything. We need local green deals, if you want, if, we, if you allow me the expression. Um, and we should we should think of 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 the of the degree of transforming the economy to a greener economy is a means of growing and having job opportunities. And we know that most of the a huge proportion of the citizens live in urban areas, whether big or small, and therefore. Um, the, the, the cities become living labs for testing and upscaling a number of, of, of solutions that will bring higher productivity in terms of uh, greater efficiency of the use of natural resources, reducing waste, um, reducing energy consumption, but at the same time create new opportunities for innovation and very importantly for shared values for business and the society. And you, we know that, that, that the green growth relies on technological and non-technological innovations, on green investments, and with the expression of the green consumerism. So in this transition towards a climate neutral society, with, as you say, the Fit for 55 uh, package, other adaptation uh, strategy, we have, we have a challenging tasks uh, because we need to change the way we produce, we move, we heat or cool our houses, but, and all this, much of all this happens in cities. Mm -hmm. So um, we have challenges and we have opportunities and the cities are real core places where this happens. We need also to bring together public and private investments um, so that this is a joint project. It, it, as I was saying, it is cannot be a top-down project, it's a joint project and businesses in cities, citizens do have to have a, a, a participation. We have launched a new support facility, policy support facility, which is a pilot uh, technical assistance, which is mainly uh, aimed uh, at small and medium sized cities. And the Covenant of Mayors will be implementing this facility and supporting the, the local authorities to take adaptation measures on the ground. And uh, we are, uh, of course, looking at old legislation that around uh, the, the buildings, for example, to adjust better the construction or refurbishing of the buildings that we have in our urban environments. We have the missions that we're referring to uh, that starting are grounded in Horizon Europe, the framework program for social innovation, but aim at going beyond that. These are innovative ways of working. And we have one which is precisely uh, uh, shaped around the cities to make cities uh, smart and climate neutral by 2030. And we have another one which I have the honor to lead, which is on mission uh, adaptation for to climate change. And there we are, we are targeting uh, regions and communities, which can be cities as well, for them to become climate resilient. And all this, all this in both missions via a strong participatory uh, uh, mechanism. Thank you. And in our discussions tomorrow, we will be focusing on that issue of the energy efficiency of buildings. Uh, we'll also be looking at the circular economy and, as you talked about so eloquently, Clara, sustainable cities and districts. Um, let me turn to our third area, uh, nature-based solutions, talking about that on 
uh, at the third day of this event. Um, how do you see that fitting into the overall picture, Clara? For adaptation to climate change, nature-based solutions are a real, real blessing, if I can say. Um, greener, biodiversify, friendly uh, urban spaces benefit all of us as citizens and as a business. And this is why the EU will continue funding projects that address our site of challenges through nature-based solutions for building uh, our, our future sustainable societies. And let us not forget that we have once in a generation opportunity uh, to build back better after this crisis, or hopefully it will be soon over. Uh, the amount of resources, public and private, that are on the table should be at the core of the reconstruction of uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, adapted uh, of an adapted regions and and cities and much of the solutions not all of them but much of the solutions are nature based solutions thank you very much um again coming back to something the commissioner talked about he said funding is a the key part of the story, not the only part, but a very central element. Uh, we're going to hear over the course of the next three days about projects financed by the EU through LIFE, through Horizon 2020. There are also, of course, other uh, funding mechanisms available. What do you see, Clara, as the key challenges to make sure uh, that those projects can not only be scaled up, because that is really important if we are to have a genuine impact uh, on the green track. To inspire others, the commissioner started by saying this conference is an opportunity to be inspired and to inspire. What's the key challenge here in terms of selecting the right projects, their implementation, to get that scale up, to get that replication that comes through genuine inspiration? As you know, Jackie, one of the big challenges of the European innovation system is precisely translating knowledge, the knowledge that we create in the European Union into use, to, 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 to embed it into our, our economic and, and social system. So, um, and publicly funded research and innovation should benefit everyone. And it is crucial to, to spread good practices and help precisely replicate and scale up uh, the results. Um, the, and in addition to that, we are financing projects which also produce knowledge that and evidence that strengthens our, our evidence-based policy to make it more credible and effective policy. So that goes, I would say, for all policy fields, but climate is certainly not an, exp on, uh, not an exception. So European initiatives like the new European Bauhaus, the Covenant of Mayors, the, the, the Climate Pact, the missions will contribute precisely to scale up and spread the inspiring stories that we get from the ground, and this ground being uh, citizens' initiatives, but the ground being also the, 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 the technological uh, centers, research institutions, companies, etc. And the key challenge, one of the key challenges of the green and digital transition is to safeguard growth and at the same time living in harmony and respect with nature. And um, we are convinced that this is possible. This is beneficiary to everyone. And we have estimated that uh, around 1.2 million additional green jobs can be created between now and 2030 if we are, if we are serious about, um, about uh, this transformation. And uh, so the, and the, combination, the combination of public and private funding is crucial to scale up uh, the innovative projects, to create new markets and share all these, uh, all these good practices so that they can the, 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 we can mainstream solutions across whole mm. Europe. And of course, scale up and repli replicability, that's one of those words, uh, already a key feature of projects uh, that are financed under Life and Horizon Europe. So uh, something very central uh, when looking at the projects of the future. We're also going to hear, ladies and gentlemen, about uh, projects that already incorporate elements of new European Bauhaus, even if uh, they haven't been, if you like, uh, put under that banner before. But Clara, before I let you go, I just wanted to ask you what you personally hope will emerge from these three days uh, of discussion. What are you looking for uh, from our speakers, our audience? What do you want to hear from them uh, as we go through these three topics over the next three days? 
I, 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 I am sure that uh, out of these days, we will have new connections, new inspiration, co-creation of projects that engage people, enterprises, local stakeholders that transform the lives of all of us. Um, also through these days, I hope that the collaboration across thinkers, together with doers that want to design the future, um, will also be strengthened. This happens already, fortunately, but I hope that with this conference, more of that will be there. And finding uh, uh, innovative solutions to complex, because we have to acknowledge that we are facing complex societal and economic project, uh, problems. Um, so finding solutions and implementing them on the, on, on the ground um, would be, would be uh, important outcomes of this conference, because we need political will, we need impactful funding and we need behavior change and we need a future <laughs> which is beautiful sustainable and do it together that magic triumvirate and we'll be looking for ways to deliver on all of those clara thank you for being with us today thank you for your commitment and support uh, to this conference and the initiatives we're taking it's been great to hear from you and we will report back uh, on what i'm sure are going to be three very rich days of discussion so thank you so much and could those in the room join me uh, in thanking clara in the traditional fashion thank you so much clara <laughs> Thank you very much to you all. Thank you very much, Jackie, and thank you for the conference organizers. So Clara talking Bye. there uh, about what she hopes will come out of the next three days. And let me tell you a little bit more about what we're going to be doing. So, as I mentioned, uh, we are going to be hearing about and discussing EU finance projects that already provide us with some good examples of new European Bauhaus approaches, how they relate to this new European Bauhaus initiative, going back to that issue of scale up and replicability, how do we achieve that? Uh, and also through that, making sure that we maximize the contribution that they will make uh, to the green transformation and to improving people's daily lives, to make it that cultural, positive, human-centered experience that the commissioner spoke about at the beginning. As I mentioned uh, during my interview with Clara, we will be focusing over three days on three key topics, changing mindsets and providing incentives for behavioral change at all levels of society. Transforming urban areas, including energy efficiency, the use of sustainable materials in buildings, and promoting sustainable transport. And promoting nature-based solutions in the fight against climate change. Today, as we focus on the first of these three themes, themes we will have panels on engaging citizens in the process of co-creating the vision for the sustainable cities of tomorrow. This is not only a transformational project, but also transformational in the way it is delivered, how it is co-created, co-delivered. Uh, we're going to have a session on incentives. How do we incentivize behavioral change towards more sustainable practices? And crucially, if you can't measure it, you can't do it. You don't know whether you're achieving your targets, monitoring and measuring behavioral change. And at the end of the day, we will hear more about how to implement new European Bauhaus principles in life projects. Also throughout this conference, uh, some of you who tuned in early may have already heard Bauhaus Radio. Uh, it's going to be broadcasting here in the venue uh, before we start every day and during the coffee Easy. and lunch breaks. Uh, Stephen Jones is your host and he's been interviewing key actors from the world of policy and change makers do it will come on automatically if you're watching us online it's being streamed throughout this wonderful building for those of us who are here do tune in do listen great conversations are already happening also opportunities for one-on-one -on -one matchmaking for networking uh, if you registered through the conference website uh, you can indicate on your profile if you would like to take advantage of this and fix meetings either online if you're joining us remotely or here in person if you are in the room. Some people, I believe over 100 people, did so before uh, we got underway. Please do take advantage of that opportunity. 
over the next three days, I'm going to be joined uh, by a colleague uh, who's going to moderate. He has the unenviable task of moderating most of our very intensive panel sessions. His name is Philippe van den Abila. He's an engineer by training with a PhD in applied sciences. He's an entrepreneur working in the field of steel construction and the circular economy. And he's hosted several events and workshops for the European Commission. So he'll be a familiar face to many of you. And I'm sure that our panel sessions over the next day, three days are going to be in safe hands. Philippe, come and join me uh, and let's have a little chat. Welcome, very warm welcome. So, so Philippe, um, as a, we, we're going to talk, as we say, about three themes yes. uh, over the next three days. Um, broadly, um, how important do you think those three issues are and what are you going to be looking for? Uh, well, I'm going to be looking for all of the above. Eh? So I think if we heard Ursula von der Leyen say that if the European Green Deal has a soul, it is the new Euro European Bauhaus, which I tend to believe. So like you just eloquently explained to, uh, to our audience, we're going to talk about changing mindsets, primarily today. Tomorrow we're going to talk about transforming those urban areas, which is a vast landscape on its own. I mean, we're talking energy efficiency, we're talking the use of sustainable materials in building, promoting sustainable transport. And then on the third day, zooming in a bit on those uh, nature-based solutions to, f to uh, fight climate change. So I think that they all tie in together, right? And uh, as for today, I'm looking forward to understanding how we can actually change the mindset. I think uh, COP26 also learned us uh, the vast challenge in front of us. It requires a vast, a, a tremendous a seismic shift in mindset. So this morning we're going to talk about engagement of citizens in this process of co-creating more sustainable cities. And then, as you already introduced as well, we're going to look in the second session at incentivizing. How can we actually incentivize that behavior? You mean change? whether it's carrots? Carrot what works? What, what works. works? What works? What doesn't? Is it uh, a combination of both? Uh, indeed, uh, in order to, to, to make that change. And then uh, the third session, which I think is often overlooked, mm. but nonetheless very important. How we ca can we monitor uh, that behavioral change? How, how can we measure and monitor a behavioral you change? You think that's been relatively neglected until now? It, it sometimes goes without saying, so which is why we... we sometimes tend to forget it, I think, but, but it's fairly important, which will also be reflected by the sheer number of participants in... And As I mentioned, it's often said, if you don't monitor, yeah. you can't measure. Nope. And if you can't measure, you don't know what's working, what isn't working, exactly. when I you need to change tack. So for you, absolutely central. But this issue today that we're starting with, behavioural change, yes. I think as Clara indicated to us uh, uh, just now uh, in my interview with her, this probably the core issue, because if we don't get the behavior change, the mindset change, none of the other things that you're talking exactly. about will happen, will they? No, no, exactly. And uh, it's, it's beautiful, it's sustainable, but it's together. So it's what we are already established. We need to change behavior, and I think all of us have a role in that to play. And mm. so all citizens across Europe and across this planet, actually. So indeed, it's, of, it's instrument, it's of paramount importance, I would say, that we start by looking at how we can achieve this uh, behavioral change. Mm. And the other thing the commissioner spoke about, he said, you are the change makers that the European Green, Green Deal needs. Needs, and he said, this conference is a chance to inspire and be inspired. So we really want to hear not just from our many wonderful experts who are going to be joining you in our panels. We want to hear also from our audience with Absolutely. their comments uh, and their questions. Why is that so important? Why is this engagement, do you believe, with everybody who needs to be involved so important? I, I ho wholeheartedly believe that everyone needs to be on board, needs to be engaged to show ownership, uh, that we join forces in making those th this step change happen. And this is why I think we're also reaching out to every single citizen to, to hear their voice, to have their say, and to mobilize the entire force of, of, of our uh, European Union. Mm. So, okay, so how can they do it? Uh, how can those here in the room with us do it? Well, it how can those online uh, do it as well? It <laughs> is a hybrid event, Jackie, so we, we, have, we enjoy the privilege of having a, a twofold approach. Those people with us here today in Brussels in the room, they can uh, entertain the old-fashioned style, so just raising their hand and then we'll have someone uh, here with us who will be fishing your questions and harvesting those, those questions in the panels. 
For those of you who are tuned in, we are very glad that you can join us remotely. Uh, I cordially invite you to use the Slido app, so slido.com and it's hashtag new European Bauhaus. And one additional request, ladies and gentlemen, if you can keep your questions as brief as possible and to the point, to make it easier uh, for Philippe, for myself, for our other moderator who will be joining us in later sessions to see at a glance what it is you want to know and who it is you want to know it from. That would be much appreciated, I think, both by Philippe and exactly. by myself. Exactly. I, I just wanted to add that as well. <laughs> if, you, if you were to have a specific question for one of the speakers, it would be helpful if you can also quote the name of that speaker in your question. Very good. So, ladies and gentlemen, that has told you all I hope you need to know about what we're going to be doing here over the next three days. Uh, we are now uh, going to turn to that first topic. Uh, Philippe talked about ownership uh, being so crucial. So our first issue now, engaging citizens in the process of co-creating the vision for the sustainable tomorrow. Philippe, I'm going to hand over to you to introduce the topic in more depth and your panel. See you all later on. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jackie. And indeed, what better way to start the day than by embarking on the very first session. A session, indeed, on engagement of citizens in the process of co-creating this vision for sustainable cities of tomorrow. In this session, we will discuss how to motivate citizens and all the stakeholders to take ownership again when it comes to uh, activities around sustainable cities in this new European Bauhaus. We've cooked up a fairly densely packed agenda for you because I have the grand total of eight speakers who will be joining me in the panel. They will share experiences from their projects and discuss effective approaches that can lead to this behavioral change. Needless to say, different localities face different barriers and obstacles and will address those with an open mind and a clear view today as well. Again, as I already mentioned, for this session, I am blessed with a cognitive diverse panel, both with me here in Brussels, so welcome to my panel here today, but also joining me remotely, so dialing in, calling in from all across Europe. What I plan to do in order, say, to fuel the dynamics is to cut the session in two. So I'll be starting with four speakers who will deliver a short presentation, then we'll have a small discussion amongst those four speakers on the common themes that arise during their, their talks. And then I'll do the exact same thing with the next batch of four speakers. Now, at the very end, again, we want to hear your voice. So we plan a Q&A session through either raising the hand in the room or through Slido, hashtag New European Bauhaus. So we also want to blend in an interactive Q&A session at the very end of our session this morning, if time allows for that. And to ensure that time will allow for that, a subtle reminder for my speakers, we do have a fairly charged agenda here, so I'd like to give everyone the floor to hear to your perspectives, so thanks for sticking to your allocated time slot. And my very first speaker for this morning's session is Kinga Kovacs. Kinga studied urban environmental management and planning at the Wageningen University and Research Center in the Netherlands. She also studied economics at the West University in Timisoara in Romania, as well as psychology at Université Paris 8 in France. So she clearly is both a globetrotter and a polyglot who will be calling in, I believe, from the greater Besançon area. What Kinga loves most is creating living streets for as many citizens as possible. So as a project manager and coordinator at Energy Cities, she's a thought leader on rethinking urban space and co-creating or even co-deciding with citizens and stakeholders. Kinga, I see you have joined us indeed remotely. May you please share your lessons learned from the Life Living Streets project. Yes, good morning to all of you. Uh, first, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I have some slides, so if you can share, please, and go to, to the first slide. So thanks, Marisa, for showing the first slide of Kinga. Okay. 
And while we're waiting for that slide to come, Kinga, don't hesitate indeed to build your storyline or to start your narrative. Here we are. Thank you so much. So first, in terms of um, contributing to, to an effective process of um, envisioning and co-creation, co-creating the sustainable city, um, I would say that the first ingredient is really um, the bottom-up engagement of the local stakeholders uh, and also the citizens in the visioning process. So um, today, actually, um, many European cities face challenging uh, situations and, and in, in, in the urban planning and also in other social issues like uh, climate change or land use or um, immigration, but they are also um, actually very well placed. They are actually the best place also to find solutions. And um, most importantly, they are also not alone um, because they, and they are also not perceived as being alone anymore um, and as being the only actor to actually solve these complex issues uh, in the cities. Um, and also the um, most importantly, local residents, but also NGOs and businesses, um, any local stakeholders and residents, they more than ever really need each other to, to actually find some creative solutions by also challenging each other in, um, in an intelligent, in a smart way on how we actually think, act and learn. Um, and actually every city has many people from different backgrounds um, to be involved. And this is actually what we tried with the Living Streets project um, that was funded by the LIFE program. Um, and the idea of the Living Street was really to make the city of tomorrow visible today. Um, so the picture that you can see on the left is showing a typical street. Um, and it's actually very, very difficult to imagine it as a street of the future. And therefore, it is very useful to also collect the ideas from the citizens, but also to help them picture um, these ideas via graphic, uh, visual graphic design uh, that you can see on the right. So this is actually a second ingredient that is very important in, in the visioning process. Um, so the living streets are all about the power of what if. So what if we, um, what, what if the street would be covered by grass? What if I could have just breakfast with my neighbor in the street? Or what if the noise of cars passing by would be replaced by birds chirping or laughter of children? Um, and actually, these are all real questions that came up. up in the city of Ghent in Belgium. And to, to answer these questions, actually the residents came up with real uh, concrete ideas and they implemented them. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, here you can see some examples, some pictures of before. So it's the same street before, then during transformation in the middle, and then uh, formation. Um, with the example of Ghent. Um, next slide, please. So in a, in a nutshell, the first step is really to set up um, the co-creation workshop with citizens and stakeholders to imagine um, what their future city uh, will look like, and then also help them to via some graphic design or some videos. And here you can see boxes of ideas or a big wall of co-creation. Uh, next slide, please. Here you can see the example of Torino in Italy, um, where actually residents, stakeholders, and shopkeepers co-created their streets and squares. And to make the envisioning process really effective, you also need to go to where the people are actually and take into account their needs and realities as well in addition to, to their dreams. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the living streets? These are streets uh, that, um, or, or public squares, so streets or public squares that are closed to the car traffic um, during approximately two months. And the residents of the streets and the local stakeholders and shopkeepers are invited to imagine and co-create the street they have always 
dreamt of. It's all about giving the public realm back to the citizens instead of the individual private car and make sure that we design uh, people-centric cities instead of car-centric cities. Um, <clears throat> in terms of um, how, could, how could these... Um, um, how could citizen science and also games um, and art contribute to this behavior change? Um, what we can show here is that increased motivation of participants is widely noted as an indicator for behavior change. So the needs and motivation needs to be taken into account and um, people need to feel and see that what they are doing matters. So, so the example I can give Sorry, uh, Kinga, sorry to interrupt, Kinga. This is indeed very compelling and inspiring. You talked about streets in a nutshell. Indeed, in light of timing, may I just ask you to convey the, the, the key conclusions uh, so we can move on with our program? Yes. So um, the, the example what, uh, that I can give with the living street is really that we used it as a living lab a living lab of the future with three objectives. So the first objective is to experiment with sustainable mobility. So long-term engagement with participants is key to impact their behavior. It um, to the car for one or two months is a long enough time to, to have an impact and adopt a new lifestyle. And people need to rethink um, uh, their mobility approach when this is really happening just outside of their door. And during a longer period than just one day or one week, like during the mobility week. So the key ingredient for behavior change is to have an impact on people's daily lives and during a significant amount of time. Uh, allow um, me, Kinga, maybe to take that as a takeaway message, what you indeed said, an impact on people's lives so that they can take ownership. It's with a heavy heart that I need to cut you short because I'm sure that we could be talking about living streets all day. Uh, we'll move on to the next speaker, but please do stay with us, Kinga, to engage in the discussions in, uh, in sure. a quarter or half an hour. Thank you so much, Thank you. Kinga, for your compelling and convincing examples of what is within reach if citizens can become the biggest ambassadors of their own sustainable cities. Indeed, let's, let's move on with our program because my next speaker will be calling in as well, uh, but from Italy this time. Indeed, Giovanni Ferrero is uh, architect and project manager at the city of T Torino. I quickly give the floor to him to discuss the findings of the co-city project, looking at collaborative management of urban commons to counteract poverty and social spatial polarization. Giovanni, if you are with us, you can take the floor. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for inviting me. Um, if you can go with the slides, um, I will briefly um, uh, talk about the uh, Co City project, a uh, project that ended uh, last year, uh, a project funded by the uh, Urban Innovative Action uh, Initiative. Um, the scope of the project was to test uh, co-design and co-management uh, of uh, urban commons, meaning um, to, uh, um, you can go to the, to the next slide, please. Um, meaning um, co-design and co-manage buildings under used, unused, owned by municipality and uh, a wide range of public space by means of a new juridical tool, which is called the Pact of Collaboration. Uh, made pact and um, an act of collaboration between the city administration and the active citizens organization. Um, very different range of organization from the small informal group of citizens to the long established uh, organization. Next slide, please. Um, um, in the next slide, I will show you just some figures about the project that, as I said, uh, ended last year. Uh, the project was just a boost, was just a startup. 46 at the end of the project. Now they are uh, much more because they're, they're, we did a, a public call collecting proposals from citizens' organization, and now the proposals are 
continuing and the co-management of different uh, types of collaboration is continuing. Most important thing, uh, you can see it by the uh, figures I show you here, uh, was the involvement of both a, white num uh, um, uh, a great number of, of citizen organizations and a great number of officers of city departments. Because this behavioral change the project was trying to put in, uh, in I mean, um, uh, enhancing the collaborative approach uh, in the co-management and co-design of urban commons, uh, it regards both uh, the citizens and the public administration is a challenge, a challenge for both uh, uh, civil society, civic engage engagement, and the public administration that is forced to act more uh, creatively in order to, um, I mean, collaborate with, with, with civil society um, to manage and design urban commons. The budget was uh, 5 million euros. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. And the Pacts of Collaboration, what, what was the purpose of these Pacts of Collaboration? Uh, well, many of them, the, I would say the majority of them, uh, are uh, aimed at, at, at the care of public space, so taking care of public space and green areas uh, by uh, local association. But then uh, more complex Pacts of Collaboration um, are um, based on the co-creation of community services in reused building. And then uh, another number of Pacts of Collaboration uh, um, are, I mean, uh, focused on culture, creativity, sport. Uh, what, I mean, what, what's the aim, what's the objective of, of all this? <laughs> Uh, I mean, uh, juridical and uh, of, uh, structure and of this process is to counteract social exclusion, exclusion especially in uh, deprived neighborhood of the city, and especially to build mutual trust between uh, citizens. Next slide, please. Uh, well, most of, most of the uh, packs of collaboration as the neighborhood as a focus. The neighborhood is truly the, I mean, the, the, the proper scale of, of, of the pact of collaboration. Uh, well, in, in the US, um, there's a way to call the neighborhood, uh, especially in the hip hop culture, in the rap culture, uh, in, in let's say, uh, to call the neighborhood the hood. Uh, the hood is a sort of, I mean, it, it's quite a ghetto. Uh, it, it's also a way to describe ghettoization. Uh, usually, the hood is refers to uh, underclass neighborhood to uh, that with high crime rates, with social exclusion, with uh, many problems. And anyway, that's the case of some of the pacts of collaboration, and that's the case I want to uh, um, um, show you. I want to tell you about uh, tell you something about. It's a small pact of collaboration. It's really an example is not the most important one of the Co City project, is one of the many. Uh, tell something on the topics we are discussing here today about um, um, civic engagement and uh, beautiful cities, let's say. Um, so, the case I will just uh, briefly uh, tell you something about is about this basketball court. You see this basketball court, uh, it's, no, no, um, um, the, the slides before, please. It, it, at the center of the image, uh, it was like that. Uh, it was a normal, dull, not, nothing, nothing special basketball court uh, in a peripheral neighborhood uh, of the city. Uh, yes, with uh, not a good reputation, um, it, it perceived as a, yes, yeah, some sort of uh, between a ghetto and, and a bad place to be. Citizens, a, a very young group of people uh, playing basket, basketball here. Uh, Make us a proposal, uh, a proposal to um, make this place a better place, a beautiful place, to avoid of being a place of uh, in which you you can meet drug dealers and violence and so, and instead to um, to to produce um, um, to I mean create uh, socialization for young people uh, of the neighborhood. In this. 
I mean, uh, there's a thing uh, uh, that um, implied uh, that is implied in this kind of situation. I mean, of course, it, it, it is is perceived as a bad place, but I mean, um, in in the people, in the young people living there, there's some sort of okay, right or wrong is my neighborhood, so I want to be stay here. I want to, and I'm proud of the place, yeah. even if it's a uh, non-quality place. Yeah. in doing a turnaround so may I propose we wrap up your presentation with this very short video that you're about yes to I'm going to the conclusion you can you can go with the video and they and then I can wrap up okay. at the end yeah please let's go with the video well while ladies and gentlemen it's, it's my not pleasure this, to welcome it's not this video so whilst we're no, waiting it's not that. for that <laughs> but Maybe indeed what I propose, Giovanni, can stream a couple of videos. So it it's just a 30 second video. I, I, it's just 30 seconds. I know we're trying to reel it in, reel it in. So if we could show the video that indeed could. That's it. Uh, while the video is going, if you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, we engage this young group of people and uh, uh, the young group of designers help uh, this young group of people to pay uh, this uh, small basketball court. Uh, we spent some 10,000 euros uh, to uh, refurbish uh, the basketball court with new uh, hoop and basket. And I mean, I know this is a drop in the ocean. It's not a big deal. Uh, but these kind of drops in the ocean uh, are, I mean, in a way, uh, beautiful and um, uh, social inclusive drops. Absolutely, Giovanna, and thanks a lot for joining us here today and indeed for, for bringing this inspiring message, uh, building mutual trust through culture, creativity and sports. Thanks a ton for, that, for sharing that warm ray of hope, Giovanni, and also for introducing those boys from the hood. Uh, now, because life in the new European Bauhaus is a hybrid event, I also enjoy the pleasure of introducing and welcoming some of my panel members here in Brussels. And the first speaker here with me in Brussels is Maya Vetri, who is addicted to visual arts. Your words, not mine. Eh? Maya studied cinema at the de Department of Art, Music and Performing Sciences at the University of Rome, illustration at the International School of Comics and Graphics and Advertising at the European Institute of Design. Today she is representing uh, Casetta Rosat, Rosat, Rossa, sorry, an unidentified body situated somewhere in between a social enterprise, a public body and a cultural organization. Is that correct? I think we need a mic on uh, ah, okay. Maya. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, you're so in the air, Maya. Uh, once again, thank, thank you for inviting me. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm representing here a small association which is uh, located in a public park in Rome. And if you could show the, the slides, I will talk about what we actually do. So here you have some pictures of the place we found about 20 years ago. It was a kind of a shack in the middle of a public park. And we, as a group of volunteers and people living in the neighborhood, uh, decided to, to ask the public administration to take care of this place. So uh, these on the right are the, the most recent pictures of what we, uh, on how we turn this place in a, in a so you can see there in the, in the right pictures. Uh, on uh, the bottom of the picture, we we um, uh, we cleaned it up and we painted it, and especially we we tried to involve the, the people living in the neighborhood in their organization and in the taking care of the public park. So uh, next sl slide, please. Uh, uh, are a small structure, but we have a lot of volunteers uh, uh, approaching to our project. So we divide. We decided to divide uh, in groups, in thematic groups. Uh, one of the groups is Casetta 
Verde, which comes from Caseta Rossa, <laughs> and it means uh, green, of course. So uh, this group deals with uh, sustainable uh, development, and we uh, take care of the of the green um, issues connected to the to the territory, to the de development of the territory. As as you can see from here, uh, we also conquered uh, places around our park. So we try to. Um, plant trees and take take care of the of the of the green areas around us which were abandoned and full of garbage so um, we and we also co-designed with with the people living in the neighborhood uh, different uh, outdoor furnitures as you can see this is a uh, a library, a bookshop or something like that <laughs> that we put just in front of the metro station and uh, the other two pro projects connected to Caseta Verde are the, the assessment of the quality of air. We cooperate with the university in uh, putting uh, uh, on the poles uh, these uh, technic devices to, um, to assess the quality of air and it's an ongoing process. Um, and the last project is um, collecting old uh, computers and recovering them to give them back to, to people in need. Daya means come on in a Roman dialect. <laughs> so next slide, please. Uh, Casetta Solidale is uh, a project uh, that took place during the pandemic. Uh, as you can see, a group of volunteers uh, starting collecting food and, and delivering uh, food parcels to people in uh, economical difficulties. And we, we got decided to to bring to push this uh, to activities and um, connecting this kind of need to cultural uh, needs. So we organize uh, also cultural and social activities. And we also, uh, we have a kitchen, and so we deliver also um, cooked meals, hot meals to people in, in needs. Uh, next. Um, uh, we, we won uh, like a, a small grant for, for this project in connection to the, to the students living in the we, we have a, a strong cooperation with the university. Roma 3 University is one of the biggest universities in Rome. So we have uh, this uh, study group focused on uh, climate changes. And we uh, organize uh, public events and also um, meetings and conferences about these topics. And we also created these portable ashtrays to give them to the people coming to the park because we have this problem <laughs> of uh, secret stops. Uh, um, as Casetta uh, Verde, we participated in the Rome Mobiliton, which was a challenge about uh, creative ideas uh, for sustainable uh, developments. Uh, these were two ideas. We got the, the first and the second prize. Uh, the first one was an app uh, called Trisum, which was actually called Tri uh, Trinder at the beginning, to put people uh, loving nature together uh, on a common project that deal with uh, local change. Outdoor um, uh, billboards which show uh, the, 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 the air that you breathe, uh, and we put them on the, the highway roads in Rome. We, are not, we, we didn't uh, implement this yet, but we are planning to do it in a short time. Um, so these are two ongoing projects. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this, this is, uh, um, so this project was run by, by a group of uh, of volunteers, media volunteers, so-called. It was a web radio uh, that during the pandemic uh, broadcasted the, the, the common activities we run in Casetta Rossa, so cultural activities and uh, live streaming events. And we uh, created these t-shirts, Daya uh, Passa, that we, we sold <laughs> to get money for the uh, 
for delivering food parcels. Okay. Uh, for this pro for this product, we got uh, this uh, Ask, Ask Civil Society prize. Then uh, I go uh, to the next uh, project, the Welcome Scholarship. We have a local uh, Italian school for foreigners, and so we decided to give them uh, small grants for uh, to sustain their personal project about uh, the, their personal development and uh, going towards an autonomy in a professional field. So these are some of the students and, and the teachers. And then uh, last th These one. are quite a lot of interesting projects yeah, that I'm stir sorry. a lot of so questions. So I go to the <laughs> conclusion. Well, in order to <laughs> allow some room for those questions, indeed, if you could maybe wrap up, uh, Maya. Yeah, okay, yeah. so uh, we, I mean, uh, beautiful, sustainable together uh, yeah. are our keywords. Yeah. So actually, we didn't, we are not involved in any live project yet, but I think that we are um, fully, um, we are fully uh, connected to this project as we have the same keywords. There's so that's why. There's no <laughs> single doubt here. in my mind, Maya, that the next big thing will be a lot of small things. So thanks a lot for bringing some of those contributions, those small steps to yeah. our attention. <laughs> okay, thank you. Our next speaker also has boots on the ground in Brussels and is in fact sitting next to you, Maya. Uh, Eleonora de Sabata is an ocean journalist specialized in the Mediterranean Sea and in marine litters and sharks, if I understand that correctly. Yes, indeed. indeed, for the better part of the last two decades, Eleonora has been president of Mad Sharks, a non-profit research and conservation association which aims to promote knowledge, awareness and protection protection of the Mediterranean ecosystem and in particular its sharks. So Mad Sharks, if I understand that correctly, Eleonora is partner in the European Clean Sea uh, project, which is co-funded by the LIFE uh, scheme. It's an awareness endeavor on marine litter. Um, so I would cordially, cordially invite you, Eleonora, to give, give us an update on that project. Yes, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Clean Sea Life was, was a live project which ended in January this year that aimed to make the Mediterranean Sea more uh, beautiful, more sustainable by attacking uh, marine litter. And we did it together with all the stakeholders that um, got a uh, their livelihood and well-being out from the sea. We started in 2016 when the issue of marine litter was not on anyone's mind, especially in, Ita in Italy. So we had to pe make <coughs> people more aware uh, of the issue. So we started with the marine stakeholders, um, again, people whose real livelihood <coughs> depend on a clean sea, um, and groups such as divers and boaters and anglers and the citizens and the citizens of tomorrow, the students of all ages and authorities as well. And we had to make them aware of the problem, which they thought was far away in the Pacific, uh, so-called islands of plastics or in Asia. And we had to show them that the problem was on our doorsteps, yeah. on our coasts and not there. Um, so we had to make it vis visible and for this reason, we used lots of visual um, tools, arts as well, uh, to, um, to the risk of beautifying marine litter. That's some, what some people told us. But we uh, thought it was very um, effective. We made it personal, showing that trash didn't come from Mars, but comes from our own uh, daily activities and bad habits. And we stimulated uh, people with campaigns, um, a bit like uh, one of the first speakers t told us, what if, showing what a, be a clean beach, the same beach that was littered mm. would have been and was after a big cleanup. We trained uh, journalists as well, because uh, we needed awareness spread from the media. And citizen science, of course, helped us, helped people not only to monitor and give us data, but also to make them more, more aware of what was happening. And it also helped to set up the first trial against um, a plastic spill that littered the, the Mediterranean Sea. How we did that? We um, tried to gain their trust. Uh, we went everywhere they were. That meant sailing with them and diving with them, which was a lot of fun, but also meant being at 2 a.m. in the harbor when the fishermen were delivering us the trash that we'd asked for. 
Um, we went on military ships, on beach bars, in schools, in restaurants, everywhere to meet the people. We even went to Parliament, and we even met to um, we went to meet the Pope in the Vatican, uh, who became one a very vocal an ambassador. Uh, enthusiast, right. Yes, yeah. ambassadors. What we were doing, um, we. Uh, went to the people through the people they trust, that is their trainers, um, the instructors, and um, so people they trusted and, and they believed in their messages and our messages. We, of course, we listened to their experience. Um, we became a trusted source of information also for the authorities, providing a lot of um, uh, evidence-based um, reports on emerging issues. And, of course, through all that, we tried to inspire changes in, um, in their behavior, not just in cleaning up what was already there, but most importantly, preventing more litter to come into the ocean in the first place. Uh, we created a community, a sense of community. We um, maintained a conversation with the people in real life as well as on social media, uh, showcasing their successes and you know, sustaining a pride on what they were doing and showing that what they did, whatever it was a small thing, cleanup operation was uh, important. Um, local heroes as well as big ambassadors such as the Pope. And we built solutions with them, listening to what their experience was, um, which then we shared with other um, operators. We reached out to authorities at all levels, again with, uh, with a lot of data that we were collecting around the shores, uh, to promote policies to reduce marine litter. We passed, we helped pass a law on microbeads um, in Italy, pre uh, preventing, prohibiting them, um, as well as resolutions on, on a small scale to reduce, um, to eliminate the release of balloons. Um, and again, like I said, the first trial on marine litter. And what is um, probably the um, most important legacy of uh, Clean Sea Life is fishing for litter, fishing for plastics, which is a, was a barrier. We identified this big barrier to, to clean up the oceans, um, and that was a le legislative one. So um, it was also a great opportunity for fishermen to help um, yeah. not solve, but tackle the issue in a very important way. And we, we involved all the actors to start pilot projects that means fishermen and local authorities and port authorities and the Coast Guard, and everyone got together for test pilot projects. Um, we identified the way to move forward, and um, it worked very well, actually. And we also involved Parliament, um, and the, a member of Parliament came to, uh, to the harbour to see what to was going on and asked... Okay. Uh, Uh, to test trial, um, it's a, the, the a draft proof law. of the pudding is in the eating. You brought them literally on board, and absolutely, uh, on <laughs> literally, very literally. I may need to wrap up our discussion, uh, Eleonora, unfortunately, in light of timing, because I would also like to entertain a short Q and A. But let me start by asking you a question. I think you, whilst you were talking, we also streamed the video with some impressive numbers. I mean, 118 trawlers, more than 112 tons of marine litter removed. Also, a clear call to action to all of us. At the very beginning of the session, we were referring also to local specificities. clearly sitting on a, a track record for the Mediterranean coast. Can we, say, translate this approach to other uh, harbours or other coastal areas? Well, indeed. Well, our project was mainly in Italy, but of course we share, in the Mediterranean, we share the same um, um, fishery sector, for instance. So in the case of fishing for litter, that can easily be replicated, and in fact it is. It's not rocket science. Fishermen have always known that they have, that we are creating this problem in the sea, and they, they can be the solution, but they need a local management on shore. So we tried and tested in different places, testing the different solutions, and we, we came here to Brussels, to the European Parliament, to share what, they're not, uh, what we had gathered from, from their experience. Indeed, it can be shared all across um, and elsewhere. It also needs policy, because the, the main barrier was 
um, for the uh, local management companies that, you know, marine litter was not in any uh, regulations at all, so they had no idea what, what it was and how to manage, for it, manage it. Um, so we provided the evidence, we now need laws. And I can tell you that right now we may be on the finishing line in Italy to get uh, the law allowing fishermen to do that, uh, and we're really in the final stages. And so I hope everyone will join me in fin keeping fingers crossed that it goes Keeping through. our fingers crossed, and indeed you've moved a stone in the river for sure, I think. So thanks a lot for sharing that testimonial. I'd like to pick your brain as well, Maya, if I may. I heard from Giovanni, that, uh, who introduced the, the boys on the hood, that there's, in order to engage local communities, there's um, a leverage when you can appeal to them by culture, by music, by sports. You've shown a lot of very interesting um, examples. Do, can you relate or appeal to that, that message that we can engage local youth by appealing to them through culture or sports as well? Yeah, we, uh, I think that the, the, uh, the main issue is uh, making them feel that they're working for their, for their future and for the future of the community, so they feel engaged about that. And, and we, uh, what we do uh, daily is trying to uh, strengthen the, the, the network. So we have a lot of people coming to the park and coming to our association, which is in the same place, but actually we, we do a lot of networking uh, daily work with the university, with other associations, with um, all the, 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 the strong um, stakeholders living around us and in the city. So I think this is very, very important, like to, to build a new uh, view of the society and doing something concrete to, to change the different uh, uh, problems we are surrounded by. Thanks a lot for sharing that, Maya. I have one last question for one of our uh, speakers who is remotely connected. Kinga, I appreciate I cut you short at the very beginning of the session, but I'd like to come back with you uh, with one quick question uh, in terms of process, if you like, because we, we, I already heard a lot of ideas on how to engage uh, citizens. Uh, in your, say, educated opinion, what would constitute an effective process of envisioning and co-creating such uh, sustainable cities? I think um, it's very important to also, um, um, when, when we, we have different approaches to urban planning, that we really use uh, a bottom-up approach and we don't try to, um, the concrete example of the, of the living street is that um, usually we design the street for the people, then we convince them that this is good for them, but also it's important to give them uh, the chance of experimenting. Mm -hmm. um, so really transforming uh, temporarily some spaces for them to experiment with before making something permanent. So I would say that really bottom-up engagement is key and also um, has, a, has a very good impact on behavior change to, to let them experiment. Um, another important thing is the social um, links, um, because, um, um, for instance, with Living Streets, we reinforced this social cohesion, um, um, the preparatory process of the Living Street, but also the testing of two months, uh, allowed inhabitants to get in touch with each other. And the fact um, um, that they did this intensified a lot their contacts. And once this period is over, uh, the contacts stay. And this is to highlight also that the group dynamic is very important on, um, on the envisioning, but also on the behavior change that comes after. So um, raising uh, awareness of group behavior can speed up uh, the acceptance also um, of, for instance, um, new behaviors as a social norm as yeah. well. So um, that, what that we've seen, for instance, in, in the city of Zadar in Croatia was that there were three big parking lots that were transformed during living streets. Mm -hmm. So for two months, this space was used differently by the people and it helped them accept the fact that this space can be transformed, but also to envision the way it can look like uh, when it's used for other functions than for the car. Yeah, so you're, you're actually fostering public acceptance by engaging the citizens. Very clear and concise message, uh, so thanks for uh, sharing.
I will start by embarking this second uh, part of our first session because I have another four speakers lined up for you. The first one is Kyriakos Parpunas, uh, Managing Director of PSC, which stands for Parponas Sustainability Consultants. Kyriakos has an impressive track record of more than two decades holding executive functions in the construction and waste management industries in Cyprus. I invite Kyriakos, if he's with us, to hijack our virtual floor and bring with the Life Footprint project, which aims to develop an integrated strategy to reduce the uh, carbon footprint in the food sector. Kyriakos, I see that you're in the air. Please take it away. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm glad to be here with you and sharing some ideas. I will be, of course, more philosophical uh, in terms of the cities and the development of sustainable city because our project is more waste related footprint food waste and uh, in fact other other work we did in the past uh, with the, with the live uh, programs have also been uh, recycling recycling on islands and things like that so i'll be more philosophical um, indeed it's a real pleasure to address uh, this uh, discussion and contribute uh, uh, to the exchange of views on the development of more sustainable cities but most importantly to transform also our existing cities and mega cities to sustainable. Let's not forget that we are not starting from scratch. We are not in front of a whiteboard with the only challenge to design something new that is sustainable, but we are more challenged to transform what is not sustainable to become sustainable. I'm also very delighted uh, we got to this point of discussing sustainability in our cities, in our lives and in what we do so seriously and as part of mainstream events. Recently, I was saying as a speaker at another big forum in Cyprus uh, that was discussing also sustainability, that uh, until very recently used to be the, the romantic ones when we spoke about sustainability in big events that had to discuss economy, development, growth, etc. I feel so that we have gone quite a way with, uh, with these evolutions recently, and of course, there is no doubt that the Green Deal uh, has been uh, drastic in this evolution of the EU Green Deal. Likewise, likewise, it was the circular economy package in 2018. In fact, they are, uh, to me, the two sides of the same coin. Uh, one showing to circularity of resources and the other one showing to better production, production and consumption of energy. Combined, they are the sustainability manifesto of the EU to me. And I'm glad we are part of this family and uh, that pushes the sustainability agenda for the world. Of course, having said that, let's not forget how rocky is the, is the way ahead. Just yesterday, we had the conclusions of the COP26 in Glasgow, be below expectations, not what we expected. And of course, that shows the many challenges we have on the way ahead in uh, uh, minimizing climate change through the uh, minimizing the, the, the tem tem temperature increase, increase. Now, talking about cities, to me, the challenge of building any sustainable si system is anchored on a culture of making, of course, sustainable decisions. Or better say, on a culture of rejecting decisions if they are not sustainable. A culture of evaluating any new decision, any new development, any new construction, not only in financial and return on investment means, but in conjunction of financial, environmental, and social criteria. And I guess we get to the point of making sustainable decisions when we can actually reject any development that violates any of the three sustainability pillars. To say that we are not building this project, we are not installing that system, even if it makes perfect economic sense, in the usual way we, may, you, we measure economic sense so far, if it is not good for the environment or the society. In essence, what I'm discussing here is not more than the introduction of an enhanced economic analysis for any new development. An economic analysis that is based on life cycle costing, which, which incorporates and integrates social and environmental externalities. And I'm not implying here that this uh, new enhanced analysis is, in, is easy. On the contrary, expressing the, cons the externalities in the long term in today's economic value is far from being easy. Many times we are even short of understanding the long term impacts of our discussions, let alone to monetize them. So we need lots of work 
and new evaluation models. I know, of course, that the European Bauhaus goes far beyond the economic values analysis and the built environment. It has more subjective, subjective dimensions like beauty, aesthetics, taste, and other in the, in the different development. Those things that are subjective, subjective, but in most cases, define the dichotomy between what we like and what we do not like, where we would like and prefer to live versus what we do not like and would like to avoid if we had such a choice. It seems to me that what we need to build more sustainable city and system and cities is a process of listening more to the gut feeling or the common gut feeling when we make decisions for the development of our city. Now, it may sound strange. It does sound strange to me that I propose it, but if we had a development, uh, if we had a way to isolate each and every person that is involved in the development and ask them, would you like to live in or around this development? Would you like your children to live there? And then put these people together and ask them as a group to make a consensus decision as to the final nature of the development or even the decision to proceed with the development or not, then the outcomes could have been much different. Mm -hmm. I think that today, what we do is that we isolate people in professions or even interest groups and you, we keep their minds to look for decisions only within certain limits. You are the economist, tell me if, it, if I will make money out of this. You are the engineer, tell me how can I build that safely and provide day-to-day -day comfort and safety. What if then we had a way to put them all together with the neighbors and, with the neighbors and other uh, stakeholders and ask them the simple question. Would you like to live your life there or around it if you knew the total impacts or at least the most important ones. If not, there's something is wrong with you. I guess I'm talking about a more consultative approach to development and a more multidimensional approach to analyzing impacts. And we heard in the previous presentation some ways of trying to do that, the more, especially the more consultative and uh, inclusive approaches. Our project now footprint is about improving the way we consume and we manage food. Food waste is a waste stream that has been neglected, in my opinion, because of its nature, the organic nature. However, this is a waste stream that is a big contributor to CO2 emissions and other um, uh, uh, gases that uh, uh, warm the climate, if not managed, and the stream whose wastage has also a significant ethical parameter. Those who are in need, those who are hungry and they cannot get access to good food. We, we are therefore glad that we contribute with our project locally and regionally through the project networking to tackle the challenges of such an important waste stream, which is of course very relevant and very important for the environment and our cities and the places we live. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Kyriakos, for indeed a, a philosoph philosophical approach, but also some very tangible uh, actions moving forward. So thanks for sharing that. And now quickly over to our next speaker, who is already warming up here uh, on the scene in Brussels. Um, Stanislav Derbemont holds a master's degree uh, from the Technical University of Mainz and one from the École Supérieure du Commerce Extérieur. In 2016, he joined Rescoop. EU, where he's now working as a project manager. In that capacity, he's in charge of legal research and dissemination for the Horizon 2020 Rescope Plus project. Rescope Plus, as the name suggests, builds on the knowledge gathered from the original uh, Rescope project. One interesting observation from that project was that members of supplying Rescopes change their behavior, reducing financial energy consumption and investing money in uh, renewable energy sources. The Rescope PLUS project aims to acquire a better understanding of the drivers behind this behavioural change and, needless to say, also to foster that. So I'll leave it up to Stanislas to educate us on the status and progress in the Rescope PLUS project. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. Educate is maybe a strong word. Inform would be probably Fair enough. better in that regard. Um, so Rescope PLUS is a project that was financed by the Horizon 2020 Energy Efficiency Programme and that is already finished for three years now. Uh, it lasted between 2016 and 2019. 
Um, I moved on to uh, other responsibilities at Rescue PU, and so I will try to also introduce you guys to some new projects that we have as well that are also related to the results of Rescue Plus. If we can have the slides, maybe that'd be super helpful. Just to start us with, um, I represent the uh, European Federation, that's the one before, please. The European Federation of Renewable Energy Cooperatives, and our goal is to promote the transition to energy democracy. Uh, that means a energy transition in the hands of citizens where the ownership stays with the citizens and uh, the ownership drives actually the energy and green transition of Europe. If we can go to the next slide, that'd be great. Thank you. Energy cooperatives are first and foremost democratic organizations that are acting in the energy market to deliver services to their members. What it looks like is a little bit like uh, groups of citizens getting together, investing together into either means of production or supply or energy efficiency, electrical mobility. As you can see, the list is going on and on in terms of what energy cooperatives are doing today. What is important to know in terms of the policy aspect is that energy cooperatives were the uh, inspiration behind the renewable energy communities and citizen energy communities that most of you are probably uh, aware of today uh, that were promoted by the Clean Energy Package in 2019. Um, what is interesting to see is that at the time when we started Resco Plus, um, the services that were provided by energy cooperatives were rather limited and they are not expanding. And I want to talk about what were the driving force behind that, and that was the Resco Plus project. If we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so Resco Plus originally was a research project to understand what is the impact of the engagement of consumers in cooperatives on their own consumption. The idea was to understand if you are a member of a cooperative, are you consuming less energy than if you are not? And the answer to that is yes, resoundingly. Um, the impact is approximately up to 20% in savings annually uh, for a cooperative member versus a traditional consumer that is not part or is supplied by a traditional operator. Uh, what was interesting for us to do as well was then to build on that and take a look at what are the other things that cooperatives can do to support their members to be more energy efficient. And the first question that we asked to ask ourselves was what it is to be energy efficient. For us to be energy efficient is three things. The first one is to be sober, it's energy sobriety, which is lowering the consumption. The second one is sustainability, actually being efficient with our installations. Uh, so that means, of course, installations in the grid, but also having production installations that are efficient. And the third one is solidarity. You know, we need to, in order to be efficient, take care of the most vulnerable members of our societies first. And that's what the corporate movement realized very quickly. With the Resco Plus project, we built a toolkit made of uh, eight best practices that were built in the cooperative movement and that are available uh, widely to not only all cooperatives around the world, but also all companies that want somehow to put them in place. Granted, they would have to be democratically governed. Um, so the first four are related to actually sobriety, and then the last three are related to sustainability. So we moved both on the electricity aspect which is the tools that are looking at how to control consumption, how to learn about our consumption, how to be collective about understanding how to consume electricity. And the three last ones are about district heating specifically and how to deploy district heating as a more uh, efficient technology, but also how to make it more efficient itself through collective dialogue inside the cooperative. I'm not going to present all those tools, but I would like to present what we learned from that project already. Um, so there are four things that we learned from the Resco Plus project. The first one is that we really need to have a development model. We need to understand what makes cooperative grow, how we can actually make them do new services, how can we serve our members better. And I think it's really inspiring to hear about your project because somehow this is exactly what we want. It's not only a group that's going to do one type of service, but really cover the entire energy system and provide a complete package to uh, members of energy cooperatives. And so for that, we launched a Compi project that is looking at various frameworks to better understand the growth models for uh, energy cooperatives, but also how to deepen the interactions between the members. The second one that we learned is that we need recognition and specific policy support. Um, what that means is first to understand you know, the energy community definitions, but also you know, the enabling frameworks that are planned in the clean energy package. And so for that, we launched the Scale 203050 project that is looking at the growth of the cooperative movement 
throughout the entire Europe and making sure that we not only serve certain types of Europeans, but all Europeans the same way. D you know, also linking up with cities as well, uh, which, by the way, the colleagues from Energy Cities are also part of that project. The third challenge is to really bring everybody along. Uh, one of the key um, challenge of the corporate movement was that it's a very homogeneous movement. It's, you know, the usual engineer, white male, middle class. Unfortunately, uh, it was a reality that we had to face. And so what we did was to create toolkits to help our members better understand that and also you know, bring more people inside the corporate movement. We now have really great examples of tackling energy poverty and bringing more solidarity, not only in cooperatives, but to the community at large. And finally, the fourth lesson was an integrated services approach. And for that, the new, European, uh, the new European Bauhaus is really helpful in terms of understanding not only energy as something that is you know, consumed and, and living around us, but really something that we can control and own. And so the citizen-led renovation project um, is a project that is looking at how citizens can build together renovation programs that allow them to really scale the renovation level of their homes. So not looking at, you know, just changing my windows because that's the only thing I can afford, but really taking a look at, as a neighborhood, what can we do to change the way we live and therefore make our homes better collectively, starting with, obviously, the most vulnerable uh, of our communities because their homes are actually the most problematic ones. I'll stop here, but of course I'm happy for any questions on those or RESCO Plus. Thanks a lot, uh, Stanislas, for sharing with us some of the lessons learned from the Rescoop Plus project. I also heard what you said on solidarity, on bringing everyone on, on board, that energy efficiency is also a matter of solidarity, indeed. Let's go remote again, because my next speaker will be calling in from France. Eamon O'Hara is co-founder and director general of Ecolise, the European network for community-led initiatives on climate change and sustainability. Today, he'll be conveying some key learnings from the Communi Communities for Future, a platform designed to support and connect communities. Eamon, if you're with us, there you are. Take it away, please. Yeah. Thank you, Philip. Good morning, everybody. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to start the presentation with a short video on Communities for Future. So maybe if you could set up the video. Yeah. So this video gives a brief explanation to what Communities for Future is, uh, which is essentially a, a call to action to communities and to stakeholders across Europe to engage in a community-led transition to a more sustainable future. Uh, and this is the, the main work of ECALIS, which is a, an association, yes. international association now of 46 member organizations across Europe, which are stakeholders in this transformation process. So maybe if we can watch the video first. Yeah, I believe we're in the process of setting that up. Uh, Generating Amen. renewable energy, growing food, nurturing local economies, responding creatively to the climate and ecological emergencies is the biggest challenge of our time. Throughout Europe, local communities are pioneering a better future, from community gardens to eco-villages, permaculture projects and transition initiatives. They are building a healthier, fairer and more sustainable world. This is why Communities for Future was born, to share these experiences, to inspire you and your community to take action. So how can we help? By sharing tools and resources, such as guides, manuals, podcasts, and an online space. And also with different events where you can meet and learn from others. And finally, contacts. Communities for Future connects you with many other organizations to help support you and your community. Communities for Future is bringing together people from all across Europe. In 2014, we were today Copernicus has more than 1,700 members and have invested more than 1.8 million euros in renewable energy in Portugal. We are sharing our story through Communities for Future. We're a community supported agriculture farm, CSA. It's an innovative socio-economic model of food production and distribution. We provide healthy organic food to over 90 families all year round. Three salvatori de semințe am ajuns la 200 de varietăți salvate și sute de salvatori. Aluturați-vă proiectului Communities for Future. Facciamo incontrare diversi gruppi ambientalisti ed economia solidale della nostra città, consapevoli che la diversità è ricchezza. Sostenendoci a vicenda vogliamo rafforzare 
la solidarietà, l'inclusione e la coesione sociale nella nostra città. Ici, nous apprenons à produire notre propre nourriture écologique, notre énergie renouvelable, mais avant toute chose, nous apprenons à vivre en communauté, euh, comment apprendre et décider collectivement, s'entraider et à vivre de manière plus commune en lien avec la terre. So what do you think? Join the thousands of communities across Europe working together to create a happier, fairer and more sustainable future. Together, we can build a better world. Maybe if we could go back to the slides, please. Your slides coming right up, Eamon. Yeah, uh, next one. Next slide, please. Yeah, so our, our work at Ecclesi then through the Communities for Future is very much about, uh, firstly, inspiring engagement. Uh, and one of the main initiatives we have for this is the annual European Day of Sustainable Communities, which takes place in September. Uh, and this is really a, a day or several days of showcasing the work of existing community initiatives across Europe, the thousands of initiatives that already exist, so showcasing that work as a means of inspiration uh, and sharing that more widely um, with, with other communities. Next slide, please. And then the next part of the work is very much about enabling, so inspiring communities to take action, but then enabling action at, at the local community level uh, through different means, such as sharing experiences, sharing knowledge, experience, information from existing initiatives, uh, building collaboration, so creating spaces to host conversations and build cooperation between stakeholders, connecting communities and stakeholders, including through uh, mapping exercise of initiatives across Europe, uh, and then finally through advocacy work. Uh, and this year we hosted a week-long session of uh, Communities for Future Policy Week in Brussels to bring this message to the policymakers in Brussels, but also at other levels. Next slide, please. And just so in terms of what some of the messages are, or some of the lessons for engagement that, that we've taken from this work, I think, firstly, the importance of starting locally, and some other speakers have mentioned this as well, very much about scale, but at a level of neighborhood, of street, uh, where it's accessible to people, where it's meaningful, and, and where the action can be tangible. Secondly, to show, I think the importance of, of showing people existing activities is, is a very important means of inspiration uh, and allowing time for conversations. It takes time for ideas to mature, for groups to come together uh, and to form. So giving that space for, for that formation uh, and those ideas to develop. Thirdly, to listen and, and to follow the energy. Um, I think it's also been mentioned the importance of a bottom-up approach where What's coming from the community is really important. Nobody knows the community better than the community members themselves, where the best starting points are, where the uh, connection and engagement points are. So listening to this, following the energy, it may not always be linear, but I think it's important to follow, take the lead from the local community. Fourthly, build trust and don't overburden. And I think building trust comes from listening. Uh, and from allowing the community to take the lead, building that trust between building a real partnership uh, and not overburdening. I think to remember that this is primarily volunteers, voluntary input, so how can we work with that and not overburden it, but use that in a, in a positive way. Uh, and finally then, the importance of individual change actually comes from positive collection and action. And this has been our experience, but also research shows this, that people change behavior by working together collectively at the local level. Uh, and this is how we shift. This is how we shift norms, behavior. Um, it creates the conditions for change at the local level, but also facilitates conversations between people that feeds back into individual behavior change also. So I'll stop there, Philip. Thanks a lot, Eamon, and indeed, together we can build a better world. What an inspiring testimonial on the value of connecting the dots and making sure, or indeed, convincingly proving that communities are far bigger than the sum of their parts. Thanks a lot for that uh, contribution, Eamon. I have a faint feeling that my...
west coast of Brittany. Uh, you also co-created the Cross Channel Film Lab and more recently LIM, an intriguing abbreviation that stands for Less is More. Today, Antoine, I understand you have a story to tell about storytelling. Yes. <laughs> if you can uh, uh, show me the, the slides, that would be great. And I will try to go forward. Yes. The slides. Coming right up, uh, Antoine. <laughs> Here ah, we are. So, this is it. Uh, this is the place where... Uh, so, yeah, okay. Uh, so, this is where we are. Uh, facing uh, either Ireland or, or Quebec, you know. Um, and um, it, the adventure is uh, happening in a very small village in, in Brittany on the shore. And this is the place which used to be a farmhouse which has been transformed into a place dedicated to story development, to script development. So in this place, we work in a way which is uh, totally collective. Uh, the week of work with writers. So we, we hear, we've been, in the last 10 years, we've been coaching an average of 200 filmmakers and screenwriters per year. So it's a lot because they stay... Uh, um, we, they work a lot with us, so it means that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, for us uh, uh, an important uh, um, uh, uh, work. Uh, and it's uh, day after day, it's uh, going from big group, uh, smaller group, individuals, semi-group, big group again. It's the breathing of the, of the brainstorming. And uh, the brainstorming is also very much happening outside, because we've been discovering with a beautiful Cambridge study that the human brain uh, creates a higher rate of new synaptic connections, meaning new ideas with the body in movement than the body uh, uh, sitting in a, in a room. Uh, and so be because of that, um, we've been um, amazed at how much m m uh, meaning we helped to create for the filmmakers uh, through this uh, working together with people from all over Europe. And, uh, and, and then we discovered that it was also possible to help through this collective work to generate an approach which was pushing to deepen the meaning of every project very substantially, leading to inter interesting successes, both in festivals and in, 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 in terms of audience. And because of that, we decided to go further along with the idea of making it even more political in the beautiful sense of, politi of, of politics, which is trying to push for, for, for change. And the, the idea for us was to generate less is more, which is, of course, coming from... That's a funny thing, because it comes from uh, 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 the Bauhaus. I mean, the Bauhaus of the, uh, of the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and, um, uh, and the idea for us uh, with LIM has to be uh, recapturing the absolutely central role of storytelling, which is to create meaning. Uh, and uh, for us, uh, cinema and fiction, it's not... Yes, of course, it can be seen as entertainment, uh, but it has to be seen, especially today, as a tool uh, to put humans together and to generate possible meanings, understanding, common understanding. And so it is a, a pivotal, a very central source of meaning in modern societies because stories are not carried by orality as much as it was a century ago uh, and, and since uh, uh, ages. And so it, it is a cardinal art form for good and bad reasons, but it, it, it is the tool through which we spread meaning in, in, in big proportions. And it has the power to sculpt societies uh, through that uh, generation of meaning. And look at what is happening on the other side of the Atlantic. It seems very clear for American sociologists that the heavy industrialization of story generated by Hollywood, especially in the past 20 years, has sculpted an oversimplification of the vision of society by its citizens. You know, uh, like uh, the, 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 how it, it became uh, obvious that to save us we need superheroes, you know? Uh, and so, in a way, Donald Trump is the product of Hollywood's recent oversimplification. Uh, you know, more than half of, 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 of the films, of the tickets sold in the world are from, you know, 
uh, 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 superhero movies or, you know, or heavy action movies with uh, machine guns. So um, the question is for us, which obsesses us, it's what is it that Europe can generate which is different from America, from Hollywood, in terms of generation of meaning? What is it that can be uh, uh, absolutely specific to the, to the humanistic approach of, of Europe in terms of storytelling? And for that, we have been deciding to launch a European think tank uh, under the umbrella of Less is More, co-financed by, by uh, media. Uh, and the idea was to put around the table uh, the, the best uh, screenwriters we have in Europe uh, and the best storytellers and putting them together with researchers. Researchers in brain science, cognitive science, neuroscience on one side to understand how it works and how to boost creativity because we need to be more creative today. That's one of the key issues for the new European Bauhaus. Bauhaus. And, and the thing is also we, want, we, don't want, we don't want to just push creativity and uh, understand what it means to generate a story and and which is why we also work with another you know human sciences philosophers uh, uh, phenomenologists uh, anthropologists uh, and and uh, sociologists yeah and so it has been uh, it started three years ago it is absolutely fascinating what we are uh, you know opening for ourselves and then we, we we are now obsessed with the idea of we have to spread what we discover to other fields, Not, it is absolutely necessary for humans to recapture what it is to, uh, uh, to put ourselves together. Uh, look at that, Homo sapiens, uh, 50,000 years ago. We, it now has become very clear that, uh, for those who haven't read Sapiens, you know, it's a really interesting book to read, uh, 50,000 years ago, why did Homo sapiens uh, uh, do m better than Neanderthals, for instance, you know, because they have developed this ability to unite with stories, not language. Other species have developed language, communication system. But it is through storytelling that they've been uniting and then able to project themselves as tribes, as villages, as cultures into a possible quest. And so, uh, the other thing we've been working, that's with paleoanthropologists, that you, you discover this. And then we've been working with ling uh, people working in the field of linguist linguistics and anthropology. We've been discovering that within language, uh, if you research on the origin of language, the reason why languages are so difficult, it's because, it's not, uh, you know, it, we, we don't use Tarzan language, you know? It's not, uh, I want Jane, you know? We are a bit more subtle than that. Uh, it is within the language that we, that we have built for, uh, for ourselves, humans, we, we've been sculpting language because of the necessity to tell stories. So it means that telling stories is not just storytelling like people in the field of, of communications and advertising believe, you know, it has nothing to do with that. Storytelling is the core of what, what makes us humans. It's not a void tool. It's the tool that rehumanizes us. And so because of that, we've been trying to understand more what it is, the difference between storytelling uh, in other cultures and storytelling in, 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 in what has been a, a, an industrialized vision of storytelling genera generated by America, which has been dominating today's uh, uh, you know, communication system. And looking at a Senegalese griot, this amazing guy, uh, the b best uh, uh, griot uh, from, from Senegal, Western Africa. It's, it's, he's, we've been trying to search for that. What it is that makes story for you? What, what is the function of story in your culture? And he came with one very clear answer, which, uh, which was the idea of story is to celebrate life. Then... So for us, it was ah, interesting because it, it, we never thought of this as, as, as having that function, function as its core. Then we went to one of the most uh, interesting specialists of storytelling in Amazonia. And he was telling us, for us and for Indians in, in Amazonia, so connected to nature, stories are there to heal us. Stories are a healing tool for humans. And so you, you can cure a disease with a story. For us, it was, you know, amazing. 
And then we've been, uh, you know, I just give you a few examples because we, we, I, could, I could bore you for, for uh, uh, two days with that. But it, it's, we've been uh, working with a specialist in an Hellenist studying pre-Socratic storytelling. Uh, because we all believe when we talk about storytelling that it all started with Aristotle, the poetics. And then in pre-Socratic storytelling, what is amazing, it's that uh, it is exactly the same purpose. Stories have the same fu function as in Senegal, celebrating life. So uh, uh, what we have to say here is that stories are not a detail. Mm -hmm. Stories are the tool humans have invented, the biggest tool we've ever invented to come together and to project ourselves. And so I, I have a lot of other stuff to tell you, but we, we have to amaze each other with new tales. Yeah. That's the thing. And maybe have, if I want to uh, conclude before uh, you know, continuing the discussion with all of you, uh, very, uh, 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 a week ago, my father is Alzheimer. And, and he, I know, half of his brain is completely damaged, and he, he is, he's barely remembering uh, who, who, what his name is. And the other day he told me, do you have white shoes? I was like, what are you talking about, Daddy? And uh, come on, I have to show you something. And he's been wearing white shoes, and he was telling me, you know what I do with these shoes? It's amazing. They make me turn left. They make me turn right. They make me jump ahead. I could nearly fly with them. Beings yeah. still need stories. Yes. And so that need for stories put us in, a, in such a difficult place today because we've stopped telling stories. Politics doesn't tell stories anymore. We use analytical brain and not experiential brain, not storytelling brain. And so what is interesting is that our thirst for stories, as humans, we, have, we are programmed. We are, that's our nature. Our thirst for stories makes us prefer a very shit news, conspiracy theories. We prefer a shitty story than no story at all. A very strong message from a seasoned storyteller. So thanks a lot for bringing that to our attention, Antoine, and I, for one, happen to have a slight inclination that leads me to believe that I would appreciate a close encounter of meeting with Jane. Look at how subtle we have become. Uh, we will want to engage in um, a roundtable discussion. I also invite all of you to add to that discussion, so please do convey or keep your questions coming through Slido, hashtag New European Bauhaus. Perhaps uh, whilst we have the questions trickling through, uh, starting with a question for, uh, for you, Antoine, I believe in everything you've just said, we need more stories, we also need more storytellers. What would be your recommendation for policymakers in order to engage people, in order to make this vision of this new European Bauhaus a reality? I think that's, uh, and I, I heard somewhere that uh, in, in how the European Bauhaus has been starting, uh, there, it has been about also sharing experiences, which is what we are doing here. Yeah. Uh, instead of generating equations, we need equations, we need ana analytical thinking in order to generate new energies, etc. But before that, we need to be able to project ourselves and that means re-educating ourselves uh, uh, to master and use as, as often as we can and do that with our kids. Our kids are taught at school to use analytical thinking instead of using experiential thinking, which is generated by storytelling. So use the sharing of experience as a fundamental way to unite brains and souls among humans. The sharing of experiences is what makes us jump forward and what makes us, what makes us also... It, because there's something very beautiful in, in the sharing of experience, which is a story. Tell me what you, what you did yesterday. What, what, what has been... I've been amazed by, to hear all the other projects. And so th that, ex that sharing of experience, be it something we've, that we've lived or something that we are that we are imagining, it's, it's a sharing of experience, and that sharing of experience generates, instead of generating conflict, 
It generates by nature kind of a trance. It is comparable to trance the, the, wh when yeah. we receive a story. And it's, we, we, we incorporate in our body the, the, the experience lived by somebody else. So it's, it's, a, it's an amazing way to share. So instead of using equations, we, we need some, you know, I'm a big, I love mathematics, and, uh, but it, 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 it's, it's needed at some point because of where we are at, as a civilization. But the fundamental tool is a unification, which is the unifica unification tool, and the projection tool is storytelling. So we need to go back to, instead, of, I give you an example. When we tell our kids today, a, a teenager, we need to save democracy, they don't understand what we mean. Mm. It is not related, not related whatsoever to any real experience that they've had. Whereas when we tell them the experience of people that fought for, against Nazism in the Second World War and how they've been recreating Europe after that, you know? Uh, uh, and that is a bloody story. See yeah. what I mean? So yeah. it's about, it's about resharing, you know, and stopping with, you know, using analytical thinking when it's needed, but not all the time as a, as, as, as the central tool for everything. And so it, it's the warmth and the passion of a good story as compared to the more cold nature of equations. Yeah, and, and equations don't, are, are completely enabled today to create the warmth which is needed to create faith in, 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 a, in, a, in a vision, in a possibility. Crystal clear, thanks a lot for that, Antoine. Maya, I couldn't help but notice that there was a lot of nodding on your end when Stanislav was talking about cooperative energy communities. May I just ask what your takeaway messages are for, from what you have seen in this session? What yeah, I was just thinking that we, mm, we have a group that um, buys directly from the producers um, in, our, in our association. So I was thinking about starting buying energy and sharing energy. That this is the new frontier we should um, go towards. And so um, I was just thinking about how can we um, go towards this direction, um, sharing this uh, um, goal with our local community. So Would you have an off-the-shelf answer this, to that this one? This you have an official question. Can we put a mic on? basically did most of the job already. I mean, right now, the only thing you need is, is a legal form, and you're basically there. That's what I'm saying. Um, in terms of what you can do today, technically, you can either decide to go through the actual energy market, so becoming a, a producer, so start putting production on your neighborhood, which would be one option. The second option would be to become a supplier yourself in order to supply your local community, which feels like is also something that, that might be you know, a good thing for you as well, mm -hmm. considering that you have so many contacts. The next thing is also to then, you know, bring it together and actually have collective self-consumption, you know, energy sharing, which is already uh, possible in Italy. Uh, it just so happens that the, the law in Italy changed, making uh, com energy communities more easy. So, uh, I mean, very concretely, what I can offer immediately right now is to put you in contact with Ennostra, who is a, uh, a cooperative from, from Italy, obviously, that yeah. could potentially you know, help you actually build your group and actually get on the way to, uh, to create this, this, this legal form. But I mean, the, the work is already done on, in your case, so I'm so okay. happy that you would consider that. <laughs> but we, are, we live in Rome, that's completely different from the rest of Italy. <laughs> I'm sorry Absolutely. to say that. <laughs> but thanks okay, but thank is, you for the advice. What is interesting is that, I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt, but. We are doing the same. So we have the same problem here in Brussels. Okay. Uh, we am part of a cooperative here in Brussels that is looking to do the same thing. Obviously, it's a big urban area. It's complex because there are challenges that does not exist if you are, you know, right in the countryside and you can put a windmill. Uh, but the important thing that we are relying on is the network of cooperatives in Belgium. Uh, we have a different energy law in Brussels. Some of you probably know if you live here. Uh, we have different institutions. We have different regulators. Mm -hmm. But despite that, we can still collaborate with one another and support one another. And that's what uh, the corporate movement is all about. And so really, I encourage you to reach out and get support because you know, it's always difficult to start, obviously. But if you have you know, backup and if you have people that can help you on the way, 
uh, you know, we talk about stories. If you can see yeah. somebody that made it happen, then it's somehow easier to also realize, okay, what are the little, you know, it's technical steps at the end, right? Okay. Most of the work is already done, like how to create a legal form, how to put technical stuff together. It's not that difficult, to be honest. Okay, thank, thank you for the chance. Stanislav, Jackie just gave me the peace sign, which means that she is either celebrating the victory of this panel <laughs> or we have two minutes left. You have so one minute left. Now I have one Monday. minute left and I will give it to Eleonora if I can to answer indeed in, in less than 60 seconds if you can. One of our questions that have come in through Slido asking and perhaps related to your story on, uh, on protecting the marine areas, what is needed to maintain behavioral change change if structural constraints are not addressed? Ah, it's a wonderful question. Um, it's just that showing the impact of what you do is truly important through storytelling as well. Uh, being a journalist, that's, that's a thing that resounds very deeply with me. Um, yeah, it's, we need to strive. In Italy, we're used to... <laughs> um, wait for a long time to see structural change in terms of policy, but we do it anyway. And just showing that what you do matters is, is a good way to keep the momentum going. I propose we indeed we go out on that message. May I have a warm round of applause for my panel here? <laughs> and so what I have been hearing in this morning's session is a lot about mobilizing people, about showing ownership uh, having those people on board, starting locally, listen, building trust, and then follow the energy. Having said that, and indeed this one minute is over, I hand it back over to you. Thank Jackie. you very much indeed, Philippe. And may I add my thanks to our wonderful panelists here in the room, also to the panelists who joined us online. We heard there, ladies and gentlemen, some truly inspiring examples of what is being done and what can be done to engage citizens. We're going to come back on that issue of behavioural change later on. There are also some questions about measuring impact uh, that have come through, but we'll tackle those in our last panel of the day. Lots to come back to, and we're building here a picture uh, of some of the keys to success, how to deliver effective projects, how to really implement new European Bauhaus principles. Lots to come back to. Time for us do tune in. Uh, it'll come on automatically, so listen during the break to Bauhaus Radio with Stephen Jones. He'll be having chats with change makers and policy makers throughout the coffee break and at lunch. Don't forget to sign up to those one-on-one -on -one matchmaking sessions, and I'll see you back here at 12 o'clock sharp for our next session when, as I just mentioned, we will be focusing on incentivizing behavioral change. Enjoy the break and see you in 30 minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Well, good morning and welcome back to Bauhaus Radio. It's 11.34. We've had a fascinating uh, depth of life projects and the life program uh, as a whole. And uh, there's no better person than to discuss that, that breadth and depth than uh, Angelo Salsi, who joins me now. And uh, Angelo will explain who he is. But for anyone involved in the life program, I think they would, they would really recognize you as Mr. Life. I mean, what is the LIFE programme without you? You've been with it uh, f from, from the very start, really, haven't you? Can you explain a little bit, Angelo, about how you got involved with, um, with the LIFE programme? Because obviously nature cons conservation and, and issues of the environment and, and protection didn't, didn't start with LIFE, and they, they, that wasn't the first time that the Commission got involved uh, when it started the LIFE programme. So this has been a process of evolution. Well... Well, first of all, good morning to everyone. Uh, the, uh, how did I get involved with the LIFE program? Uh, it, it was quite easy. I didn't really have to, to plan ahead or to do any particular thing. I, I joined the European Commission in April uh, 1994, and uh, a couple of days after joining, my, my head of sector, Mr. Reinhard Klein, a guy from Germany, he calls me in his office and says, uh, Angelo, uh, you will help me with LIFE. I said, okay, thanks, uh, Reinhard, uh, very nice, uh, what shall I do? 
And so that's where the story started. Uh, and the, the, the beauty is at the time, the part of the life program, the one dealing with nature, was dealt with in the same unit dealing with the policy. Probably the best scheme, if you can think about a setup uh, for, a, for a program which is policy driven, because in that way you secure what we call the program and policy integration. So the same brains and the same people, they talk about policy, they develop policy, they enforce policy, they monitor policy, and at the same time they monitor follow projects within the program, and so they can do the, the synaptic uh, connection uh, in, their, in their own heads uh, between a particular best practice that was developed by a life project and its application in a given plan or uh, implementing one of the many policies that we, we were dealing with. So that's the way it worked. And, and in, in a sense, it's still the way it works today because your, your mantra is very much replication, is very much uh, scaling up and, and seeing the added value of a particular a project within the life program, isn't it? I mean, this is what this week is about in a way, to see how you can come together uh, and learn from each other to, to make the, the sum of, the, of the, the parts more than just the individual bits. The, so the policy drive of the life program started off in the genetics of the life program in '92. Uh, just to uh, remind a particular interesting element like in the Coronel Lawrence book, uh, book about uh, when you see the imprinting, how it takes place. Uh, when life came around, uh, a few hours before, the Habitat Directive has just been adopted. And, uh, and probably life saw Natura 2000 and said, ha ha, mom, or dad, or whatever you want to call it. And there was a, a big imprinting element. And from that moment, uh, we started serving at least one particular type of policy, which was nature conservation, not only, obviously. And everybody agrees nowadays that even though life uh, is a rather small program, Natura 2000 would not be the way it is without the life program itself. And it has maintained this particular gear and this, uh, and this sort, sort of policy drive. So we are there really, as it says, uh, life regulation after life regulation. There is always a, a first article that says practically almost the same text. We are there to implement, we are there to develop, and we are there to improve uh, EU legislation at the beginning in the field of environment, now in the field of climate, and the last one addition was in the field of energy. And by, we do this by searching uh, a, in, a, in, a, in a quest of getting impact out of every life project. And you can get impact only if the life project is designed, obviously, to deliver an impact, and if then the, the knowledge of the life project is transferred, replicated, and amplified by many other similar actions. Uh, that really create the change, that sort of boule de neige, uh, that avalanche uh, thing that uh, has driven indeed Multiplier some... effect. Really. Well, th think about uh, it, it doesn't change uh, dramatically in terms of, uh, of air quality uh, in, in, uh, at a massive scale, but think about uh, the, the car-free day. It started off with a life project many, many years ago, and now every year, nobody even thinks anymore no. about when it started and why it started. But it's in our in our cities every year. At least you enjoy at least one day yeah. without car. Yeah. And I think it's psychologically and socially a massive uh, message. Yeah, uh, you mentioned um, that you started out as a, the life program in, in environment, and then you know moved. Uh, sorry, more more in nature. You mm -hmm. were saying you know in terms of, of habitats and and. Uh, you talked about uh, Natura 2000 and, and the, the various directives that came out of the Commission in the 1990s. Of course, now, the subject of this week, New European Bauhaus, has a very strong climate element. At the time when life began, almost 30 years ago, where did the climate figure, if at all? Well, climate, uh, well, uh, climate in, the, in the eyes of the of the public administration in general, and I'm pretty confident also probably in Brussels, I was not yet there, starts in the late 80s. We start really seriously talking about this, even though science was already busy with it uh, a while before, it surfaced in the, uh, in the narrative of the public administration or the international bodies uh, only in the late 80s. Uh, in, uh, in 92, uh, when life comes around, uh, nobody really talks about uh, climate change and it's not part of the fabric or the narrative of the program. But if you dig into the project, you already find climate change driven project. And so it lasted uh, so in, in this sort of implicit or hidden way 
uh, until the last edition of, uh, of Life, uh, when we decided to give it its own, if you want, separate sort of climate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, and that separ separate budget and so on. But even nowadays, I mean, it's it's very interesting to see. You can look in the list of projects we finance, say under climate adaptation. You look at them and you say, ah, but these people are protecting box. But this is a nature project. Oh, <laughs> great. Then you look in the nature project and say, ah, but these people are protecting box. This is a climate project. Yeah. And uh, and the same happens in water. So the the the, the funny thing is that uh, we give it its own identity, and I think it's it's fair. Uh, it, it it's part of if you want also of the. Uh, When you look at the LIFE program, um, I think even the most cynical observer would say it delivers a great deal more value in terms of results and outcomes than is put into it in terms of uh, public funding. Why do you think that is? There's obviously an element of project design, as you pointed out. You, there's no point engaging in this process unless you have... call it whatever you want, but uh, sustainability as a whole, these people are normally very committed to that makes a change. So we build a lot on that. Uh, it's a big asset for us. The second thing is that we have designed the program as a bottom-up program. And uh, this means that the, we try to capture the best ideas from the ground and not the other way around. We try to impose ideas from Brussels. The third uh, re part of the recipe is that we have kept life in the, through, across the years a flexible tool. Flexible means that you can design the project the way you want, the size if you want, so that you can put the burden on the shoulders knowing what, how big your shoulders are yeah. and not the other way around and how big the problem is that you, that, uh, that, that you want to solve. And the last element is that we, we are not a bank. So the European Commission or the agencies, we're not just giving out money. Uh, we are supporting the initiative of others because we think these are useful for the policy of the European Union. And we never abandon them for a second throughout their implementation and even after the implementation. So we really care. We want to be perceived almost as partners, even though we're not the one carrying out the project. And we provide in this logic uh, uh, we provide a, a support uh, to the beneficiaries to ourselves that we call the external monitors, uh, which is a person that recently, in order to understand what are sometimes even the small administrative traps uh, that uh, are in your way while you are implementing the project. Uh, and uh, the, these monitors, they are perceived by beneficiary member states, the European Parliament and the Council in, uh, in general as a, a very su successful tool. And I think this is the best practice that probably other programs uh, could look at. Well, um, now the LIFE program is embarking upon um, integrating the Bauhaus um, and equally the new European Bauhaus initiative, which is very broad, would argue that it's integrating elements of the LIFE program. You know, what can each learn from each other um, to, to make each other stronger? But in the case of life, there are two elements uh, which come from this logic of the Bauhaus that we should have probably, at least one of them, we should have 
given it a more prominent narrative in the, in the program. It's there, but it's not really uh, part of the top of the, uh, of the iceberg. Uh, it's the affordability. So clearly on sustainability, so the three elements of the Bauhaus are sustainability, affordability, and beauty, okay, the aesthetic part. So the, uh, on the sustainability, I guess that uh, that's, where, that's the area where the, the whole Bauhaus movement can capture a lot from life because we have been financing sustainability since the early days. Uh, the, uh, and the affordability, we have a, lot, a number of projects that look at the social at dimension, at the, uh, at, the, at the part of society that cannot afford and, and things like that. So there is always an, in, an element of affordability built in the project by themselves, but I wouldn't say that this was really because we put it in our narrative, so possibly we should be a bit more inclusive uh, yeah more yeah. proactive in promoting this concept yeah. and then the one that we never really thought about or uh, it was not really there uh, even though maybe we, it should uh, is the aesthetic part i think it should because a program that deals say with nature conservation will protect landscapes we will protect beauty by default yeah, what so. people see yeah. but we never really thought to expand this concept to the more the built uh, environment, yeah. Yeah, the built yeah. environment uh, element, even though we have projects that deal with this kind of, uh, of thing. So I, I would say that what we, what Bauhaus movement can learn from us is the sustainability, uh, knowledge, best practice, uh, experience, and so on. What we can learn from the Bauhaus concept is to put more prominent these two elements of the affordability uh, and, the, uh, and the aesthetic part, yeah. yeah. You mentioned to me just before we came on air that you'd been following, as we all have, the first session, and you were commenting on, on some of the, the speakers, you know, and, and saying how impressed you were. It, it seems strange that someone of your experience in the live program can still be surprised, can still be, you know, uh, impacted. Uh, to can have, can, this, this can make an impression on you, but it seems to be a characteristic of the live program in general that the more you found out, find out, the more you want to find out. It, it's 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 particularly it's unique in that respect, I think. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it's twenty five years now that I deal with life, and uh, and uh, and I have a lot of colleagues that have been uh, with me uh, in various uh, roles uh, for a very long time. Uh, it's it's quite unique. I mean, it's uh, every year we have a call, so we have a machine that looks sort of like a, a, a train that comes at the same station every year at the same time. So one would say, okay, after you've seen the train uh, 25 times, probably that's more than enough. But in reality, the train is always populated with different people. And you never really can, knows where it comes from. So for me, every year, the start of the evaluation process, so the closing of the call, it's already in itself like walking into a new supermarket that they just opened. You don't know what they're selling and you know what they, what they have on their shelves. And you start looking around and finding your own even sometimes, even the acronyms and the titles of the project. I remember a project that was called uh, as acronym Donald Duck, and uh, it was saving uh, obviously <laughs> ducks. <laughs> ducks, yeah. <laughs> but it's uh, it's it's interesting to look at the size, the ambition of the project, uh, some of the statistics, and then uh, the beaut The most beautiful part is obviously following this project. When you go on the ground, you meet people that, uh, and you see places. Uh, my kids uh, ask me, but are you paid for that? Do you get a salary for that? Because uh, they think that uh, since I have such a lot of pleasure from the work I do, I probably should renounce my salary. <laughs> <laughs> I think that partially they have a point. I mean, uh, I have been very, uh, I've been very lucky and, and many more of my colleagues as well. But it's, it's the variety and the unexpected that is in the program that keeps uh, really the program uh, so appealing uh, to individuals and the and the feeling that even though you're not digging the hole yourself, that you're really contributing to do something physical, something tangible that remains. Do you think that the LIFE programme, when, when we had the big enlargement in 2004 and, and the EU15 became 25, I mean, was that quite an important step in terms of uh, transferring the benefits of the LIFE programme to new member states? And if so, you know, what, what response have you had? And, you know, do, I, I guess th there's no sort of limit in a sense, to, to the benefits that life can bring um, to, to different countries. I, we even talked this morning about countries outside the EU that can still be part of life, right? Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the, the, the expansion obviously meant, uh, first of all, that the, 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 the budget went up, the geographical scope of life uh, massively increased. 
uh, in certain areas of life uh, we uh, we started uh, seeing things that we were never dreaming about, uh, take nature conservation, for example, with the arrival of countries like Romania, which has thousands of birds, just to name one species, uh, we, were, uh, we were changing completely the, 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 the scope and the prospects of, uh, of what life uh, should be dealing on. But the, uh, the, 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 the beauty is that we could, even in a massive exercise uh, like uh, the, uh, the enlargement, uh, and I'm not talking about the, the big enlargement already, the first pre-enlargement with three countries, so the, the, the Nordic and Scandinavians and mm -hmm. Austria, uh, I remember a story that I've been told several times, for example, for Finland. Uh, in Finland, obviously, enlargement meant at the same time life, but also Natura 2000. And the Finns, at the time, they, they perceived the arrival of Natura 2000 not as a welcome gift uh, at all. And, uh, and there were a lot of reactions, uh, even Finns, who are usually pretty calm people, reaction, uh, they, they, they went uh, pretty far in terms of externa ex externalizing uh, uh, your, your, your feelings. And it was the arrival of life that started softening the tone. So when the Finns, they started in the countryside to see that life could bring certain advantages and would be able to involve them in the shaping of how Natura 2000 would be run, then they started accept, turning more to the acceptance instead of the, the denial and the refusal. So it's a small story, but it's, it's a big country. and uh, <laughs> so It's fascinating to have that, that historical overview about the, the way the union changes and the way that perceptions change. Now, looking ahead to the new European Bauhaus uh, concept, um, this seems to fit very much with the life philosophy of, of a global vision but local action, right? I mean, is, is that how you see the, the new European Bauhaus evolving? Because, you know, it, it's very much a social concept too, isn't it, about, about living better and as well as living together. And that brings in some of the social elements that you were talking about that life has already incorporated into its own project. Uh, yes, indeed. It's, uh, you, you have this, uh, this local element, uh, which is uh, a standard feature of life, and even the arrival of the, uh, of the new energy component does not really change that, uh, that element that much, because it's true that energy is a more top-down approach than the classical life uh, traditional projects. Uh, but I just learned, for example, a few minutes ago about this Riscope project financed by energy, and uh, it's about energy cooperative, so again, very much down to, to the ground, uh, trying to involve the people. We say that life is a people's program, mm -hmm. probably not as Erasmus is, we don't get to that level of finesse in being a people's program, but it's probably uh, one of the programs that best reaches the, 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 the ground, small communities and uh, uh, small companies and, uh, and, and, and so on. So this element, life uh, certainly has it. Uh, the, and the, uh, and the more global agenda, I think that uh, there is one thing that probably life cannot do, and uh, or I, I don't think we're really geared uh, for that. I, I'm thinking about Bauhaus and preach, uh, act like, like you preach. So the, the Bauhaus concept comes obviously from uh, uh, a policy logic, if you want, a strategy, and I think uh, it does uh, create... Uh, an additional, uh, if you want, responsibility for public ad administration in general to show to their people uh, that it's not just a uh, political, if you want, uh, nice idea or a packaging. And when I say act like you preach, I'm thinking about, I don't know, a municipality that would have to choose between building a new school or restoring an existing uh, nice building uh, for the same purpose. Or using recycled materials. Or, uh, yeah, I'm thinking about, uh, indeed, uh, a, uh, even companies, private companies that have to choose uh, to build a new, a new uh, plant for their, for their industrial activities, uh, and they have to choose, obviously, a more sustainable solution and possibly more aesthetical solution because... Uh, I guess that uh, you, you might share my view that sometimes the industrial areas that we have here and there in Europe, they look anything but nice. Uh, so uh, that, that's another... Uh, that, and then, you know, nice, it's not the same concept for everyone. It's, Indeed. it's a difficult uh, challenge, uh, but it's, it means nevertheless that it's... That there was one of the interventions just this morning that said, 
if you would put all the people that are behind the development uh, on, around the table and you would ask them one by one, would you live in that place? Would you work in that place? And would you put your children to live in that place? If they say no, then probably the development <laughs> should be, Shouldn't be there. I thought it was a great idea yeah. <laughs> itself. Yeah. No, it's, it's certainly um, the, the participatory elements of, of new European Bauhaus. And, and, and uh, you know, the, together, it's one of the three words of, of, of our, our logo here, the beautiful, sustainable, together. Um, you know, this is something that, that needs to be thought through. But in terms of togetherness, there's very much a sense of family in the LIFE program. I mean, is this something that has sustained you throughout your time uh, in, in leadership of the program? A lot. It's, uh, just to give you an idea, I just met a few days ago with a former colleague of mine who retired and we are, we are planning a sort of a dinner or get together for all the life is the, from the 90s, uh, all that we can find and that would be uh, interested in, uh, in joining us. So there is a strong uh, bound uh, among people and uh, like in every, in every long relation, uh, professional relation, you have moments of uh, where you have arguments, uh, disagreements and things like that. But at the end of the day, you, the, 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 the feeling that you have is that you have, that you have traveled more with friends and companions than with colleagues. Uh, and, uh, and you look back at those, uh, those people and for each of them I, I still have uh, uh, a lot of positive memory and a few days ago we, we had a meeting with our, we have, a, uh, we have the yearly meeting with our monitors uh, and we met with our monitors for the first time after COVID in presence and we invited uh, our, uh, fir the first head of unit of the, of the li uh, life unit uh, to speak to us. Uh, he has retired more than 10 years ago. The guy was very happy obviously and very proud of being there uh, and I felt that uh, it was a good moment for the people to touch almost physically, if you want, a piece of the history of the program. Of course, so, yeah. yeah, I agree with you. There is it is okay? A, yeah. There is, yeah. There is yeah. a lot in the fabric of the program that keeps yeah, can us you hear uh, me? running for such a long time and so okay. pleasantly. Well, f for you, retirement is coming up. I'm, I'm sure you don't really mind me saying this, but of course many people have said to me, well, we can't imagine life without yeah, Andrew. Now, we talk about the afterlife of a life project. What's the afterlife, the formal afterlife for Angelo Salsi? I mean, you, you're not going to leave this behind totally, are you? I mean, it's part of your, who you are. Uh, well, yeah. the, the first thing is that life does not leave you alone, nevertheless, even if you would like to, uh, yeah. if you would think Thank about you. walking away from it. Yes. Uh, every time you, you put your, uh, uh, your, your, your back on a, on a nice beach or you walk on a nice mountain, uh, mm -hmm. or whatever uh, I think I'm the place first. where a tourist first. might be <laughs> pleasantly uh, uh, walking around, uh, you risk finding a life <laughs> funnel uh, in front of you. It's amazing how physically <laughs> present is life uh, uh, across Europe. Mm -hmm. On the, on the other side, I have no intention of sure to now? simply yeah. put my brain yeah. in the, in um, the drawer and, uh, and shut the drawer, so I'm, I'm hoping to be able to okay. uh, use what I have acquired in all those years uh, in, a, in a more flexible and, uh, way, uh, so not from 9 a.m. until whatever time <laughs> yeah, in, the, the first one. in the evening every other day of the, of the working week. Okay. That's the beauty probably of the, of the retirement. Uh, uh, but uh, indeed, uh, the, 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 the afterlife for me, it's, it's a challenge, like for everybody else, but I'm looking forward it, uh, to it n not in an unpleasant way. It's, uh, I, I'm trying to think, uh, well, Angel, this is a, once more you have to reinvent yourself. Uh, I'm going to have some It's like when you move from university and you start working, okay, physically okay. And, and, and from a brain point of view, Busy you're agenda. more flexible. Yeah, that's fine. But still, you have to reinvent yourself. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and again, when I moved from Italy, so from my first job, uh, which I loved and I still regret I have lost uh, today, uh, to the European Commission, uh, it was yet another challenge reinventing myself, not only in a job, but in a context, in a different place, mm. uh, different friends and so on. And now I have to I'm reinvent happy, myself I'm happy to uh, move. Do you want me to more. go there? Okay. What I've learned <laughs> looking at the people that have survived a very long time in good shape is that uh, the, the most important muscle to mm -hmm. keep running mm -hmm. is brain. And, uh, and, and, in, and in the brain, obviously, are all my memories of the project or my knowledge about uh, the, the program and, uh, and, and the policy which lies behind. So uh, I guess I'm going to continue to use it. Uh, and uh, it depends also if there are people willing to pick up, uh, pick on, uh, on my brain. I'm sure that everyone will be very reassured uh, from hearing that, um, 
Angelo. Well, thank you very much for your participation today on Bauhaus Radio. We're going to go back to the main conference room now and look forward to the next session. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So, in our first session today, we heard and reminded ourselves why new European Bauhaus is so important to the transformation envisaged by the European Green Deal. Its soul, it was said, a way to make it a cultural, positive, human-centered experience. And Clara de la Torre talked about connecting the Green Deal to living spaces by realizing those key Bauhaus values of sustainability, aesthetics, and inclusion, and hence our conference title for this three days, Beautiful, Sustainable, Together. And in our first panel, we heard some really inspiring examples of what is being done <coughs> and what can be done to engage citizens, to mobilize them, which, as Philippe said at the beginning of the day, is so important to create that sense of ownership. Our speakers in the last panel also uh, began touching on the issue of how to incentivize behavior change. Uh, and we're going to focus on that in our second session today as we look more specifically at what works, what doesn't, how do we really drive it, what mix of carrot and sticks. Delighted to hand back to the moderator, Philippe van der Nabila, to moderate this session. Philippe, back to you. Thank you so much, Jackie. And indeed, in this sec second session, we want to talk about incentivizing a behavioral change towards more sustainable practices. The European Green Deal recognizes the importance of changing behavioral norms of individuals, communities, private and public organizations in order to accelerate that transition to a low-carbon economy. So in this se session, we want to discuss which approaches and incentives facilitate change towards more sustainable practices. Uh, are carrot or stick approaches better, or maybe a combination of both? Which social-cultural incentives, such <coughs> as social recognition, can encourage a behavioral change? And can we learn from the best practices which are already established? I'll be glad to introduce to you no less than seven speakers and organize a meeting of the minds on incentivizing behavioral change. So let's start with our first three speakers, listening and learning from those speakers, then engage again in a short roundtable discussion on common themes that have emerged. Uh, then I'll blend in another four uh, speakers, and again by the end of the session we'd like to hear from you. So if you have any questions or remarks, people in the room can raise their hands. You uh, who are tuned into our channel or our session today, I encourage you to keep using Slido, hashtag New European Bauhaus, and that will then enable us to also address your questions and put them to our speakers and our panel. And the first speaker of our session is with me here on site. Joanna Romanovic is Director of Engagement at Students Organising for Sustainability UK. Joanna is passionate about sustainability and strives to have a positive impact through empowering others to take action. So I'd like to ask Joanna how we can successfully engage people and incentivize behavioral change under, say, the wider umbrella of SAFES2, students achieving valuable energy savings. Great, thank you very much for having me here today. So SAFES2 was a Horizon 2020 project that finished earlier this year. It lasted for four years, and it uh, took place in seven different countries across Europe. 
um, engaging over 200,000 students. So I'll talk a little bit about what uh, our experience has been um, in terms of incentivizing behavior change as part of the project. Um, one thing I'd like to reflect on that was mentioned before, um, from my experience, changing mindset and behavior are two very different things. You can change mindset, but behavior might not follow straight away. Um, they, they are linked, but they're not the same thing um, from, from my experience. So um, what was SAFES2 about? Um, it was made of two different campaigns, uh, working with students. Uh, the first campaign was working with students in halls of residence, where students do not pay for energy. So there is no incentive for them to save money or energy. And the second project was working with students in the private rented sector um, under the umbrella of uh, reducing their exposure to energy poverty, which is a huge issue. It's a hidden energy poverty um, across Europe when it comes to, to young people. So my reflection, do you take a carrot or a stick approach? Um, I personally think it's not that clear cut. I think you need a bit of both um, from my experience. Um, I think you first need the carrot at least with students, to kind of hook them in, um, to kind of make behavior change a bit of fun, uh, win some prizes, and then if you kind of normalize it um, within the student population and halls of residence, others will follow. And I can definitely say that from my own experience when I went to university, I definitely wasn't as sustainable as I am now, but I was kind of embedded in a community where everybody was cycling. I, I studied at Oxford, everybody was cycling there. I grew up in a country where nobody did that. And I kind of felt almost marginalized by not doing that. So um, I, I think it's really kind of important to normalize certain behaviors. But I think with the student population, we felt we needed to hook them in through, through the kind of carrot approach. Um, what was really important in our project, and here is a picture of some of our student ambassadors, was um, peer to peer engagement. Um, the messenger was really quite key. So a project came from um, mostly from staff working in universities and students unions who were trusted messengers. But a huge part of our project was training up students um, across different universities across Europe. So then they would engage their, their peers, so it became normalized. So I think um, when it comes to behavior change, um, I've listened to a lot of podcasts around behavior change, so I kind of reflect that when I run my projects. But the thing that really resonates with me, and I can really see within our project, is this idea of friction versus not friction. So I think people are much more likely to um, make change if the behavior you want them to take on is easier. So for example, people or students are much more likely to take the stairs if they're next to the elevator. You don't need to kind of go around some back rooms to try and find it. Same with recycling, same with energy saving. You kind of need to reduce that friction and make it the easier behavior because people, students, myself, uh, are inherently lazy. You, even you, you believe energy saving is important, you believe you should be buying sustainable, but if it's kind of not there in front of you, if it's hard, you're less likely to do it. Um, can you please change the slide? Um, yeah, here are just some photos from our um, prizes. Um, we gave a lot, lots of individual and um, community-based prizes. So thinking about the idea about market incentives and kind of social prestige, um, it was a mix of both for, for us, and it was really interesting to see differences between different um, countries. So in northern countries, the UK and Ireland, we kind of found that kind of individual gains um, were something that students were more interested in, whereas when we worked with our Mediterranean countries, students actually wanted to collectively achieve change and save energy within their halls of residence rather than competing against each other, which is quite an interesting kind of observation that we made. Um, can you please change the slide? So here is a nice example of a student that we worked with, and you can see kind of her, her journey. So as I said at the start, we kind of have found that kind of market-based incentives, um, kind of those hooks are really quite important. So for Adela, um, she um, first got involved in our projects because there was free ice cream. Uh, might sound silly, but actually that's the reason why a lot of students would get involved, a lot of people would get involved because there's something fun, they get something at the end of it, but actually, as you can see, she kind of really progressed through her journey um, at the University of Bristol 
kind of linking to running a big event with uh, fellow students at the university. So I think um, we can't push away like little incentives and think they're insignificant because they are those things that really can hook, can hook students in. Um, can you take the next slide, please? And this was really interesting research that we found was that nearly three quarters of students say that the main reason they get involved in sustainability is because of climate action, uh, but only a small proportion, uh, less than half percent, say they do it for prizes. But we found if we took the prizes away, they actually were much less likely to kind of get involved. Um, I will be wrapping up in a second. And here's an interesting study as well from Halls of Residence where we did like an A-B testing where students had to pay for energy and then they hadn't. And energy decreased um, in 33% um, of, of Halls if they didn't have to pay for it. So we cannot underestimate um, market incentives. And Thank you so up. much, Joanna, for <laughs> sharing these insights and indeed hopeful to see that Students are much more uh, motivated by taking personal action than by merely winning prizes. Mm -hmm. And needless to add, students are always motivated by free ice cream. <laughs> My next speaker is sitting with me here in Brussels as well, next to Johanna. Uh, so allow me to introduce Professor Michael Skoulos, who is Director of the Lab for Environmental Chemistry at the University of Athens, and also chairing the Mediterranean Information Office for Environment culture and sustainable development. A very warm welcome with us in Brussels here, Professor. Uh, we are indeed looking for best practices to, to change behavior, to incentivize people. I understand you have a long track record with uh, a large number of life projects, so I would like to pick your brain and tap into that vault of experience to learn from you uh, how we can incentivize behavioral change. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for inviting me and also um, I'm delighted to be here and uh, listen to uh, the previous speakers. I decided not to present any slides because uh, uh, in many of my, my slides uh, I could have, I mean, simply copied similar yeah. initiatives. So I would like to focus a little bit more on the concepts mm -hmm. and um, uh, chairing the Mediterranean Information Office for Environment, Culture and Sustainable Development uh, from the name itself you can understand that we approach in an integrated way the natural and cultural environment and sustainable development. So we are very close to the concept of Bauhaus, yeah. the new Bauhaus and actually um, the original idea of Bike House is to bring quality to a mass production. That was the initial idea. And I think is very important today, again. So how we can bring with us a um, bigger number of people, companies, and uh, communities, I think... Um, uh, the most important is to give hope. And uh, here I want to use what Antoine said in the previous session. Our analytical, uh, our analysis, particularly today, is pessimistic in most cases. And the issue ha is how from this analysis, we conduct policies in a positive way because it is absolutely necessary. And this is through stories. And our stories is showing how we can have a better world. This is a projection of a faith for something better. Yes. And this is the way in which we managed to bring the 133 organizations we have, among them big federations mm -hmm. like uh, the EEB uh, in Brussels, the European Environment Bureau, or the Arab Network for Environment Development among our founders 30 years ago, 
with the different organizations having different methodologies, different uh, um, motives, and see what kind of incentives we have for that. First of all, when we are talking about incentives, we have to understand that they are not the same for individuals, mm -hmm. for groups, for companies, or for politicians. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are different, and we have to be um, more sophisticated in, in doing that. In, in, uh, uh, let me, because one of the questions is stick or carrot. I think that this is good for companies, for, for groups that share material benefits, but not for individuals. For individuals, I mean, you may use it for pets, but not for children, because we should not actually particularly give, mix up something that we try to build through ethical, through ethos, and through principles with gains, particularly gains of material nature. We should not actually give a few cents for a bottle that is brought back to the supermarket because we want to have other principles there, responsibility, citizenship, and you mix the two. So we are talking about discipline and award, but not stick and carrot, not candy, not the sweet you mentioned, yeah. not, not, not the ice cream. It is a different thing. We need to keep it clear because we want to elevate the willingness to be, uh, and pride, to be somebody recognized by the society, not to get a little bit something back, particularly few cents. Otherwise, we, we encourage people to look even for small material Benefits. So you're saying, Professor, by offering ice cream, we're almost poisoning the very process that should appeal to citizenship. Exactly. Yeah. So we have to, and even when we have to get something back to the society, we have to have it as sharing the benefit. Yeah. If, a, if a company makes more money by getting ready the recyclable, this it enhances, increases the benefit, yes. their benefit. And sharing it is a different thing. It's not an award. So we have to play with principles. We have to go deeper in principles and get also rid of the tyranny of the vision. We have to concentrate in abstract thinking and in this way, we can really help individuals and also groups and hopefully politicians. Market incentives are extremely important for business. And the same is for, let's say, trying to present ideas that uh, are sometimes difficult to present, for example, the tools we are using are all the tools of sustainable development. Sustainable development requires governance. Governance requires science and technology, regulation and institutions, education, education, education. Yeah. And this is, particularly education for sustainable development, is something on which Europe, the European Union, should actually invest much more. It is the basis of all what we are talking about. And we need to have, we have uh, many projects in our organization. We have been instrumental in bringing in the uh, Mediterranean Strategy for Education for Sustainable Development that was approved by the ministers of the Union for the Mediterranean 
and then the ministers of education, the, its action plan. We need to have much more uh, uh, when we come to training the trainers. Yeah. They, uh, there we are very weak. Mm -hmm. We need to have uh, much more emphasis on this, this incentive. The incentive is how we can make people proud. I'm talking about individuals. Making people proud because there is an old Greek say that um, many people have distanced from uh, money. Nobody has distanced from voxa, from glory. Okay. But glory in Greece has two words, glory and kleos. Glor voxa is what the people accept as important. So uh, people want to have doxa. Everybody wants this. This is the reward. And we have to try to shift the reward to ethical and personal contribution and acceptance of this contribution at all levels. Uh, allow me to indeed take this education, education, education as one of the takeaway messages for, from your address. Thanks a lot for that, Professor. I think these were some fairly strong and also pro provocative statements or an address which will certainly serve as a kickstarter, if not a fire starter, for our Q&A sessions. Again, you're cordially invited to participate to those by submitting your questions through Slido. Meanwhile, since this is a hybrid conference, allow me to beam in our next speaker, Christian Kluckner, who is Professor in Social Psychology and Quantitative Methods at the Norwegian University for Science and Technology. He leads the research group for Citizen, Environment and Safety, which focuses on individual social and contextual drivers for environmental decisions. Professor Kluckner has been engaged in the Enchant Horizon 2020 project on energy efficiency through behavior change Trans, uh, transition strategy, enlighten us, Professor Kluckner, what works best, the carrot or the stick? Well, first of all, thank you and um, good afternoon from Trondheim uh, in Norway to Brussels. Can I please see my slides on the screen somewhere? Um, I, uh, w while that is being fixed, I can already say that I'm not completely agreeing with um, the speaker before me that sticks and carrots should be avoided at all costs because I think there is a value in sticks and in carrots as well as there is in building culture and, and building on, the, on, on pride and so on. Um, I wanted to give some examples from the research that I've been doing in the last couple of years with my research group and I wanted to show some pictures which I cannot see now. Um, Coming up right so, now. They're coming up, Pardon? Professor. Coming up right okay. now, Professor. Yes. Uh, so I will present some examples from several projects. So it's not only Enchant, but this one here is from a project that we just recently finished. It's called Smarties, and it studied energy innovations, uh, bottom-up initiatives in different cities around Europe. And what you can see here are two examples of super blocks in uh, Spain, where they like banished car traffic from the inner part of uh, living quarters in, in the bigger cities. And uh, created room for people to meet there. And this was done by both a strategy of carrots and sticks. So there was uh, a ban on parking spaces, for example, in the areas, but there was also the introduce, introduction of uh, public transportation. And overall, this actually led to a substantial change in people's behavior and in people's use of space, and not the least in people's well-being, which then is in line with what I think the new European Bauhaus is about. Please, next slide. Uh, what you can see here is from the Inchan project, and uh, this is a good example for what has been named education before. So here we have the Nifsa Gardens in uh, Italy as an example, which both are a very beautiful place where people go for recreation, but which also have a very old but still functioning water power plant. So it's a relatively small, you can see it on the screen here. And what we use this for in the Enchant project is trying to, to give people an experience with this way of producing energy in a very beautiful environment. And then 
make them connect that to their own energy use at home, but also to energy production and investments in, in renewable energies. And it seems to work uh, quite well. Next slide, please. What you can see here is taking it even a step further. This is from a project that we did in Norway, uh, which is called Climart, where we studied how we can use art and artworks um, to communicate around climate change. And in this, in this project, we had an embedded artist who, together with uh, the team of psychologists in this project, um, created this uh, installation that you can see here. The installation is called Pollution Pots, and it's um, an experience. You can go in these pods here and experience <laughs> the air pollution in uh, five different cities around the world. So you could go from Trondheim, which has relatively clear air, to London, to uh, New Delhi, to Beijing, and to Sao Paulo. And you could, on your body, experience what the air is like in these places. And then we found that this experience is quite strong and emotionally activates people. So that, that is a very good starting point for, for starting a process of, of behavior change, of lifestyle change. It's not guaranteed, of course, that something will happen, but it is, it's, a very, it's a much more powerful entry door to reaching people than presenting them, let's say, with another scientific report. And then slide, next slide, please. And then the last question that uh, I was asked was, how can we use ICT? How can we use labels? How can we use games and, and learning experiences and communication? And also for that, <clears throat> we had a project that I could uh, report from. And this is a project, um, it's, it's called African Bioservices, was a, an, a, an age 2020 project. And the main focus here was looking at ecosystem management in the uh, Masai Mara uh, National Park region in Kenya and in Tanzania. And um, <clears throat> part of that project was that we developed, together with a professional game developer, a board game that actually simulates the decisions that people living in villages around this national park make. So how do we sustain a living for the family? How important is birth control? What does it if we have many children? What does it if we have a lot of cattle? Uh, both to our social status on the one hand, but also to the pressure on the, the ecosystem and on the national park. And we play this game, uh, which was as I said, developed together with a game developer, but also with um, representatives on the ground in Kenya and Tanzania. And we, we went into different villages around the national park and played it, and then interviewed people. And they report that this actually was a very educating experience. And, and many told us that, yes, of course, we, we hear about that birth control is really important. But in this game, we can see what happens if you have a lot of children and how much pressure that creates on the ecosystem, for example. So here again, I would argue that um, using different ways of teaching, different ways of communication is a good idea if you want to change people's cultures and people's lifestyles. And with that, I end my impulse. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for sharing those insights, Professor Kluckner, and indeed I think for confirming that if you put two professors in the same room, you have at least a thousand ideas and one disagreement. And allow me to take that <laughs> slight disagreement <laughs> and to put it back to you, Professor Skoulos. So I'm hearing different <laughs> opinions here on... We didn't disagree, actually. I didn't see where uh, my colleague disagreed, because what he mentioned at the beginning was uh, about um, communities using, uh, let's say, uh, public transport. Uh, it, we are not talking about individual children. I insist on when we are talking about individual children where we need to make this distinction and we, to avoid even this term. This term is not for humans and not for children. This, I insist on that perhaps, uh, but is, uh, uh, I think, a matter of terminology at the end of the day, playing with words.
Okay, so semantics not disagreeing. <laughs> Joanna, you were talking about individual children, mm -hmm. although disguised as students. Mm -hmm. I'd like to throw back the, the last part of mm -hmm. Professor Kluckner at you. When he was talking about ICT, labels and even mm -hmm. gamification, mm -hmm. would that be a leverage to incentivize students? Yeah, definitely. So the Save Student Project, one of the campaigns was a competition. Um, so basically different halls of residence where students were living were competing against each other to save energy. So that definitely worked from our perspective. Um, but I also want to come in on the individual thing, because I actually think market intent, even though I think education is so important, I work on education and charity, but I don't think you can just rely on education. You know, we do research with coffee cups and universities. Some universities take the stick, some take the carrot approach. Um, universities who have cafe outlets that um, give people a little discount see a marginal decrease in the use of coffee cups, whereas if you pay extra to have an ex um, disposable coffee cups, something like 30 or 40%, uh, there's a reduction of that in people who have disposable coffee cups. So the money part really, even though I don't want to be cynical, <laughs> but it really does play a huge part. On the individual part, yeah, sure. May I say something? Uh, since we are in a European, uh, there was a, a famous um, group of wise men chaired by Delors, Jacques Delors, uh, under UNESCO and not under EU. And uh, the, they uh, gave us the four uh, most important uh, competences of learners. The first was learning to learn, learning to be, learning to work with others, and learning to act. Mm -hmm. All these are important, and for those who are the educators, they have to inspire learners for all of that. So we are not talking about just education in a classroom, or leading to a degree, we are talking about the culture of living. And this is what Bauhaus is about, and not only for children, to my understanding. So we know that as persons, we work with money, with opposite ideas, with political systems. And this is also why in MIO we have the circle of uh, educators, the MEDIS, mo with more than 6,000 educators on ESD. We have the COMPSUD, the Circle of Mediterranean Parliamentarians for Sustainable Development, and COMZEST, the Circle of Media. So all these educate and be educated all the time, but the most important thing is to link theory and concepts with action. And this is what we had previously in the previous session okay. with all these excellent examples. These examples are not in the TV every day. They are murders, they are all things that do not inspire for hope and for a better future. And this is, the, I'm delighted to be here with all these people who work for a better future and indeed, there are so many. And we need to make this the real mirror for the future. And this requires <clears throat> the overall education, what I put under education. And I think that all of us agree that <clears throat> it is not the only tool. It is one of the most important tools. I, I, I'm certain that all of us agree, but I just want to make that crystal clear. Professor Kluckner, if you're still with us, do you confirm indeed that, that you agree with Professor Skoulos on this pressing need for education, education and also training the trainer? Well, of course I agree with that. And I, I would like to say one more word about the sticks and the carrots. It, it's, a, it's not a good terminology. <coughs> it's a terminology that comes from, from uh, training animals. <clears throat> I agree on that. But for, for small things like the, the reusable cups or not, um, it works very well with incentives, as we would call them, financial incentives sometimes, and, and also sometimes punishments. But if you want to 
change <coughs> larger lifestyles, you do not get anywhere with these measures. There is rather building new cultures and of course education is part of that if you understand education as something that is uh, also including the experience with artwork for example that i talked about or playing games or being in a, in a nice natural environment which inspires you and all the other things and of course education is not only for children Okay, thanks a lot, Professor Kluckner, Professor Skoulos and Joanna Romanovic mm -hmm. for sharing your thoughts and insights. Very helpful and also hopeful, Professor, that you made reference to Jacques Delors, one of the founding fathers of Europe. I think that uh, Jacques Delors will, will be secretly proud if he sees the blueprint of the new European Bauhaus, which is in the making. <coughs> Coming up next is Michael Scambri, who is Chief Policy Officer at the Water Unit of the Energy and Water Agency in Malta. Set up in 2014, this agency is tasked with formulating and implementing national policies in the energy and water sectors, aiming at ensuring security, sustainability and affordability of energy and water in Malta. A very warm welcome to the stage, Michael. Uh, I understand you'll be sharing with us some experiences of a life project designed to optimize the implementation of the second river basin management plan in the Malta River Basin District, correct? Correct. And thanks for the invite and good afternoon to all. Um, so if we can Please put up the first slide of, of the presentation. I've prepared uh, a couple of slides to share the experience that we've gained uh, from the implementation of the project, which will also continue in the coming years. The, the project will end in 2025. Um, first and foremost, why are we addressing um, behavioral change, uh, changing mindsets within also management plans targeting water management in the Maltese Islands? within a context of water scarcity, within a context of, of a lack of availability of natural water resources, behavioral change is as important as infrastructural projects. So technology on its own cannot solve the problem. We also need to keep into consideration the, um, the attitude, the mindset, the behavior of, of the people in, in the Maltese Islands. And this, I believe, is also a case which is relevant in, in many other regions in, the, in Europe. Um, I'll share a couple of uh, examples from uh, specific actions within this project. First and foremost, for example, is uh, pre previous slide, please, is um, we're one of the actions is focusing on awareness raising through house visits. So we're giving the possibility uh, homeowners who have different queries on how they're utilizing water uh, w water within then ha their household to call the, the Energy and Water Agency and get in touch with personnel from the agency to give them advice and even visit their household to inform them on how they can optimize further their, their water use. Obviously, this is also very much related to energy, energy use within the, uh, within the household, given that they are very much uh, interrelated. And it, this action is doing, uh, was uh, being implemented quite successfully. Obviously, before the, the uh, pandemic, there were around 500 visits uh, ev every year. Um, but we had to slightly change the approach w once the pandemic was uh, in, uh, had some restrictions and therefore this, this service was also being offered uh, through by, by telephone. But we'll, we plan to continue this service in, in, in the coming years. Uh, next slide, please. Another way, another approach to how we want to inform people and raise awareness and eventually change mind mindsets and, and behaviors is through the development of a water saving app. So the objective of this app, which is currently being developed, is to inform uh, people about their water use characteristics and also uh, potentially to um, instill a sort of a sense of uh, community awareness uh, on whether uh, their daily use of water resources and how does it compare to the average water resource within uh, or water resource use within within the Maltese Islands. This um, might not need might not necessarily lead to um, financial gains or uh, to lower 
um, utility, table, utility bills, but instilling this uh, awareness might actually lead to behavioral change. Next slide, please. Another activity within the project is to instill more awareness is also to promote um, and introduce water, also water efficiency labels. There are already ongoing initiatives um, with, with regards to water efficiency labels. There is, was even uh, the up updating of the energy label earlier this year, which also makes uh, very interesting references to water conservation. So how can we uh, raise awareness and make sure that pe people are uh, understanding and uh, taking into consideration these aspects when purchasing, when interacting with water use devices. Next slide, please. A, a very important component of the project is uh, educational activities. Uh, we believe that uh, few, the tomorrow's citizens, tomorrow, uh, the students, actually are um, the key candidates on where we can instill uh, the principles, as Professor Sulo said, uh, for uh, tomorrow's citizens. So, um, giving them and informing them about the importance uh, of uh, water conservation, of, on the principles of why water conservation is important within, especially, the context of, of a water scarce context, uh, that's, that's very important. And do we do this by uh, incentivizing school projects. So every year, a number of schools are assisted through to do water conservation projects, which actually involve students. So the ac actually students do part of, of the work. Um, and uh, they are also uh, recognized and um, made more aware of these, these initiatives. Uh, next slide, please. And, and finally, there are also um, other educational activities within the, within the project where uh, we run a, a water conservation awareness center. It's a national center and we incentivize visits from schools by sponsoring, for example, their transport for them to come over to the center and inform them about various water-related water aspects. So, for example, issues related to the hydrological water cycle. Um, so how can one be how can one do water saving on a day-to-day -day basis? It's, it's all about educating tomorrow's citizens with the principles of um, sustainability when it comes to water resources. And these, these activities have been quite, quite successful. So in, in recent years, we've had uh, more, more than uh, 2,500 students visiting the, the center. And these, uh, obviously, there were some disruptions because of the uh, pandemic, but now that uh, the education activities have restarted, um, bookings are uh, coming in quite fast until um, March, March next year. So uh, quite a, a nice and interesting incentive to educate tomorrow's citizens. Um, that's basically in terms of the key actions which I would like to highlight from the project, which are um, aimed at changing the mindsets and potentially also um, instilling behavioral change. They might not necessarily, all of them, lead to a behavioral change, but if we install the principles in, uh, in few tomorrow's citizens, in, in today's citizens, um, this might eventually lead to a behavioral change. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Michael, for sharing the merits of smart water meter technology with us. Indeed, an important leverage, I think, to change household water consumption yeah. and behavior. And in the process, also adding weight to this warm plea of Professor Skoulos on education, education, education. For our next contribution, let's go to Milan and try to connect to Luisa Crisi Giovanni, who is Secretary General at Altro Consumo and Fundraising Program Manager at Euroconsumers. Luisa can share with us the return on experience from the Clear 2.0 Horizon 2020 project on enabling consumers to learn, engage and adopt self-generation with renewables. Luisa, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you very much for having invited me, representing uh, the results of this landmark project uh, made by consumers uh, for consumers. If you go to the next slide, please. Let's uh, see in a nutshell the impact that we were able to generate uh, um, in, in this 
is um, actually more or less uh, three years uh, project uh, or less, uh, we trigger something like 29,000 installations for a total amount of investment of 129 million, which means that, uh, uh, you know, money counts uh, when we are talking about incentives, especially as uh, Professor uh, Christian Kloschner uh, mentioned before, if you need to have, uh, um, you know, long-term uh, impact uh, or uh, lifestyle change, you, you really need to understand very well uh, what the impact this will have on your family. And of course, this is one part of the story. Uh, the other part of the story that we discover that even when the incentive is there, you need to enable the change uh, because of course, it's not only sufficient to be aware of the possibility of an incentive, but you need to activate people to save the money and also easy, be an easy access uh, or one-stop shop if you want uh, uh, to make this happen. So uh, to really help them become prosumers. So is, this is what exactly we did, saving money and also saving CO2 emissions, thanks to Clear2 project uh, uh, realize uh, together with partners such as Bilk, uh, ICRT, Deco in Portugal, Oco in Spain, Altro Consumo in, Ip in Italy, Slovenia, Mipor, D testing in Czech Republic, and Testasha in Belgium. And of course, we base this uh, engagement mainly on the community of the members that we, we already have in terms of uh, members of respective consumer organization. If you go to next slide, please. Uh, what we did uh, uh, really to investigate, to listen. So as you mentioned before, we, we actually carefully listening uh, and also try to understand the motivation and uh, let's say the main uh, drivers for changing the behaviors, uh, conducting online interviews. Then we tested also, uh, let's say both the products and also the use of energy uh, monitoring a group of households, providing them with information on the equipment, so reassuring them, coaching them about the choice. Uh, we, of course, also uh, supporting them in, in really, you know, um, also get, uh, get information from the uh, digital tools. So, so actually we train them a little bit on, on the technology and accompanying this cheaper buy or smarter uh, purchase of uh, renewable energy. And in this way, we contributed, of course, to the national and EU energy policy, but let's say that we had really to uh, support uh, from, uh, you know, from scratch these families to, to, let's say, do this change. If you go to the next slide, please. This, okay, was all the journey that, uh, uh, actually came, uh, we came through from the investigating the attitude uh, uh, on, uh, on the climate, uh, uh, highly important, of course, everyone declares that it's important, but then you need to ensure on which is the best possible technology depending on where you live, uh, because it's not exactly the same things to when you, we are talking about Milan or Palermo in Sicily, 1000 kilometers far which are the financial aspect relevant for every household, and of course, uh, really, you know, tailor uh, their needs and, and then reassure them about specific information uh, about the financial aspects uh, and the environmental one. So not just, uh, let's say, the product or the service uh, isolated, but really a full package of, of support. If you go to the next slide, please. Let's say that this uh, was uh, in a nutshell again what we produce, uh, the 29,000 installation that I mentioned before, um, and uh, the, the watts uh, actually of renewable energy produced uh, per year, and the 129 million estimated total investment by these uh, communities of consumer, which impacted the several countries. But the good news is that the communities that we created also thanks to the previous project, this was an Horizon 20 project, 2020 project uh, uh, previously, really uh, are uh, still uh, kicking and alive. So as you mentioned, um, 
inside each communities that is uh, still uh, alive on our website and on the other respective website, people are actually supporting each other. So we actually create an environment of trust where people could really pick up this uh, most uh, sustainable choice that we encourage them to, to pick up. And if you go to then the last slides, uh, my, our learnings, okay, this was the monitoring and coaching on energy efficiency. So the number of families that we coach, but if you go to the next one, you will have uh, uh, my considerations about the stick and the carrots approach. I do believe as the previous speakers that we need both. Huh? And uh, uh, as was mentioned, probably even in the first panel, especially in countries such as Italy, where we have a not quite really stable legislative framework. So it's quite favorable at the moment because we have great uh, uh, you know, green incentives uh, and taxation. Uh, but you know, the uncertainty of the rule uh, doesn't facilitate people to engage uh, towards sustainable uh, you know, choices. And therefore we need this to have a kind of uh, Time lapse, time lapse sufficiently long to really help people to engage. You need to ensure consumer can easy, as, have access to fa sustainable financing, provide consumers with clear and reliable granular information about the monitoring also of the impact that this investment will generate for real in terms of money and in terms of emission, because I do agree upon, let's say the ethical engagement, but I want to have it shown. Huh? So we need to nudge consumers, but also to be transparent, transparent by the, uh, the, the impact that we all together can generate. And design uh, of the products should also incorporate since the beginning, by default, uh, this easy access and easy possibility to monitor the impact uh, of the decrease of my billing and decrease of the emission that I will generate. So incentivize public and private partnership is key. And do not forget the role that consumer groups such as Altro Consumo, the network of consumer organization in Euroconsumer or Bail could play, talking to a cluster uh, only in Italy, for example, of 300,000 members of, your, of, of, of uh, ProConsumo, who can be a starting point, ambassadors who can tell the story to other consumers. Thank you very much. Thank you for this very clear keynote address, Luisa. And if I can single out just one of the carrots in your long list that you've just shown, I recall the benefits indeed of providing consumers with clear, reliable and granular information on consumption monitoring. I think that in this day and age, which, with energy prices rising through the roof, that for sure will incentivize behavioral change. So thanks a, a lot again. And let's fly from Milan in Italy to Heidelberg in Germany, where Selina Kaspersky is working as a postdoctoral researcher at Mannheim University. Selina has research interests ranging from sports psychology over games, gamification and dynamic systems, all the way to behavioral change and environmental psychology. I'd like her to talk about the latter subjects since she has been closely involved in the Horizon 2020 Decide project on developing energy communities through informative and collective actions. Selina, please take it away. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you uh, for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, so yes, uh, one of the EU Horizon projects uh, that we work on together with my team um, you can see on the slide there is um, about developing energy communities um, through informative and collective actions, which means we try to um, uh, study different kinds of interventions, both um, on an informational level, also on a social level to see uh, what works best to get people to join an energy community and to adopt energy efficient behaviors. And um, in our work package in particular, we look at the social science um, applications. Um, so how can we motivate citizens towards joining those collective actions and towards sustainable behavior change? Um, next slide, please. So I'm just going to very briefly talk a little bit about um, how we approach this in our project, and then I'll give a couple examples as well, um, what we've done so far. We're quite at early stages in the project still, so um, 
we have uh, spent quite a little bit of time um, gathering insights into um, energy communities, what makes people join energy communities and what motivates people um, and the best practices for how to communicate and um, how to encourage this kind of interaction in terms of interventions, for example, and communications with people, um, as well as we focus on trying to figure out how to best evaluate this, uh, because I think this is a big an area where still um, quite a little bit of, of insights are necessary um, uh, evaluation of social impacts, yes. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so this is, uh, I'm going to show two different approaches that we've used. One is a, um, a more quantitative approach, a randomized control trial. If you could go to the next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Um, so one is a randomized control trial, a field experiment that we've designed to target different identities in a region in, in um, Austria uh, for uh, or in collaboration with Our Power, which is an energy um, cooperative provider um, that tries to get prosumers to sign up um, so that they can provide their neighbors and their region with um, the energy that they produce um, and uh, gather people into a community in this way. So we want to test the hypothesis of whether this social identity, this collective of friends and neighbors might work better than, for example, a regional or place attachment identity or a, a climate change or a sustainability identity. And uh, to do this, we send out 9,000 postcards to all the households in the region that produce energy, that have solar panels on their roofs and, uh, to try and figure out um, which of these identities responds best and how to better target people to join energy communities in this way. Um, results, unfortunately, not in, so I can't really report what we get yet, but it'll be um, online the moment we get some data. We're still waiting on the feedback there. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. And um, oh, that's not very visible. I'm not sure if this is um, very visible, but what you should see is like a target um, in the middle. I'm not sure why it's not showing. Um, this, is a, um, this is an intervention we did with some workshops um, where you can see people get access to a variety of icons um, that they can then place on the target. There's like a round target with a bullseye in the middle. And if they place the icons closer to the center, they communicate to us that um, this aspect is the most important to them. And some of the icons can be grouped closer together than others. And then that communicates to us that people understand these concepts together. So you can, for example, tell us um, as the, the point of this is to create your own energy transition, your own energy community. So you can tell us who you want to do this with. So for example, your neighbors or clubs, organizations or your religious community and how you would participate as an investor an initiator or producer, uh, why you want to participate for social community to fight climate change and how would be your preferred manner to participate. So for example, biomass or solar on your roof or wind energy. And then in some of in one of the workshops that we've done with um, with people in, that we are trying to create an energy community with, uh, this was quite successful because it was very clear across the people that answered um, that they were mostly going to be involved with their immediate neighbors and that they preferred um, uh, building renovations and wind energy in their communities to be the main targets, and they were mostly in for the social community aspect and the climate change fight. So that told us a little bit better how to approach uh, building this energy community with them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so these are just a few insights that we've gathered from the general literature and also from a few studies that we've done in the past with other projects, um, five ways to incentivize through the collective. Um, so these are the things that we consider the most important. One is to co-create a narrative um, with the collective energy goals. So give people a story to work with. Uh, capitalize on existing identities. Um, so we've done, we can see in the postcards already, we've tried to do that a little bit. Um, you can use, for example, um, communities that already exist with churches or with clubs or, or game clubs, and you can approach those and see if they can spread um, the message uh, within their groups and beyond their groups um, and foster a sense of collective efficacy. So make people feel that they can actually change something and that they can achieve um, their goals and try and support their goals in that manner. 
And for this, you need to foster both group trust and trust in the project organizers. It's always important to have local stakeholders um, that are on board with you, that can communicate with their communities um, and that are able to uh, be kind of a bridge between the local citizens and the projects that are trying to support. And I think one of the most important things that sometimes gets forgotten a little bit is that collective emotions are uh, big drivers of actions. Um, and these can be both positive and negative emotions. I think pride was mentioned before as one possibility and kind of like a sense of honor. But I think anger can also be very important to fuel um, a feeling that maybe something is unjust and that we need to change something about, um, about the way that things are right now. I think it's probably a big driver be behind the Friday for Future movement, for example. I think a lot of people are very angry and I think that's really good to use that for positive effects. Uh, next slide, please. And um, some of the difficulties I just wanted to point out that we've uh, been facing and that need to really be worked on and, and um, in the context of employing uh, behavioral um, interventions in general is that uh, the first one is that evaluation of social impact in general, but collective behavior in specifically um, is not very well developed. Like there's not very, very good guidelines that exist how to evaluate social impacts very well. There's not good metrics that have been developed. So we're working on this right now um, to give out some policy recommendations, how to better evaluate this kind of um, uh, the, the changes that are that, are, that come from these interventions. Uh, one is to always keep an eye out for rebound effects, which are kind of effects um, where people try to, uh, or where people are encouraged to do something good. And then uh, they rebound into bad behavior because they think they've now done something and now they can allow themselves to, to kind of um, let go on another end, right? So this is seen on a, on a larger scale for example, with energy usage, if you save a little bit of energy at home, then maybe you can drive more with your car, right? Because now um, you've, you've done something for the environment. And the third thing I wanted to point out is, uh, which has already been mentioned before as well, the intention behavior gap in the sense that sometimes when one employs surveys or just asks people to verbalize, um, it, one needs to be careful that that might not be the actual behaviors that or people might not show the behaviors that they've described. Um, to actually measure behaviors is, is the, the gold standard in reality. Um, and also focus on the fact that measuring the behaviors that one is actually interested in. As, a, as an example, um, there was a paper that measured organ donation signups, and they found that some of the nudges that they employed really worked very well for uh, organ donation signups. But then another study looked at actual organ donations and found that it didn't actually work. So making sure that you target the behaviors that you really want um, is also key. Thank you very much. Very clear, and thanks for sharing that feedback, Selina. Indeed, a couple of hurd hurdles still to take, but I acknowledge your insights on creating a narrative on collective goals, which kind of relates to what Antoine Le Boss was saying earlier on storytelling. Also fostering group trust and a sense of collective efficacy and managing collective emotion to keep the flame burning. I also heard what you said about intention behavior and we will go into much more detail uh, on measuring and monitoring behavior and behavioral change in session three this afternoon. That brings us to the last speaker of this session, uh, Simona Doka who holds a PhD in Technology Innovation for the Built Environment, is a postdoc affiliate at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. She is currently Chief Innovation Officer at Gridability and a seasoned Horizon 2020 project coordinator. In that capacity, she will present us the AAA Reno project on attractive, acceptable and affordable deep renovation by a consumers oriented and performance evidence-based approach. Well, thank you very much for uh, the introduction uh, today. Indeed, um, I will be presenting some of the uh, experiences from this uh, Horizon 2020 project that just uh, uh, concluded. Uh, but at the same time, I really wanted to uh, also allow us to have this jump of dimension from the individual scale to the community scale, introducing a new project as well that, um, that I'm coordinating, which is uh, an Horizon 2020 project 
um, called energy to peers, focusing uh, on the other side on peer to peer energy trading and community farming uh, from the other hand. So if we go to next slide. Um, so here, uh, sorry, maybe this is not really visible, but we'll try to uh, make it understandable uh, anyway. So in a, a Triple Urbino uh, started um, three years ago, a little bit more. Um, and um, with this project, uh, we kind of uh, started with um, a couple of assumptions that we wanted to, to make for building up our case for the project. The first one is indeed that um, people use buildings and people uh, use energy and building don't. So starting from this strong assumptions, we really wanted to, um, to make change also in the way uh, renovation practices were developed. And we would try and understand how um, renovation practices could be understood from people. And there with people, we, uh, we didn't just focus on the final end users of our home renovations, but really we were thinking about the whole stakeholder network built up around a renovation process. And we know probably all of us had experience of a renovation process, how difficult and painful can be this renovation process uh, for many reasons. Uh, first of all, for instance, the fact that the information about the different options are very scattered. Uh, there are a lot of stakeholders involved in the process, so the final end users really have to deal with um, knowledge coming from different sites. So this practice was, um, it is still very fragmented uh, with a strong asymmetry in information. Um, so our focus was trying to make this process in, in three uh, very you know, catchy words, more attractive, more affordable, and more acceptable for the final end users. And I just wanted to give a little bit of um, importance to these three, three key words and also maybe providing some key um, outcomes from, from this um, assumptions that then became our core vision. Um, in terms of attractiveness, what we found is indeed that what motivates both individuals and groups of consumers um, to embark a renovation journey, it's not necessarily the uh, economic benefits in terms of uh, home renovations. The home uh, is a sphere of um, embracing a lot of intrinsical and personal norms. And for that reason, a home renovation was really perceived as um, something very you know, familiar. And therefore, a concept such as thermal comfort and their quality for the most vulnerable people in the house were, were perceived as the main drivers. So also that uh, kind of helped us to realize that we, we had to start and maybe rethink of our approach in making this more uh, attractive. The second point was, uh, of course, affordability. And there um, we realized that the limited resources that people might have uh, really um, kind of needed us to push towards um, policy supports and, of course, framing schemes that could help people uh, and also co-creating together with them solutions to make it more, um, to make it more affordable. Like uh, my, my colleague before was mentioning, this intervention might be very different even being in the same country uh, and different a lot from region to region. And the third point was indeed um, the, um, to make it acceptable. And there, to make it acceptable, we use different approaches. One of this was indeed to use uh, and gamified features, which we know very well. These are we're not talking about games, but we are talking about way to make it more attractive uh, for the end user, um, and you know, trying to vibrate some chords that really um, are making the difference for for the specific people we were talking about. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is what we meant for um, gamification. So in Triple Arena, we developed a, 
um, online platform, of course, including some gamified features helping users to, for instance, design in a very simply way their, uh, you know, their renovation process. But like uh, the professor before mentioned, education, um, it's not just for kids. Education is awareness at every age. So with the Triple Arena project, we also developed a board game. It's a game for, for grown-up people, uh, but it was a, a board game. It's called the Energy Transition Game. They really helped to frame um, the, the, the knowledge needed to understand what type of intervention was needed, uh, what type of options, and also including some sort of real life challenge. For instance, uh, uh, you have a tux that you have to buy, or mm, like in a monopoly, also the, the, the pro of having something that was not planned, like a tax incentive or um, some other options that you didn't consider before. And the, the board game is available, by the way. It has been translated, of course, in many different um, uh, languages uh, and it has been played by the occupants of our pilot sites, really in a way to create that um, background of acceptability and increase the attract attractiveness of the, uh, the renovation offer. Next slide. Um, in terms of also um, the different languages that needed to be used, we tried to work at different level. And in this, I really have to say that it was a key enabler for the Energy to Peers project to work with um, umbrella associations that could translate for us the needs of their members or the people that they were representing somehow. So um, in this multidisciplinary action, we worked, for instance, with the uh, Architect Council of Europe. We worked with the um, unity of um, the, the unity of property owners. We work with uh, social housing, so that we try to combine all the different languages and needs uh, that needed to be addressed. Because there is not fit for all one fit for all solution for sure. Next slide. On the same at the same level, but just briefly, when we jump into a community level, we realize that indeed um, there are different targets that we need to meet. And in this case, um, you know, trying to um, create awareness and um, educating people uh, about the possible options, it's not just because of um, there is a need to know about technical issues, uh, but there are so many different aspects that are colliding. Um, and, um, and in this, for instance, with the Energy to Peers project, we are trying to define a sort of um, readiness level indicator sort of right there with different um, uh, indicators indeed that can very quickly help um, final end users to understand how ready they are uh, or organizations at a larger scale how ready they are to engage into a peer-to-peer -peer community and i think this could go to every level uh, from uh, a very small community to a, a bigger organization um, so also here, try to make this um, as precise as possible with um, tailored information. Next slide. Um, like I mentioned before, policy uh, recommendations for us uh, became quite important at the end uh, because we realized that all this information needed to be also communicated at the higher level. We work a lot with a bottom-up approach uh, but uh, somehow uh, enforcement, and maybe this comes a little bit to the language we were using before, the carrots of the stick approach, a little bit of inform enforcement could be uh, useful also in terms of um, facilitating information share and some sort of behavioral change that we know that worked for some, uh, some group of people. Um, next slide. Like I said, communication sharing was a key uh, for both these projects. Uh, also for the Energy to Peers project, we decided to create this uh, energy community hub in which best practices are shared and people could really work in this peer-to-peer -peer network, but also understanding what work for a community which is close to me. So this 
proximity level information, we, we found this very useful and we are really trying to engage as much, um, as, much as possible communities. Um, we know that a lot of efforts like this are made up there. So um, we're in the making of this work, um, try to make it as comprehensive as possible. And um, yeah, I, mean, I think this is all for my side. Um, I think if you can go to the next slide, there are my contacts. So uh, yeah, thank you a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Simona. And I think some of the uh, topics that you mentioned will also neatly tie into our sessions of tomorrow when we're going to look at urban transformation as well. We have 15, one, five minutes, a quarter of an hour left in our session, and I would like to put that to good use to entertain in a discussion with my panel here in Brussels, but also with those of you who are tuned in. So if there are any questions that have been conveyed through Slido, I shall be happy to see them. Uh, in the meantime, please feel free to keep conveying your questions through slido.com, hashtag the new European Bauhaus. And Whilst those questions are coming in, I'd like to go back, uh, if she's still with us, to Selina, Selina Ka uh, Kaspersky, to throw one of the, um, the titles or the slides from Simona back at Selina. Uh, basically, it relates to the difference, say, between market incentives and sociocultural incentives. Selina, what you told us about the Decide project, have you seen differences from groups with different social cultural backgrounds? Um, so I think there's two there's two different concepts in the in the questions that you just mentioned. One is the difference between social cultural incentives and marketing yeah. incentives and one is whether there's differences for different cultural for for people from different cultural backgrounds. So maybe I'll tackle the first question first. Yeah. So um, we've done one survey uh, in the side where we so far don't find that there was a big difference between the two. Uh, the data is not quite completely um, analyzed yet, but we find that um, people seem to feel that for small uh, material incentives, so small financial incentives, for example, they work um, similarly well as, um, for example, feedback on CO2 emissions. Um, the same uh, we found in, sim in similar studies when we were doing a project on um, uh, energy savings uh, in EV use, where we also gave people small financial incentives and CO2 emission feedback, for example. And we again found that there was not really a difference in how those made people uh, react. Um, there was, we had a hypothesis about this, which is that probably, especially for very small financial incentives of just a few euros, they, they work more as a, um, as a communication device to people that this is something that's really important in, in the sense of uh, communicational logic, where you tell somebody you, you save a, a two euros when you do this, and that means that your behavior actually has an impact. Or you tell them you save uh, uh, 500 grams of CO2 when you do this, and that also has an environmental impact, right? So people don't really see a big difference um, between the two incentives, uh, as far as our studies have shown so far. I think that this uh, would probably be different for people from different cultural backgrounds, especially when you consider people that live in poverty might um, be more sensitive to financial um, feedback, financial information in general, um, that it might communicate, that that, uh, sig that signal might communicate a little bit better for people that are more sensitive to this information. That said, um, I would like to maybe um, on the back of the discussion from the last group, um, talk a little bit about that I think that probably financial incentives um, have more of a compliance effect. If you if you uh, think about a seminal paper by Kalman, for example, uh, that was published very early in social psychology that said that uh, sometimes people change their behavior because they're just being compliant, because they just think that they need to show uh, other people that they are following certain rules. Uh, whereas uh, other times you manage to actually get people to internalize um, certain values. And I think that probably financial incentives work more in the fast um, whereas more collective, more cultural incentives and more social norms um, tend to work a little bit better to make people actually internalize um, certain behaviors and certain, certain belief sets. 
Okay, thanks a lot for that, uh, Selena. We do have uh, a number of questions coming in through Slido. Um, allow me to take the first one for Professor Kluckner, which is a, a housekeeping question, so to speak. But it seems that I was not the only one to be very impressed by your gameplay in Kenya and Tanzania. And some of the people in our audience are wondering, Professor Kluckner, whether they can access more information on this topic, whether and where they could find that information. Yes, <clears throat> the uh, game actually has a website and it was on one of the slides, but I can uh, post the link in the chat again. Great, great. That's perfect, Professor. Thanks a lot for that. And then I move on to the next uh, question, which is a, a little bit a thorny one, but a justified one non nonetheless. Um, uh, quite a lot of support for that question as well. Isn't the approach of changing one's behavior actually shifting the attention to the real responsibilities. So aren't we talking about the gender of angels here? Shouldn't we be focusing on, well, what is the burning question? The big energy, coal and oil companies. A bit of a difficult question. I look at my panel here in Brussels to see whether anyone will want to take up this question. We are talking, Professor Skoulos, about changing behavior. Shouldn't we be talking about the big energy, coal and oil companies? Pink. I think we have to do both because uh, for sure uh, there is uh, for the companies, companies have shareholders mm -hmm. and uh, at the end of the day uh, we have more and more ethical funds and other ways to connect. I believe that uh, you have to work with all available tools. What I mentioned before uh, on education, I insist that it is for individuals mm -hmm. and we should not forget all the important tools we have in the market. Mm -hmm. Also at the same time, it is very important to make the link between individual choices and collective choices of the society. There, the consumers and the, the organizations of the consumers, in the same way as the organizations or the civil society organizations, are very important. And one of the incentives that was all, all also in the questions is actually to recognize a role for the society uh, through for example, the Orthus Convention. You have access to information, participation, and justice. There, you may influence the culture of companies. And this is the link, again, and the incentives of individuals and society groups to see their importance dealing with the big companies. That's a very rich insight. Thanks a lot mm -hmm. for uh, sharing that, Professor. I understand, Luisa, that you would like to intervene on this topic as well. So if we can really... I, I would like... Yes, thank you, Rafi. Uh, I think it's, uh, there is an issue of uh, really uh, pulling and pushing ahead uh, towards the, the right um, direction uh, uh, consumers. And to make it easy, um, we organize collective purchase uh, of renewable energy. So this is, let's say, something new that also uh, could be replicated in another Horizon 2020 project, which is Kirix. It was also mentioned by uh, Commissioner von der Leyen uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, meaning that uh, we can reward uh, uh, thanks to this collective purchase of, of uh, new energy service, renewable energy services, the company, the less polluting one. So the, the real uh, installers of um, appliances that uh, could be solar panel or, or pellet stoves or things like that, that could really help consumers to be, um, let's say, on the right side. And, and I think we, we have a, a new role to play there that, of course, uh, is based on, on the new cultural mindset. So we need to also team up with cities, 
with the smart cities to, to reach out uh, not only our members, but citizens, uh, just providing them the information of where they can collect information of the good ozone installers who can support them to manage uh, the fulfillment of the compliance with the law and then get the benefit for their for them as individuals and for the society as a whole. Um, so I think uh, it's really uh, try to uh, work uh, less in silos and rewarding uh, the good companies uh, and also the good consumers that are actually ready to go in the right direction, but need to be supported and helped also by consumer organization and their platform. Thanks a lot for uh, bringing that to uh, our attention, um, Luisa. We are talking a lot about consumers. There's a question that relates to that that I can perhaps uh, shift to, to Simona if she likes. There's a question on our slider wall saying, should individuals be targeted just as consumers or as, say, the, the animal th that they are, so as uh, people with many social roles uh, in order to change their material. So should we narrowly target them as consumers or acknowledge that they play different social roles and which um, approach, according to you, uh, Simona, would be more effective? A very nice question. Um, in our consortium, we have, uh, well, we had, unfortunately, but uh, the still good friends, a, good of a group of anthropologists and uh, one of the discussion we had one day was, do you wake up in the morning and you look at yourself in the mirror and you say to yourself, I want to be a good consumer this morning? Or you say to yourself, I want to be a good person. So I think instead of targeting consumers, we should really strive to build up a new generation of people that behave in a certain way that shared an amount of beliefs and credo. So, um, of course, at the end of the day, so we're all consumers, but I don't think we have to target people because of the way they consume. We should really try and strive for creating a, a generation of people that are, you know, somehow um, aware of the impact of our choices, no matter what. I think you paint us a very nice picture there indeed in, in looking in the mirror and seeing or wanting to be a good person. So thanks for bringing that perspective. I understand, Luisa, you wanted to uh, add something to that discussion? Of course, we do have uh, a lot of dimension as tax taxpayers also contributing famous incentives to, to provide the advantages for those who uh, are ready to install uh, uh, and use uh, renewable energies. Uh, but let's say that uh, um, really, I think the future is uh, um, choosing choosing um, the best possible sustainable solution uh, and, and bear all the responsibility to reach uh, the carbonizing goal. So I think that COP26 uh, that just uh, Finish in Glasgow uh, show, shows clearly that we do bear all a, a, a huge responsibility. Uh, as you said, probably people uh, are not aware till, till uh, the very last point, uh, and we do not need to put all the burden on, let's say, the citizen consumer shoulder. It's a collective responsibility, but for sure, I bear as a legal representative of Alto Consumo, as, as a consumer group, the responsibility to ask you to uh, have an easy access to this uh, sustainable choice. So this is, I think, is uh, the responsibility that we, we need to, to bear all together and to monitor the progress. Uh, because uh, the, what I would ask to the companies and to, in this, uh, to the institution is the accountability of the process. So yeah. in order to really encourage the change and, and show the impact, because what I forgot to mention is that uh, we uh, won as clear to project the uh, award uh, for one of the best, uh, the best project who engage uh, and maximize the impact in terms of engagement of uh, people in actually taking up the renewable energy. So yeah. in a way, 
we, we prove that is possible. It's, it's a matter of responsibility and accountability. I have one minute left. I see that Professor Kluckner raised his virtual hand. So if you could indeed confine yourself to se 60 seconds, uh, Christian, please. Yes, I would also like to outline that, of course, people are not only consumers. The consumer part is important, but I, w I always say that it's even more important what you do otherwise. So uh, voting behavior, activism, building local cultures, doing something together with other people that are the, the things that, that count even more, but consumption is not to be underestimated because that's where we spend money. Yeah, crystal clear, Professor Gluckner. Thanks a lot for that. That wraps up our session with a, a warm round of both virtual and physical applause for our panel. And I have been hearing a lot of, I think, good news on incentivizing behavioral change. I heard about peer-to-peer -peer engagement, bringing hope, inspiring a positive spirit. I also heard sticks and carrots. I heard discipline and awards, pets and children. So I have a very big word cloud in my head. <laughs> and in order to identify the greater common denominators, I generously Bring it back to you, Jackie. <laughs> thank you very much indeed, Philippe, and thank you to our excellent panel uh, for a fascinating discussion. We heard there some great examples of experiences of innovative approaches to incentivizing behavior change and a fascinating debate about what works, what doesn't. Uh, and really underlined by our last speaker and every panelist throughout for me, the importance of education. It's all about, as you said, building that new culture, building that new ethos. And that, after all, is what new European Bauhaus is all about. Uh, so thank you very much to all of you. Uh, we're going to come back after the lunch break uh, to talk about Measuring, monitoring and measurement, uh, impact. It's all about impact because you can't assess what incentives are working or not if you're not measuring their impact. So an absolutely crucial conversation, which Philippe indicated at the start of today, he felt is perhaps neglected sometimes in this discussion. So looking forward to that very much. We're going to take a 60-minute lunch break. Don't forget, tune in to Bauhaus Radio for more interviews, more chats with our change makers, with our policy makers here and remotely. That's with your host, Stephen Jones. Matchmaking still available, one-on-one -on -one meetings online or here if you are with us. And I look forward to seeing you back here at 2.30 sharp for the start of our next session on monitoring and measuring. Thank you again to our panel. Thank you to all of you. Bon appétit. Okay, good afternoon and welcome back to Bauhaus Radio. It's our third session of the day today. It's lunchtime and our participants here at the conference centre uh, are having lunch at the event lounge in this very bauhaus -y building. Meanwhile, I've got an hour to fill with some fascinating conversation coming up. We've just had a session about uh, behavioural change, incentivizing behavioural change in the way that the life programme uh, interacts with that concept. And there's no better guest, I think, than I could have than... Uh, Eleonora de Sabata, uh, who's going to tell us all about a very special project in Italy, focused on Italy and the way in which uh, elements of shaping uh, opinion, shaping behaviour, uh, and bringing diverse stakeholders together has really set the standard, I think, um, we can say, uh, on your project, uh, Eleonora. First of all, welcome. It's good to have you on the show. Thank you very much. So first, um, your project... Uh, I think you're the best person to introduce it. It's called Clean Sea Life, but you know, beyond that, summarize it for us, uh, what, what it sought to achieve. Oh, it's a wonderful project, sorry to, to say it myself, but it was a wonderful... <laughs> you're entitled to do that. <laughs> we wanted to change um, the behavior and change the attitudes um, of Italian people towards um, littering the sea. And um, we realized that it was a lot of the litter that we found in the seas was due to normal behavior and everyday behavior from the normal consumers. <laughs> We're talking a lot about consumers right now. Um, normal people. And so we tried to raise awareness, first and foremost, of the problem. 
which was very far away from everyone's mind, especially in Italy in 2016 when we started the project. Um, and we tried to do that by involving ev everyone, all the people that lived on the sea and had fun in and under and over the sea, because they were the first people who would understand what the problem was about and the first people who cared about it, and then involved citizens um, as well, because we showed that marine litter comes actually from inland, so if you are careful less with your behavior in Milan or in Rome, which are sort of far away from the sea, but they have rivers connecting to it. If you go and have drinks in the evenings and forget your plastic um, cup um, on, on the river's edge, it will end up in the sea. And it made a lot of sense and it made a lot of connection in people's minds because uh, for the people normally, if I mean, the few people that had um, heard about the problem were always um, thinking about the Pacific garbage patch and the so-called floating I islands of plastic. Things you can there. see. Things you can see and things that were far away. Yeah. Things you can be worried about, uh, you know, and, and show rage about it and do absolutely nothing in your everyday life. So we tried to change that kind of attitude and brought home um, the the message that uh, marine litter is here right here in the Mediterranean the Mediterranean is a lake more or less yeah. so anything that has ever fallen into the sea is still there in in one form or another it doesn't circulate particularly no it's, it's 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 like a closed exactly it doesn't no, nothing go, goes out um, so so yes that was a big part of it making people see what was invisible because the sea is blue and nothing is, um, you know, you, you look at it and you see it's wonderful, but if you look but beneath, beneath, yes. Yeah, and, and you know, when, you, when you're thinking about stakeholders, your project, I mean, th th to me, the sea is the ultimate democratic space because we all have a stake in the sea and whatever we want to do, whether we want to swim or earn our living as fisher, um, fishers or, uh, you know, to take part in marine sports. It, it's something that really we all have an interest in, in preserving. Is this the way that you approach building your coalition to get, get this uh, marine litter cleared up? Indeed, exactly like that, because we involve the people who were, you know, hands-on, um, you know, could make a difference. Um, that is the commercial fishermen who are the ones who can retrieve a lot of um, marine litter, but they couldn't because it was a barrier. Uh, and so we tried to, uh, to remove that barrier and try to um, make it possible from the local um, dimension to the national dimension and even beyond because we realized that not only was complicated, you know, the local uh, management, um, local authorities, authorities had seldom tackled these kind of things because, uh, you know, it's not written in their um, bill of duties to, yeah. to deal with marine litter. So they just didn't. Um, but then, you know, the, they had a misconception of all the difficulties, insurmountable difficulties in dealing with that. And we just showed by doing it um, that it was not that big of a deal. But of course, they, they needed a, a, a policy framework to also do that, to make it, you know, long lasting. So we tried to tackle that as well. And it's all nicely coming to an end right now, hopefully, with fingers crossed, because apparently um, the law, the, there's a draft law that was um, started while we were... Um, this is working. Salva Mare, right? That is Salva yeah. Mare, Save the Sea Save Bill. The sea. Yeah. And it's a bill that actually allows uh, uh, fishermen to bring ashore the waste. And if I, you know, I'm telling like this and people will think, you know, how stupid that idea it is, but if you really think about it, it's a complicated issue because we know that, you know, the normal people cannot um, deal and manage and transport waste because that would be, you know, <laughs> a complicated. You know, a yeah, I mean, it's one thing. thing to ask them to clear clear it up. It's another thing to go beyond that and, and either dispose of it or reuse it, right? Well, you know. The, the, Bringing them ashore, it's not a big deal for them. But in theory, they are um, 
unauthorized people. They are not authorized to deal with waste. Under the law, um, under, the, under the current... Under the current yeah. European law. So they, there's a kind of a, you know, a hole a in the a system. Yeah. And then, as there's no law dealing with the kind of waste, then the local municipality is not... Um, it's not part of their job to do the, deal with this kind of waste. And they had no idea what kind of waste was coming out of the water. And what, how, how do you, what do you do with that? Mm. Is it plastic? How much is plastic? How much is metal? Is the plastic good enough to be recycled or not? So there's a lot, it's a, it, it's a whole kind of worm. Yeah. Um, it looks like a simple concept, but in reality, hands down, it's not. But anyway, um, apparently it's all getting to an end and hopefully... Um, with, with the Italian Parliament, right? This the, is a national level law. Yes, so, yeah. uh, hopefully the Italian Parliament is about to um, pass it into a law. And do you, I mean, would it be your dream to have that replicated in other member states as a model, a model legislation? Well, of course. That's why we had, during the, the Clean Sea Life project, we organised a meeting at the European Parliament just to show what we were doing. And of course it's different everywhere. I mean, some similar schemes are already underway in the Northern Sea, but that's a completely different... Very different thing. marine environment, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You have very few ports with very large boats, and it's completely the opposite in the Mediterranean Sea with lots of little um, harbours yeah. and lots of little boats with different kinds of nets, yeah. different kinds of fishing. And yes, of course, we would like to have it replicated around the Mediterranean. Um, it... It is already uh, being done in a lot of, in several places still as a pilot thing, and um, it is it matters more to Ita to to Italy because we have the largest trawling feet, fleet. Um, whereas we, at the meeting at the European Parliament, we had we uh, invited people from other projects, uh, one in France, and they have very few trawlers and who collect very small quantities of the marine, marine litter because they have a completely, again, different kind of uh, shelves, uh, different kind of environment in which they, they fish on. That's not to say they don't have marine litter, but it's probably deeper. With so a deeper sea, isn't it? Yes, exactly. exactly. Whereas we have the Adriatic, which is very shallow. We have a lot of trawlers. So we are the ones that can actually make the most out of this kind of... Um, um, legislation. Having said that, I think that a clear European um, legislation will make life a lot easier for all the other countries to put to set up similar schemes. Well, legislation is um, it's a great achievement uh, for the project, uh, clearly, and I'm sure you're all very proud of that. But when we talk about incentives, you know, legislation tends to be you mustn't do this, or if you do this, then you're going to be punished in this way. That can be how legislation can tend to be viewed. How can we concentrate on incentivizing these various stakeholders, you know, whether you're talking about people who use the sea for sports or for fishing or, for, or just who, who live, you know, along the coast? How can you present this? Because we were discussing this in the session about carrots, sticks, you know, incentives, punishments. Um, you know, wh where does clean sea life fit into this? Um, excellent question, of course. I think think that the, one of the most effective tools that we had, um, that we used, was showcasing and bringing a sense of um, pride in what the people were doing. And uh, our friends on the radio cannot see that, but I will show you. Uh, these are some of the photographs of the fishermen who were doing the fishing for litter. We did um, an exhibition. Uh, we put up some panels in their own um, harbour, so you know they had um, uh, sort of uh, that the, the community that they lived in um, could go and see and and you know see what they were doing out in the sea where nobody sees them. And you know yeah. fishermen are seldom being celebrated for what they do because we tend to say, well, you fish too much, you <laughs> catch too much fish, and you're doing this wrong and, and whatever, and. In this particular harbour in San Benedetto del Tronto, we had a very big test pilot. This is also where the um, lady from the parliament came and, and asked all the stakeholders how we were doing things. 
And um, they still keep on doing this because they, they were showcased, sh showcased in every television and news organization in the world. That is not an exaggeration because we had CBS and um, all the rest. A lot of media came, attention. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, and, and they were very happy. And that, I think, that gave them the incentive to go on. Even if the pilot project was officially um, closed, they kept on delivering all the waste because it also made sense for their own um, work. They were not just doing it because of... Yeah, I mean, when the project ends, there's no, you can't really say, well, we'll go back to littering the sea or not, not picking up the waste. I mean, the, the whole point is for an afterlife, right? It, exactly, yeah. but yeah. They, they really came on board, <laughs> literally, with that <laughs> because they understood they were doing a good thing because they were celebrated everywhere. We went to the Pope to meet them. Everyone I mean, went there we with 40 fishermen, and it was fantastic. Um, but also they realized that a cleaner sea was a better sea for their own... Um, their well-being. For their yeah. well-being, yeah. but their own livelihood. Their livelihood yeah. they, they spent less time cleaning it, you know, separating from, mm. from the catch, which they did it anyway, but yeah. before they would just throw the plastic back overboard. Yeah. And a cleaner sea brings, you know, better quality to to, the, to their catch. So they see the direct link. Link. To yeah. To um, I'm interested in, in in the waste because I remember writing about a life project uh, based in the Netherlands that takes plastic nets that are caught underwater, makes socks yeah. out of them. I mean, it's just mind blowing. Is there a circular economy element to clean sea life and and projects like it? I am afraid to say no, because our test, uh, it's, it's a very, again, it comes down to the, very, to the differences between, um, between the, the two areas, the Northern Atlantic yeah. and the Mediterranean Sea. The, in um, Holland, what they do is they collect the spent nets, the old nets, not much the marine litter, but the old nets um, that are, you know, being discarded. Yeah. And they make them so they make them into socks, but they're different kind of nets made with a different kind of material, with nylon, whereas the nets in the Mediterranean Sea are more sort of flimsy because we catch different things, yeah. and you cannot. It's a different kind of material, and you cannot do socks with them. Mm -hmm. So what we did again with the fishing for litter, um, we tried to not only find the solutions on a management level, but also to see what can you do with the kind of litter that comes out. And we had the um, waste management company do a test uh, project with six tons of litter, which is quite a lot. And they realized that the amount of plastic that, com that comes out of the water is large enough to do something about it. Uh, sorry, caveat, not plastic per se, but um, packaging material, which is the only thing that we can recycle in Italy. Mm -hmm. It's, it's still interesting enough, but of course the quality is not very good and you cannot wash it and, and sort of pretend to do some recycle thing because it doesn't just, the yeah. quality is not there. So I'm afraid the somber lesson is what comes out of the sea can either be burnt and make energy out of it, uh -huh. or it has to go to landfills. That's a very sombering thought, but the reality is that. But but also the reality is that, that by remaining in the sea, it's it's actually, as you say, making those livelihoods less sustainable in the long run because um, it, it's it's ruining the marine environment uh, for those communities that that, that depend on it. Um, I'm I'm also curious as to, you know, whether there was an educational aspect among school children, for example, on this project, whether you were able to make outreach in that respect. Absolutely. We had a lot of fun into that. We um, met over 5,000 kids, either in schools or on the beach. We organized beach cleanups with them. They had a lot of fun. They, had, they were surprised. And I mean, you can go on, on our YouTube um, channel and, and see lots of them and hear the comments of the kids and say, oh, whoa, I found some electric wires and some cigarette butts. What are they doing here? And of course, we, they were surprised and shocked, but we also um, sh uh, shifted their attention on what, the, th what they were f um, the things they were finding on the, sea, on the beach. They were due to them, 
So we try to, with every kind of um, target group, we try to bring home the message of the things that they themselves were, uh, the, 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 the habits that they themselves were, uh, sort of the, the bad habits that were having. They were adding to the problem. Exactly. Yeah. All yeah. the uh, toys that they were left behind by you know, kids that were sort of forgetful and the yeah. parents that were not digging in the sand yes. and looking for the things. I mean, uh, kids' toys, they look nice and you know, very colorful and, yeah. and pretty, but at the end of the day, of course, it's plastic. And if they're left behind, the destiny is to be broken up in lots of pieces. And Microplastics, again, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so the kids, in effect, are, are educating their parents about some of these issues potentially. Yes, but they, they themselves were doing great things. For instance, when we showed them the effect of uh, balloons, the balloons were having on the wildlife, I'm, for the sake of the people on the radio, I'm showing pictures of um, a poor sea turtle that got entangled itself oh, no. in, um, in a balloon. And once we showed that, um, and they made the connection with you know, the parties that they were having and the big release of balloons at yeah. the end of the school year, they, they themselves said, we don't want to, um, please, let's stop, um, you know, launching the balloons at the, at the end of the, of the year. So we had a lot of schools that took this pledge and um, six um, uh, civil, I mean, local authorities did it as well, yeah. prohibited this kind of um, thing. You mentioned YouTube. Um, again, from the perspective of, of changing um, and, and incentivizing behavioral change, I think you'd, you'd be the first to agree that, that communication is an absolutely essential component of any life project, but particularly one where you're seeking to bring about changes in behavior. What sort of innovations did you bring in? To, what, what, what kind of communication method did you mm. use? Well, you know, preaching to the converted, I am a journalist myself, so I, um, yes, believe very much into communication. We did um, a lot of things. We um, produced reports uh, based on emerging issues. We were providing news organizations with uh, visual things, which was very important because marine litter was becoming an issue. But of course, we didn't, they didn't have the televisions and, and the newspapers. They didn't have any visuals to go with it. So we provided them. And we provide, we, we sort of train the journalists as well, providing a larger context, um, educating them about the real problem, um, avoiding the perpetuation of the false uh, images of the islands of trash, um, which you know, are very well known. It's a, it's a great simplification in a way of, um, of, of the problem, but, but it, they're not true. They're not as we are led to believe they are, and all the images that we uh, have in mind are uh, just temporary rafts of plastics that come out from usually from uh, rivers or when mm -hmm. there's a flood, but then of course they disperse. So we train journalists as well and um, we provided them access to the people. So um, especially for the Fishing for Litter initiative, we um, invited them over and they made, we, we provided them the contact and made them talk to. Um, to the fishermen themselves, yeah. and they really appreciated it. So, um, providing access, a, a lesson for, uh, I mean, a suggestion for other projects, it would be that. Yeah. Just provide uh, the visuals, because nowadays uh, journalists, they, they can hardly go anywhere. Um, so, provide them with stories, good stories on emerging issues and contact with, um, mm. with the people. What, I mean, you must have pulled some pretty weird things out of the sea oh, yes. in this road. <laughs> tell, tell me more. What do people throw away? Oh, gosh, you can find anything. <laughs> the most scary thing that we found was the head of a mannequin that came rolled. must roll have been shocking. Oh, my goodness, <laughs> yes. I mean, not to me, but it rolled out um, out of a fishing net, Ooh. and luckily, you can see it here. Oh yes, <laughs> there it is, look. And, and There's somebody holding up a, and a gas mask. Is that a gas mask? Exactly, that still come from from the, from the fishermen. And I mean, you can imagine, you know, opening this, the, the net, and you have all the fish rolling out, and then the head of, of this mannequin. Oh, it was terrible. Utterly, utterly terrifying. Uh, can you, can you imagine a... dragging that up in your fishing net? <laughs> And oh. luckily, the fisherman was, you know, a youngster in the twenties, so he didn't have a heart attack. But had he been an older guy, um, then they found. Um, we pulled up um, scooters, um, 
washing machines, but then all the rest, I mean, caps and toys and balloons again. Uh, Smaller things that are, yeah, yes. more ubiquitous, yeah. Everything you find on the streets, yeah. on your walks, you will find it underwater. Um, I'm, I'm just curious as, as we um, come to an end, uh, Eleonora, about how you feel about life, because if there's one sort of unifying characteristic I find about life projects, it's the way that people feel about not only their own project, but what it allows them to enter into this kind of community of like-minded people who share ideas and perspectives. I mean, has that been beneficial for you personally? Oh my God, yes, absolutely. I'm very grateful to the life program because it really allowed us to do what we wanted to do and to learn from other projects as well and to become part of a community where you could feel that what you were doing and what you, the, the um, lessons that you were learning could be shared and, and picked up by other people. That, uh, that is something that I, I am really, really grateful. Uh, even today, being here means, means a lot because um, well, in Italy we don't have that kind of sharing, so uh, having, having this kind of a community. I, mean, I find that the community principle is what uh, made the Clean Sea Life Project um, work very well and be very effective, and there's a larger community of life projects yeah. that really yeah. um, propels any in each of, of us forward. Well, thank you for coming on Bauhaus Radio. Um, it's a great project. And it's one that I think uh, its legacy will stand the test of time, um, to be honest. And uh, long may it be replicated and, and, and given to others. And good luck with the Salva Mare um, legislation. Please do let us know when it's uh, finally passed by we the will parliament. will do. Keep Thank your you. fingers crossed. Well, I will do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming on Bauhaus Radio. Now, our next guest uh, is Jo Sullivan. So I'm going to ask her to, uh, to take uh, her seat. And um, Jo uh, is uh, a consultant um, based here in Brussels who focuses very much on the uh, environmental field um, with her company, uh, Conscience Consulting. And um, you know, given the name of your, your consulting outfit, Jo, it's kind of interesting uh, when you talk about conscience and behavioral change. Um, you know, is, is, what is our approach to behavioral change when we talk about um, environmental and climate issues. Is it the carrot? Is it the stick? Is it making people feel bad? Is it making feel good? Well, first, uh, good afternoon, and thanks for having me um, here today. I think um, if we've just seen, any of us have witnessed the COP26 last week, um, it's clearly a question of carrot and stick, in a way. Um, we've seen, actually, the biggest driver for action on climate change, which is, of course, including um, the renovation of buildings, of new designing cities, and and how this, uh, the new European Bauhaus, kind of the project all comes together and the reality that it would bring is the real potential, the real motivators are the young people, the people on the streets who are generally doing better than policymakers, we have to say, uh, generally uh, doing better than business, although business has stepped up. And so I'd say uh, people, cities, mayors are really ahead of the game uh, together with people. So. Are people, do we have to do something as, as, uh, as uh, agitators or activists to actually motivate people to get involved? Actually, the people are already out there. The young people are already out there. Um, now what we need to include um, is all members of society, um, including the disadvantaged, uh, who are often left out of these policy decisions. And of course, uh, redesigning a future uh, infrastructure uh, has big potential and big... Uh, Gain, potential gains for um, actually bringing more participatory democracy. So if we think about who needs to be included, um, we have to think about all kinds of people from all walks of life um, and elders, um, as well as young people, um, and the role of policymakers and the role of the European Commission and the role of all of us really to, um, um, to get people involved is essentially about information. It's about awareness raising, but it's also talking to people in the language that they understand to make the messages on the need for action and the need for change and the need for everybody to be part of the green transition. Really uh, a message about inclusivity and about potential um, in people's daily lives to take meaningful actions. But that can work both ways in a sense, because what you seem to be suggesting is that um, policymakers uh, need to catch up with what's already happening in society. So in other words, those groups, those activists, um, those citizens 
need to be speaking to policymakers in a language that policymakers understand. Um, you know, is, is, is there that disconnect? Uh, we, we talked about COP26, but it's makers risk being left behind and not, not setting the standards, but having to catch up. Well, I mean, you're totally right. And of course, we can't. I mean, policymakers is a very disparate group, sure. uh, very different. I mean, we look at, I mean, if just coming back to the COP, you look at the uh, perspective and the potential of the Green Deal for transforming Europe. It's very much far ahead compared to other regions of the world. I mean, there are countries around the world who are very much leading the way, like Costa Rica traditionally, other countries, Rwanda, um, in these areas. But generally, in terms of regions, Europe is leading the way. But then, of course, there are very many differences. I mean, we can say the Commission is very much a driver and a pioneer in this. Um, but in the member states, there are very different perspectives. Um, and there are very real concerns about some people having to change if they're working in traditional sectors. What does that mean for people? Can they afford to, to, to buy a new car? Can they even anyway afford to buy a car? Um, can they afford to change jobs? Do they have enough uh, um, potential? Is there enough? Um, is there, is there a, a climate of fear anyway around the fact that people are just many struggling to survive because the middle class has been squeezed over, the, over time? So it's quite hard for the uh, many people, the average person in many countries, to even feel they can be part of the transition. So to answer your question, you know, the, the quality of policymakers depends on the quality of the vote. Many people don't vote um, anymore uh, because they're disenchanted by policy. So there's a real job. I mean, I really think there's a real job to reconnect uh, quality of democracy with the quality of policymaking, and only then can we have a quality environment. Um, so um, I think the motivation really comes from young people because they are really feeling that, and actually it's touching their hearts and souls. So policymakers, in fact, in general, those ones who are a little bit lagging behind the curve um, for the next generations, maybe we need to think about processes which are less about short-termism and more about long-termism. So those policymakers have the, uh, the courage and the means to be able to make decisions which actually um, will support future generations. Yeah, I mean, you, you talked uh, interestingly about inclusiveness and, and um, you know, uh, making it relevant to all members of society. Thinking about the new European Bauhaus, th what we've heard from the Commission is very much focused on that inclusivity, about new ways of living in, in new cities, in new urban environments. Um, but at the same time, when people have priorities, like they need a roof over their head, they're not necessarily thinking about the beauty and aesthetics. You know, is there some gap to make up there in terms of, uh, you know, because we associate Bauhaus with, with great beauty and, and very clever people designing magnificent buildings. How do we make that more relevant to, to the way people are living today? Or are people living today in a way that is, is actually, again, taking the policymakers towards them? You know, I mean, I think it's a really good point because everybody has the right to beauty, everybody has the right to sustainable future, everybody has the, the right, surely, to be part of this beautiful future that's being mapped out. It shouldn't be something for the, um, for the elite, let's say. Yeah. Um, and so the, then the question is affordability and accessibility. Um, and so subsidies could be redirected to enable affordable housing. I was on a panel last week with a group organizing, um, you know, working on against fuel poverty so to enable, uh, to refit, uh, refurbish social housing in Glasgow um, so that those people could live in uh, beautiful um, from an ecological as well as an aesthetic uh, perspective and affordable housing for people who are disadvantaged. And so they were then, they would be able to, with these kind of mechanisms, this was funded by the Scottish government actually. So it depends on public money. I mean, the fact is, to be honest, there is enough public money. It's just a question of how it's spent. Um, and we know from last week that there's 400 billion spent a year by governments subsidizing fossil fuel um, sector around the world. So if we just take a teeny weeny part of that um, and uh, put that into disadvantaged areas of cities um, to refit buildings and to give PD people the, um, the ecology and the dignity uh, they anyway need to, um, to live... Um, in a way which then they can become actually active citizens. More active, Because precise, it goes, yeah, yeah it goes hand in hand. Yeah. If people have, are, are struggling to survive, they're struggling to um, pay the bills and they're living in poor accommodation, then 
you know, frankly, they don't have time to vote uh, effectively. They don't have time to engage in community groups. And, you know, we see, and I, from my own experience in Brussels, uh, the communi local communities are getting much more active in this area. They want um, uh, citizens to participate. And actually, we need for healthy democracy overall, uh, for a just transition, we need to enable, and, and local policymakers and mayors need to enable uh, local people of all types, um, of all walks of life, to engage, be fully, fully participating in the system as citizens. So I really think the climate uh, movement and the social justice movement go hand in hand. Tell me a bit about Conscience Consulting, um, some of the work that you're doing, and some of the challenges um, that you're addressing uh, in the environmental field. Um, well, we've been running for 15 years, and the name came up because, I mean, as you said right in the intro, um, what does it take in terms of mindset and real kind of heart, soul, uh, mind connection to make the right policy decisions? And then the question of how do you make that? So my philosophy is really to bring unusual people together to encourage European institutions or UN institutions who are some of my clients, as well as business leaders, which also some of my clients, as well as NGOs and NGO coalitions, for them to speak to each other. Because traditionally, policy has been made in silos. We also see that within institutions. It's very hard to connect democracy um, with climate, or with trade, with climate. So policy makers uh, and uh, businesses, actually, they often have worked in silos. And then we think about businesses, they often work in different departments. So there's not that real connection. That's not, re that's not really that the different ideas coming together as kind of one symbol, single, symbol, um, simple um, idea of a con kind of flow of consciousness. So what do we really want in terms of the big picture? So the work, my work is essentially around coalition building, um, building coalitions for good. Um, one, for example, is something I've worked on that I always pitch these ideas. So I'm not a classic consultant in that I have the ideas to, to make society, make the world a better place. And then I go out, find clients and people and organizations that want to do that with me and try and uh, jump, uh, join them together in work, which really kind of creates a step change in thinking. So together they can make a voice and amplify that voice and really affect um, some change. So one of the clients recently is... Um, or well, the organizations is a, a coalition for radical decarbonization of materials. So this is part of the Green Deal, which hasn't been explicitly um, referred to, but it's very relevant to the Bauhaus because it's all about materials, the materials we have in our homes, the materials we have we use for our buildings, and that includes kind of from cement to steel, but also to textiles, um, to packaging, um, to, to the products we eat, uh, almost. So the idea there is, and, and what we've brought together, is a really unique coalition in Brussels, the Br Brussels bubble policy making. So we have, um, um, we have uh, three companies that are leading that. Uh, one is a food company, Oatly. Another is a packaging company committed to nature-based materials, Tetra Pak. Uh, another is Stora Enzo, which provide many of the paper and pulp, which is part of the nature-based solutions, if we're thinking about the big picture, pulling out of fossil fuels and getting towards a nature-based, uh, no-pollution world. So um, those are the three main uh, companies involved. And then we have the Secretary General of the European Youth Forum, so the voice of all youth movements in Europe, um, together with the head of the Institute for European Environment Policy. So bringing science to the table, as well as the Executive Director of the European Environment Agency, um, as well as the head of Europe for the International Union for Conservation of Nature. So you imagine those people who don't normally, you know, the, the youth, youth activists together in the room, pushing the companies. So it's all about pushing everybody forward in the direction. Um, and the main goal is essentially to, to make sure that the Commission takes on that kind of big picture thinking in terms of the impact of materials, not just about circular economy, it's literally about pulling out as much as we can of fossil fuels as quick as possible yeah. so we keep within the 1.5. And of course, that's so relevant for cities. I mean, how do, will cities survive in the future if there are too many floods, too many... To I mean, we can talk about redesigning the future, but if we don't have a climate in which yeah. those buildings can survive, yeah. we're really kind of... Uh, we're not seeing the big picture. So you're bringing together disparate, sometimes disparate groups, certainly people with, with very different perspectives on, on the same issue. I, I guess then that new, new European Bauhaus as a concept is really one that you relate to because it is an interdisciplinary thing at, at heart, isn't it? I mean, it, it has the potential really to, 
to bring people together in a way that few initiatives can. No, you're absolutely right. And that's what I think is, a brilliant, um, is brilliant about the initiative because, you know, it's appealing to beauty as well. It's appealing to ecology, all these kind of mind things that we think about, that kind of logically we need to fix the, 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 the climate, logically we need to do better on energy, energy efficiency and better materials. But it's also appealing to people's, um, to people's souls, in a way, to people's hearts. And I love the way it's written, because it is written in a way which is meaningful to people. And we think about the way cities are structured right now. They're, basically, they're structured in a way which was basically designed for a lot of women with their children to stay at home, a lot of guys to drive into town with their big cars, you know, roll up to their offices with their fancy desks and then drive home. The cities have not been designed for children. Cities have not been designed for elderly. Citizens have not been designed for communities to get together. Children are, uh, hardly meet in the same street. Neighbours don't know one another. I mean, so cities have to be redesigned really from the bottom up, not just for the climate, not, but also for aesthetic and also for people. And so bringing those interdisciplinary aspects together for me is really stepping forward it's it's the commit it's the Euro, it's the work of the european commission and the european project it's the green deal coming to life for people so it's really starting from how do i want to live personally in a city so it wants to be beautiful wants to be clean and it wants to be a kind of place where people get together and can be productive so joe thank you very much for coming on bauhaus radio it's been fascinating to talk to you i wish we could have gone on but um but we have another fascinating guest waiting in the wings, Professor Skoulos, who's going to join us shortly. Joe, thank you very much, and, um, and we'll uh, hopefully see you later on in the, in the conference. All right, brilliant. Lovely to speak to you. Great, Bye. Thank you. You're listening to Bauhaus Radio. It's 11 minutes past two. We're going to start the afternoon session in about 20 minutes. But in the meantime, to keep me company is Michael Skoulos, who's come from Greece to be present at this wonderful venue, the Event Lounge in Brussels. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for arranging this. It's a pleasure. You were, you were speaking in the session which was just before lunch. Right. And this was about incentivizing behavioral change. Mm -hmm. And um, the moderator mentioned that your comments were, were provocative, uh, were uh, expressed with, with vigor, <laughs> uh, which is great for us because I want to elaborate on them a little bit. Um, we talked about carrots and sticks in the session. Um, and you had something to say about that. And in particular, you mentioned education, education, education. Um, and you mentioned the duty that the European Union has as a body um, to lead that, really. I mean, is, is that, have I got that right in terms Absolutely. of... Absolutely, yeah. yes. Well, um, my point is that, first of all, there is something that uh, it was not clarified fully um, during the session, when we are talking about education, we are talking about formal education, non-formal and informal. And uh, I'm talking about education, all of these three forms. Uh, non-formal is when NGOs or other non-professional uh, uh, educators get into the school and the school gets out of to the society, the school. And, uh, Informal is what you are doing, what uh, the press, what uh, everybody is doing uh, with a purpose, with a purpose. So, uh, and this purpose is actually to shape <coughs> not only knowledge, but also attitudes. So we start from uh, observations of data, we make it information, from information we make it knowledge, and from knowledge we want to have attitudes and behaviors. So this is the, the whole process. In this process, when we are talking about carrot and stick, stick and carrot, um, perhaps uh, we reduce uh, the education in a training, and actually a training of pets, of animals. A kind of binary, you do this it and is, you don't do this. Yes, because <clears throat> We should not mix um, carrot with a word and uh, stick to discipline. So there people are, should feel a sense of altruism the, about doing something. Exactly. I mean, there are two different things. Uh, and uh, uh, in my point of view, um, a word is very important to be at the level of uh, ideas, at the level of uh, responsibility, 
citizenship and other things that are absolutely necessary more than a candy or a sweet or uh, you know an ice cream or uh, some money and uh, this is for me very important uh, i'm not saying that we should not use stick and carrot in other cases when we are dealing with uh, companies when we are dealing with um, benefit with material benefit and then you have to do that so this is the the, the point that i made yeah and because sometimes we generalize uh, terms uh, we may uh, confuse somehow people on the other hand uh, I'm not saying that with education alone we can actually deliver for the Bauhaus or uh, for sustainable development. Mm -hmm. This is uh, one of the tools I mentioned that of governance. We need uh, uh, science and technology to enhance the current capacity of the systems. We need uh, institutions, regulation, uh, administration, the framework, and yeah. the frameworks, and we need also, uh, in order to shape and encourage changes of behavior, we need this global education, which goes, you know, uh, throughout our life, uh, lifelong, and uh, it is, it is, in, in Greek we have two words, the one is education, the other the other is pedia. Pedia goes beyond knowledge and actually tries to remedy actually something that education cannot do alone. You know, with education, with the cognitive part and that, uh, at the end of the day, we may know what is right, but we don't follow it. And today uh, we are, uh, you know, witness, we witness all this uh, difference, gap between uh, statements and actions. And if we go back to the philosophy of ancient Greece and Aristotle, he said, uh, well, already uh, Socrates, this is the quality uh, human quality that is called akrasia. We know what is correct, but we don't do it. And with pedia, we try to overcome that. We try actually to go beyond knowledge and strengthen the, to follow your, uh, you know, beliefs through your attitudes and behaviors. And this is exactly where we need to invest more and at European level um, with uh, all our background we have in Europe which is unique and we have to, to build on that. I think ba ba Bauhaus is an excellent opportunity for that. Well indeed but also we, you know, we have that basis of, of the ancient Greek philosophy that you mentioned which you know, is again a foundation stone for um, still thinking about the way yeah. we want to live. Um, today, I'm curious uh, about um, some of the discussion in the session, you know, regarding business. I mean, you mentioned about, the, you know, one way to incentivize businesses in, the, in this new economy is that they should be able to profit from the, the, the green economy. I mean, can you explore and, and elaborate on that a little bit? Yes. Actually, uh, the, uh, today we know we have the knowledge and uh, the means to to do things better. Um, we need uh, at the same time, and here the role also of consumers, uh, we need two things. The one is to make sure that what is done, even when we make mistakes, is done in, in good faith of what we have done. Because the society does not believe any longer on that. They believe that you know, business is to make money and uh, they don't care about whatever. And this does not help also the, the good business. 
So again, this is a matter of education okay, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, the trust. So two things. The one is to help in showing, I mean, transparency goes uh, together with trust. It is absolutely necessary for people to understand also the difficulties in, uh, in putting theory into practice. But this is something that has to be done honestly. And um, this is one of the things that uh, some companies try now, um, some within the corporate uh, social responsibility, some in other ways. So uh, this is the, uh, not just how we sell things, is how we explain things. And this is important. I mean, to make difficulties from the private sector, the corporate uh, uh, sector, uh, common uh, knowledge for people to understand and trust. The other thing is that, indeed, there are uh, many ways in which you can earn in the medium and longer term than cash and carry immediately away, now, yes, straight yeah, away. Yeah. And this is, some, uh, this is important, again, to understand when you are dealing with companies with what philosophy they operate yes. and how... So the, I think that uh, we are now in a new era. And uh, in this era, the responsibility of the companies becomes, in my point of view, a big asset, a big capital. Yeah. And it has to, to be first and the most important is honesty. From the moment you, under, you, you say, I cannot make this bottle without spending so much energy or that. And I have three options. I selected this because of this. Yeah. From this moment, you are not the one against the other. The, the social movement yeah. is understanding. There's an element of trust. There's an element there? of trust. Yeah. And this yeah. is very important because we know that not everybody, or perhaps the majority still, thinks how we can increase our uh, revenue, benefit yeah. and yeah. revenue, yeah. because we are responsible to our uh, shareholders, not to the stakeholders. But do you think that's changing? It, see, it yeah. is changing. Yeah. I, I, I believe it is changing at um, medium, at medium level, and either at the very small or mega but, level. But that, that seems to be quite an organic process, at least yes. from where I'm looking, because, you know, governments can only go so far in, in regulation. You know, there has to be this change in the mind and this sense of, of citizenship f for, for companies, for private business as well. From, from your perspective in Greece, is, is that something that's, that's happening? Uh, yes and no. I mean, um, there are more than before, uh, and uh, we learn, actually I learned many things today. Although I'm in the sector, I, I didn't know about many of these uh, excellent projects. Um, again, media, is not helping at the moment. They don't present these successes enough. We have, well, the pes pessimistic and, you know, uh, views uh, prevailing. On the other hand, the corporate uh, sector has many layers and um, they are not all convinced. And the, there are huge interests, as we know now after also Glasgow, and uh, we see that uh, things cannot change very rapidly. Uh, what is important for governments is that although our analyses are not optimistic, are pessimistic, uh, 
you have to conduct policies in an optimistic way. And, uh, and this, is, uh, uh, this is partly done through the civil society. So governments, um, when uh, governments have to give, uh, let's say, to, to, to lead, many times uh, reduce their messages uh, to inaccurate, I, I don't want to say lies, but uh, to a certain extent camouflaging many things. Yes, be, be, misinformation. Be, be, misinformation, yeah. yeah. Uh, or um, stressing few elements that uh, hide the other. So uh, again there, we are not yet in uh, an era of trust. And this is also the case less than in other parts of the world in Europe. Thanks God, is, we still uh, feel that uh, it, the governance is uh, uh, within ethical frames. So, um, but uh, st there is uh, a, a still a gap. And uh, there is where Again, education plays a role in reading behind <laughs> the lines, yes. but also in, in helping, in helping uh, decision makers. In my organization, we have, apart from the uh, NGOs, we have 133 NGOs, practically all the, all the organizations of the Mediterranean, but this is the European Environment Bureau in Brussels yes. and the Arab Network for Environment Development from the South. So we are talking about an right umbrella quite yeah. big, bringing together many million of individuals. But uh, uh, we have three circles. The circle, the MEDIS, is the circle of uh, educators. We have more than 6,000 educators in this network. We have the COMSUD, which is the circle of Mediterranean parliamentarians, like an NGO of parliamentarians, uh, individuals, individual members who believe in sustainable mm -hmm. development. And also uh, the network of uh, COMGEST of journalists. So uh, all these are necessary in order to influence change. Yes. And the, with the parliamentarians, uh, they're able presumably to work within their own parliaments and as a forum to amplify those yes. voices. Um, they are in and out, of course, because they are not... Uh, well, <laughs> also the quality of democracy varies somewhat across the Mediterranean, Med Mediterranean basin. I mean, is this, is this something that you're a little bit perhaps concerned by given you know, there are conflicts, um, there are, you know, these things are not necessarily decided with the same level of scrutiny, democratic scrutiny. I mean, is this something that's... Absolutely. You know, yes, you are absolutely right. And, um, well, uh, I, I have to say that um, the majority of the members of the, uh, of Komsud um, um, do not stay in the parliaments for more than two <laughs> terms. Yes. <laughs> Showing the difficulties they have <laughs> in, in, in promoting, yeah. Yeah. In promoting uh, actually uh, protection of the environment and sustainable development. Yes, in many countries uh, in, in the South, we have this distance between uh, nice statements and uh, inertia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at the same time, um, the, the, the gap between North and South um, is important in many areas. Uh, Take the stage resources to in <coughs> the, the population growth in the South is uh, something that is beyond control. And civil society, I guess, is less developed. Civil society is um, less developed uh, in numbers, but um, many of them are very strong and um, radical, and um, they are different. Um, th their life is language. not always easy. Ooh, so um, it is very difficult to generalize. 
What is important is that uh, with our organization, um, acting for more than 30 years, um, and with the Arab Spring, we didn't lose more than five organizations. Seven, you, one uh, on site, seven. Showing that they are solid, uh, with, uh, with a basis in the society, yeah, to survive. Uh, to survive. To survive the, that, that tumultuous change, yes. yes. Well, Professor Skouros, thank you very much for coming on Bauhaus Radio. It's been a fascinating discussion, and um, I guess the academic community is um, also a significant Great. player in the new European Bauhaus. Um, but I'm afraid that's where we're going to have to leave it for the moment. Um, we're going to go back to our moderators in the main uh, session hall and go down and listen to what's being discussed as far as uh, monitoring behavioural change is concerned. That's all from Bauhaus Radio for today. Join us tomorrow at 8.30 in the morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Quite a good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to this afternoon session on day one of our conference on beautiful, sustainable together life in the new European Bauhaus. So this morning, we heard why new European Bauhaus is so important to deliver, help to deliver on that transition envisaged under the Green Deal. And we began to discuss some of the challenges that need to be addressed and how new European Bauhaus concepts can help to meet those challenges. We're focusing today on changing mindsets and providing incentives for behavior change. We heard some really inspiring examples, both of how best to engage with citizens and indeed how to incentivize that behavior change. Lots of discussion about what works best, what is less effective, and crucially, why this matters so much. And it became clear in our discussions this morning that the very ingredients for success that our speakers were identifying are precisely the key elements and ingredients of new European, new European Bauhaus, with its focus on its values of sustainability, aesthetics and inclusion, on co-creation and co-design. It's not just about transformational projects, it's about transforming the way we develop and deliver them uh, in order to make the Green Deal, as the Commissioner said at the beginning of the day, a cultural positive, human-centered experience. So, 
Uh, just one housekeeping note before I introduce uh, the next topic. Uh, housekeeping note, uh, some of you have been asking, the presentations will be made available to you after the conference, and if you want any clips, any of the videos you've been seeing, any clips to get that new European Bauhaus message out, they will be available. There's an email address at the bottom of the email with your registration details. Just email and someone will magically provide. So do take advantage of all those materials that are being generated and use them to get that message out. So we're now going to turn our attention to impact, uh, the monitoring and measuring of behavioural change. And I'm delighted to have Van den Abila, our moderator of these sessions, to take it away. Over to you, Philippe. Thank you so much, Jackie. And indeed, I uh, hope you all enjoyed lunch and you're fully liquored up because we now plan to go to full exhaustion in our session on monitoring and measuring behavioural change. As Jackie just said, indeed, in, in our morning sessions, we've already touched base on uh, engagement of citizens and also on incentivizing behavioural change towards more sustainable practices. Now we want to look into a fair share of detail on how to monitor monitor and measure that behavioural change and the challenges that both the LIFE and the European uh, Horizon 2020 projects face in, in documenting uh, that change. So does the way to monitor and measure behavioural change, does it have to be tailor-made to the local context? Do we need bespoke solutions for every specific problem or can we also uh, use the same approach that proved effective in one particular problem or, or context? Can we translate that uh, with good results, obviously, to another location or another issue? Uh, you hear it, we have a lot of questions on our plates, but I am glad to add that we will have a gathering of angels flying through over the next 90 minutes to try to answer those questions, or at least to provide you with some food for thought. I have seven speakers that will be sharing their experiences, both from the LIFE projects and the Horizon projects, on monitoring and measuring behavioural change. It's quite a uh, stretching schedule, I acknowledge, so again, we'll break the session into two parts. Um, first, we'll have four speakers dialing in from across Europe. I'll then have a short uh, session, a, a short brainstorm or, or a round table discussion with those four speakers, and then I'll add another three speakers uh, to our program. Uh, by the very end of our session, for those of you still standing, we hope to entertain a Q&A session, a vivid and interactive Q&A session. So again, I cordially invite you to submit any questions or remarks that you may have through our Slido app. That's slido.com, hashtag new European Bauhaus. And then the beauty of a hybrid event is that it enables us to take a tour of duty around Europe. My next four speakers will be dialing in remotely from the Netherlands, from Spain, from France and from Sweden. And I propose to, s to start in Sweden and go directly to Umea, the city of Birches, or Björkarnasstad, if I pronounce that correctly. Some five years ago, the World Wildlife Fund has coined Umea as Sweden's climate city. For good reason, because this city has a proven track record in turning climate strategy into tangible action and in the very process also engaging residents to act climate smart. So it is both my pleasure and my privilege to introduce to you Johan Zandström, Head of Sustainable Development at the city of Umea. Johan has worked for 15 years on energy efficiency and climate change topics and was both the visionary and the architect behind the fossil-free uh, public transport in Umea. He has also been instrumental in the Green Citizens for Europe project, developing innovative tools and methods for interactive and co-creative citizens. So I invite Johan to kickstart our session on monitoring and measuring behavioural change. Yes, thank you for a re really a nice presentation, both of me and of, of course of the city. Uh, I'm Johan Sandström. Uh, I'm a head of unit for sustainable development here in the city of Umeå. And I'm going to give a quick insight on uh, some actions that we have been working with when it comes to behavior change and also how we think about monitoring. Uh, behavior change actions. Uh, and if you who don't know, Umeå is the largest 
city in the northern part of Sweden. Uh, and uh, we have uh, been financed by LIFE, um, the LIFE program uh, for, with a project called Green Citizens of Europe. That we also renamed the Green Umeå. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, I, I see the slides very, very small on my screen. So uh, here you can see uh, uh, um, so this is U-Bike. This is the Cedis electric cargo bike sharing systems. We're currently testing this system right now. We have two stations here in Numia, one downtown and one at the campus area. Sharing bike pool and they can pay a monthly fee and then can use the bikes up to three hours for free. Uh, and it's, it's been around for a couple of years and it's really been a huge success and very good usage of the bikes. And this is a, this is an action for us to to see how we can test different new technology and different systems that we can also um, develop further and also use in other areas in Numeo. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a uh, a slide that shows how, how we've been monitoring the U-Bike system. And I think when it comes to service and measuring is to combine hard stats with attitude service and see how they correlate with each other. And it's also uh, a good way to first make a survey to see how the current mode are before you make a change. For example, uh, building new infrastructure like this U-Bike systems or new bike lanes or uh, new electric buses or something. And uh, we uh, usually also do an information campaign uh, after the transition. And also make a new survey to see how the attitude has been changed after we also been imp implemented the system. But here are some stats from the U-Bike uh, cargo bike station. Uh, on the left side, you can see which kind of bicycle is most frequently used. We had per week, this was kind of like the, the hard stats that come directly from the, the, the booking system. And on the, on the right side of, uh, of this slide, you can see the results from attitude service. Uh, when we have been sending out questions to the people that are using the system. Uh, and for example, if if they think that cargo bikes could replace private car owning or uh, uh, if they have bought their own electric cargo bike after they have been testing the, the, the bikes uh, in the U-bike stations. So it's a, it, it shows a way on, on how we used to monitoring uh, behavior change. Um, you can have the next slide, please. And this, uh, shows a picture of different campaigns that we uh, did during the LIFE program project. And as I said earlier with you, Bike, it's always good to do information campaign campaigns when you tr to try to change behavior when the change is done. Uh, for example, in the middle here, uh, it's a, it's a uh, campaign we did when we uh, implemented a park and bike system uh, in, in the city. And uh, also, you see the, 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 the guy who's crying uh, in this picture also done when we implemented a new system for car sharing. And the twist on that was so, it's so uh, horrible and boring for all these lonely people that are driving in the cars. In, in January, it's 1.2 uh, passengers per car commuting here in Umeå and also I think it's, it's the same thing all over Europe. So we did, it's so, it's so sad with all the slow, lonely people in the cars. But it also was a, was a way, way for us to, uh, to do a, an information campaign when we are putting up a new system and we also had a system that we can get a lot of statistics from, how, how many people are car sharing and we also did uh, attitude service uh, regarding car sharing. And it's also 
so that people are always more open to change in their behavior when it's some other change occurring in their lives. For example, when they're moving to a new neighborhood, there's also something we've been, been try, try to, to do that we all always try to have, have something done when we are building a new, new block of, of the, uh, the city, for example. Uh, next slide, please. This is my, my last slide. This is another somewhat crazy example of a combined, a campaign combined with statistics. Um, there are measuring done in Swedish cities on how much litter there is on the streets. Uh, and after that, we, we, we uh, noticed that maybe it's too much litter here in Umeå. So the cities decided to install new garbage can in the city center with more recycling possibilities than before. And to highlight this, we made a mini musical <laughs> uh, around this area. So this is uh, the musical Trash. So we had a, a local musician who played the role of a kind of like a garbage Jesus trying to unite two gangs. One gang were the, were the somewhat cool dudes who throw the garbage on the streets and the other one were the more proper ones who wanted to stop all the littering in the streets. And at again, the, the somewhat garbage Jesus trying to unite the two gangs. So we played the musical outside in the city center. Uh, and after that, we also did different service on how many people noticed the new recycling trash bin after we did a campaign. And in the long run, we were also measuring uh, how the effect was on street litter when we have been uh, placing out those new garbage can. Thanks a lot. Uh, yes. Johan, sorry, in times of uh, in light of timing, I propose we uh, move on. But I greatly appreciate uh, you, <laughs> you you calling uh, a, a musical trash, and I also appeal to what you've shown on the uh, the guy that was crying in the car. So thanks a lot for painting us a picture uh, of a truly green city, uh, Johan. Thank you. Uh, it's a picture which is no longer a vision, but a tangible reality in Sweden. So I think it should serve as an inspiration for all of us to accelerate our joint efforts in shaping a more sustainable future. And then indeed, let's move swiftly to our next speaker, um, which is Ernesto Fobel Kubels. Uh, He's a smart uh, city project coordinator in the municipality of Valencia in Spain. That is, together with Dresden and Antalya, Valencia was one of the three lighthouse cities in the Matchup Horizon 2020 project, a project that aims to design and implement a palette of innovative solutions in the energy, mobility and ICT sectors. It is driven by the heartfelt desire to turn urban problems into smart opportunities to improve the citizens' quality of life and also to boost local economies. So I, for one, am all ears to hear from Ernesto, how to maximize the upscaling and replication potential of high-level urban transformation strategies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me, um, having the opportunity of uh, uh, talking about uh, what we are carrying out in the city of Valencia and, generally speaking, in the Matcha project. So, if we could start with the presentation, uh, could you move to the next slide, please? Yeah, here you can see the, the pillars of the project, as, uh, as you have mentioned. There are uh, different pillars based on energy, mainly in energy efficiency and renewables, uh, mobility, uh, focus mainly in electromobility, multimodality, IT intelligent transport system, and so on. Regarding ICT, uh, we have uh, developed quite a lot of actions in terms of uh, Internet of Things and the, the urban platform. And last but not least, could you move to the next uh, pillar? Because we have here the four that is the, the social pillar, because we have uh, quite a lot of actions for our total in the three cities of 141 actions. There are uh, a bunch of actions the, with a social component. And the part of them are, are those uh, for, for which we are uh, going to explain uh, what we have carried out in terms of uh, the, the social evaluation approach. 
well, here you can see the consortium mm -hmm. uh, in which uh, you, as, as you have mentioned, we have uh, Valencia with a, a small consortium for for the different pillars. Dresden with the same uh, Antalya, different uh, different uh, cross-cutting uh, work package leaders uh, for a total of 28 partners from eight different countries. Could you move to the next slide, please? Yeah, as you can see, the, these are the objectives of the of the project, and uh, one of them is the the monitoring and evaluation program, and uh, and this uh, for what we are. Uh, Mm, we have developed a complex evaluation framework that uh, I want to, to explain in the next. Next, please. Yeah, as you can see, we have three different evaluation frameworks, technical, economic, and social. And uh, um, the thing is that we, we are going to, to give the same relevance to all of them, because in some projects, uh, I know that uh, it, the focus is more on technical aspects, and the social is a kind of a residual uh, a framework, but we are trying to give uh, all the relevance uh, to this. Uh, could you move to the next uh, slide, please? Yeah. Here uh, you can see the, the the process that we have carried out uh, in order to to define the the approach of the social evaluation. Uh, the process has been collaborative and iterative. So the, these two features are key for for us. So as to define the objectives and the expected outcomes of the different actions. In the first, uh, we could define this this process in three different uh, steps. First is a top down uh, step in which we have compiled information from existing uh, scientific literature and the uh, different uh, frameworks defined by other projects as, such as CD keys. Uh, we have defined the different dimensions of, uh, that we want to, to assess and with this uh, we have a, a, a composed a first list of indicators. And then in the second, in this, uh, this, uh, this, this step has been carried out with a top-down approach because it, it has been led by by, by the experts in, in this uh, topic. And then after that, we have uh, assessed this, uh, this uh, first list of indicators, social uh, indicators, uh, by partners. And uh, um, after th their feedback, we have analyzed and reviewed these, uh, these different uh, indicators and uh, select uh, them in, in based on different aspects. For example, relevance, measurability, reliability, comparability, timeliness, so different aspects that uh, has, uh, have meant to uh, keep them in the final list of indicators. And after that, we have defined uh, the, the final model for, uh, for this uh, assessment. Could you move to the next slide, please? Yes, because uh, we are, mm, strictly speaking, we are not measuring beha behavior, but we are measuring the, 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 uh, the concept, uh, the, the multidimensional concept of uh, quality of life. And uh, for that, uh, in, we, in, in, that uh, in that aspect, the quality of life, we have focused the social evaluation. So and this, uh, this uh, approach, this, uh, this concept of uh, quality of life has different dimensions, as you can see on the screen. We have material living com uh, conditions, governance, living environment, equity, social acceptance, and uh, employment. Uh, and, and these are the main, the main uh, dimensions that we have uh, uh, compiled so as to define this, this model. Could you move to the next, please? Yes, and uh, landing these uh, these concepts, we have uh, carried out this process uh, by which uh, we have carried out two different uh, services, one ex ante, another will be carried out ex post, because uh, our project uh, initially was uh, scheduled for five years. We are now in the fourth, fin fin finishing the fourth, but due to COVID situation and, and other uh, reasons, we have extended up to uh, six years. So we have in front of us two years for monitoring, and, and then we carried out a first uh, survey, uh, dividing uh, the survey in two main concepts. First, environmental uh, awareness, and second, social acceptance. And with these uh, two, main two main pillars, 
we will carry out another uh, survey uh, close to the end of the project. So with this, obviously, we, we will have the chance of, uh, of uh, comparing if uh, the actions that we have carried out both at the city level and at district level has been the expected outcomes and if they could be replicated and scaled. Uh, and, and uh, to, sorry to interrupt, we're a bit strapped for time in our schedule, so if you could perhaps round up your presentation. No, the, the, this was my last slide and uh, I finished my, okay, thank you, my sir. presentation. Thank you Thank so much, you. Ernesto, for sharing with us the lessons learned of the Matchup project. Again, we will make all the presentations, the slides available for you to go <coughs> through in more detail uh, for your perusal. Uh, I heard Ernesto talk about redesigning cities with a, a palette of innovative solutions. I also recall the softer solutions such as um, specific social engagement activities. So I believe this also ties in well with our program of tomorrow where we will be discussing sustainable cities and districts in much more detail. Now, let's try to restore the gender imbalance by introducing two ladies of high caliber here. Uh, first one is Corinne Four, who holds a PhD in marketing from the University of Florida and who joined uh, Grenoble École de Management as marketing professor some 10 years ago. Her research interests are in the area of new product development, but also sustainable behavior, especially when it comes to waste and energy consumption. No wonder she has been closely involved in the Horizon 2020 Cheetah project, which stands for Changing Energy Efficiency Technology Adaptation in Households. Do tell us, Professor Four, did your Cheetah take a giant leap at light speed? Yes, uh, hi, and thanks very much for inviting me to this uh, session and for the very interesting talks uh, before. Uh, I just will make a little bit of advertisement for Grenoble, uh, which will be the green uh, uh, capital, European capital city uh, next year. So, so we are interested in what you're doing in Grenoble also. Uh, but uh, to this uh, presentation here, so our project was about uh, uh, energy, um, energy efficiency adoption of both technologies, but also policies. So our focus was on uh, household acceptance of upcoming changes. And we did not expose them to real changes as you were uh, showing in the previous presentation, but we in fact uh, did some online surveys where we exposed them to some potential changes. And there are a little bit some uh, uh, be some tricks uh, or some uh, difficulties of doing these kind of studies with attitude measurement, particularly when it's about change. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so we, um, uh, what we uh, in this project is we gathered information from about 18,000 uh, participants or households throughout uh, eight European countries. And um, in, uh, in these uh, studies, we asked them about a number of their reactions to a number of situations with technology adoption. So it would be, for instance, new heating systems or um, smart thermostats or different technologies, uh, but also to some new business models. So for instance, hoarding equipment and also to policies, which uh, we collected the data in summer 2018 and two months later the yellow vest uh, movement in France started because of less lack of acceptance of some policies so I guess we were a little bit ahead of our time but uh, unfortunately we could not stop that movement we, uh, um, so if we um, uh, what we did which might be uh, interesting to, to some of you in this uh, uh, in this project, uh, is we use what is called a discrete choice experiment, uh, which is a method that is um, a little bit different than the usual surveys with attitude measurement that are typically used in, uh, in most uh, attitude surveys, uh, and that have uh, uh, the strength to being able to really understand the importance of decision factors when people make a decision to change or not their behavior. Uh, so 
this was our focus. We were interested in these decision factors. And when you typically do these types of uh, surveys where you are asking about uh, uh, decision factors, uh, what, you, uh, what you see, if we go to the next slide, I hope it will be visible. Um, you can also click yeah, that everything, everything shows. One more click, yeah, thank you. Uh, so this is a, uh, a result that we got from a previous uh, H 2020 project, uh, Voice Key, which we did uh, a few years ago. And we were asking here like two questions, like typical types of questions that you ask. Uh, you ask people like, um, it was the same eight countries. So um, how much does price matter when you decide to purchase a refrigerator? How much does uh, performance matter when you decide to purchase a refrigerator? And if you, you probably cannot see the percentages, but if you look at these pictures, what you see is some responses that are relatively useless. Pretty much everybody is saying everything you hear, price and performance, but we also ask about sustainability. We ask all kinds of different factors. And everybody says everything is important. And if you look across the different countries, uh, except for a little bit of a difference in Sweden, where across the board we found that the, the Swedish respondents were more likely to be a little bit less socially desirable. So, so they uh, were a little bit more critical in their responses. Otherwise, everybody gives you pretty much the same answers. So that is not very useful. Uh, and it is difficult to identify what really matters to people. So instead, what we use is on the next slide, um, a method of um, discrete choice experiment. So we use, I show it here on an example also with the purchase of refrigerators. Uh, what you do is you face people with some scenarios where they have to uh, to decide what they do if they are forced to purchase a refrigerator. Uh, and you face them with some simplified choices. Uh, so here they have to choose between two refrigerators that have different characteristics. Uh, that um, these uh, characteristics are uh, representing, uh, allow us to represent the trade-offs that people make when they make a decision. Because of course, everybody would prefer a huge fridge with uh, illimited warranty time, with uh, uh, a price of 100 euros and so on. And so on. But this is not, uh, and very energy efficient, but this is not reality. Reality is you have to pay for what you get and you have to make trade-offs between different characteristics. Uh, so what you do with this method is that you uh, expose people to successive choices so they do six or eight of these uh, different choices. And it allows you, because one of the attributes is how much they are willing to pay, so the price that they pay, it allows you to calculate the uh, willingness to pay that people have for particular attribute level levels. So you know exactly how much are will people willing to pay for an A++ plus uh, plus uh, fridge compared to an A++ plus plus one and so on. Um, and um, it is more uh, similar to the types of choices that people really do. Of course, it has some limits. Uh, the, you cannot ask for millions of attributes. You have to simplify the choices quite dramatically. Uh, so we, you need to pretest. You also need to work with experts. So we work with uh, um, policy expert and technology expert on all the technologies that we included uh, to have the right levels, the right prices, and so on. Uh, but the important, the, the interesting uh, possibility or the interesting contribution is that you, that people make, and it is much easier for people to respond to these types of questions than to respond to something like a attitudes that are a little bit vague. Um, so we uh, run these uh, types of uh, studies across the eight countries. We did always the same study. Uh, and then we adjusted in the analysis, we adjusted 
by country characteristics and also by household characteristics. Uh, so accounting for income, accounting for uh, whether people live in urban or rural area and so on and so on. It's heterogeneity in the responses, uh, but um, not, um, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, basically based on the household and also country uh, and house characteristics, uh, but always the same choices that people were facing. So, so maybe to the uh, questions that you, you had. But perhaps, and that's uh, it for uh, me. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Professor Fur. And indeed, this, this cheetah that we were talking about is not the 500 pound. as it shows how it can simplify behavioral change into a simple series of choices. Now, let's move quickly to our fourth speaker in this session who will be connecting from the Netherlands. Lara Bowman is an assistant professor at the Health and Society Group of Wageningen University where she conducts research on innovative approaches to nutrition promotion. Lara holds a master degree in human nutrition and a PhD in communication sciences. So I, for one, cannot think of a better person to tell us this project which aims to reduce the environmental impact of our food choices by engaging European citizens to adopt a healthier and a more sustainable diet. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, so nice to be here today uh, and hearing all these other projects in, uh, in the EU, actually. So uh, I represent uh, the team of Suitable, which is our abbreviation of sustainable eating. And besides Wageningen, it includes also the Sustainable Restaurant Association in the UK, Mobile App Designers Green Apes, as well as the Barilla Center for Food and Nutrition in Italy. And you already explained that our aim is indeed to engage European citizens in more healthful and sustainable diets. And we try to do that through the cafeteria setting of businesses and universities in the UK and Italy. So our activities include guidance for caterers and kitchen chefs on creating sustainable meals and offering those uh, in their locations, as well as guiding their customers in selecting those sustainable dishes, as well as learning about the why, how and what of sustainable food choice. So while I talk you through the project, you will see my colleague Leah Rosen preparing her dinner. So can you please start the video? And this dinner is a sustainable, healthful, and most important, of course, very tasty autumn bowl. Mm -hmm. And she illustrates the project's efforts to enable people to become inspired, knowledgeable, and actionable about eating in a way that benefits human and nature. So about our project, uh, we have actually uh, four theoretical drivers, which are positive, playful, practical, and participatory. And of course, it's not a coincidence if that it's four Ps, like in marketing, is like very regular. So these translate firstly into an emphasis of what people can do and eat rather than what they cannot do or eat. So we try to provide a positive outlook on why and how to change. And we also value playfulness. It's the starting point of the Green Apes app. This is a gamified online learning tool with very fun challenges that range from label checking at the supermarket or the cafeteria to ranking foods and composing your own sustainable meal, like Leah is doing right now. And each challenge that we offer includes learning validation through puzzles, quizzes, or for instance, the upload of a meal picture. Activities are also very practical with very hands-on specific tools and tips so people can empower themselves in making sustainable choices. An example is the revision and rear menus together with the chefs to comply with the specific suitable criteria for healthful, sustainable meals. And the last P is participation. And this stands for our participatory co-creation process in which we collaborate with students, employees, kitchen staff, caterers, as well as management to shape all activities. 
Uh, we value their expertise because they are the experts, of course, in the challenges they face and the opportunities they have for change. And also we do this because it's very important to build trust and commitment, of course, to initiate and uphold these changes after the project is finished. About monitoring and evaluation, uh, like other speakers, we also have like a, a qualitative and quantitative uh, way of measuring what we accomplish. And this includes the environmental level, the behavioral level, as well as psychosocial indicators for change. So first, at to assess changes in CO2 equivalent and water use in the cafeteria. At the behavioral level, we assess changes in sustainable meal choices, of course, in the locations, uh, as well as sales data and in-app validation, roundtables and survey. At psychosocial level, we also use this, uh, this mixture of assessment methods, and we also include roundtable discussions and interviews. And our main goal for this psychosocial level is to assess changes in three important capacities that are driving food choices. And these are the motivational, the cognitive, as well as the actionable capacity. So about research started January 2020 in seven Italian and UK cafeteria, yet of course we're fully halted uh, to COVID after one and two months of activities. So in the UK, it came to a full stop actually, and we only recently uh, managed to restart our activities in the locations. But in Italy, we had some activities that could be uh, adapted. So that is why we already do have some insights in uh, what we accomplished with our activities. And uh, on environmental impact, for instance, uh, this decreased in some locations up to 32%, which means 500 grams CO2 equivalent less and about 400 liters of water less per meal consumed if we compare this with the average impact of a meal consumed by EU citizens. And we have just finished the first analysis of activities in Italy, and that shows that people that ate a sustainable meal at the cafeteria and or made a suitable recipe at home increase their capacities in knowing which foods are sustainable, how to make a sustainable meal, and they were more motivated to eat like this more frequently. And what we also discovered was interesting that there was a, a larger learning effect among people who actually made the meal themselves at home. And uh, we recently restarted in five locations in the UK and just line uh, evaluation, monitoring. Uh, at Queen's Mary's University, for instance, it showed that the motivation among students is, is pretty high, yet that they indicate that they have little actionable capacity, uh, which means that they lack the very practical skills and know-how to eat sustainably in a very uncomplicated way especially because, of, this, of course, many students don't have a large budget uh, to, to, to buy their food from. And in the coming months, uh, we will monitor whether and how our activities contribute, of course, to the further learning on eating healthfully and sustainably, and how this drives an increased meal choice or behavior change, as well as environmental impact. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Loro, and I can already tell you from what I hear and see in our venue here in Brussels that you've certainly raised the appetite for a healthy and <laughs> sustainable diet. Um, Mission accomplished. <laughs> yes. I have three more speakers up our sleeves, and in order to grant and offer them the exposure and the forum uh, they deserve, I propose to confine or to compress our first roundtable discussion to merely one question, which I'd like to raise to Johan Sandström, uh, because I uh, cut you short uh, from your conclusions, maybe, Johan. Uh, I understand the Green Umea project had tangible re results. We are talking, uh, talking about the grand total of 15,000 um, people who started to travel in a more sustainable cycle more and reduce their, uh, their energy use. So maybe very quickly, Johan, if we're talking about measuring and monitoring, uh, how was this measured? 
Yes. Uh, we did a, a large uh, survey on how many people have been addressed by activities done by the project. And we were uh, uh, yeah, making questions to, to those people if they have changed their behavior in some way when, it, when they have been uh, in contact with us. So I think that was the the main, the main, uh, uh, the main action on how we were, were uh, trying to measure the, the effect of, of the overall activities. It was a project that was going on for like five years or something. Yeah. yeah. So I think we. Uh, and think that was the, touching, yeah. touching fifteen thousand people. So for sure, indeed, making a, a significant contribution there. So thanks again for that, Johan. Yeah. I propose that we take all our other questions at the very end of the session. Also, your questions that you can still convey through slido.com, hashtag new European uh, Bauhaus. So without further ado, allow me to introduce Andre Stigger, Executive Director at Klima Budnis Tirol. Andre will share with us a status update from the Doppel Plus project, which aims to steer the behavior of low-income households, which are particularly vulnerable to the consequences of climate change towards climate protection and by doing so raising living standards and reducing energy bills. If you're with us, Andre, please take the stage. Thank you very much. Hello everybody. Thanks for having me here. Uh, yeah, I will present the monitoring of the uh, climate action campaign for low income households without presentation. Uh, I will focus on the heart of the project, which was the household, which were the households coachings of low-income households, done by volunteers from the folk, from the target group. The volunteers were asked to document each coaching in an online data, data protocol, and with the help of the online documentation tool, it is determined, determined how many people participated in the counseling in each case, but also the contact of the coaching was written down. During the coaching, the households have been informed that they will be called afterwards, after two or four weeks, to evalu evaluate the coaching. In total, uh, 119 interviews were conducted. We decided to use the method uh, CATI computer assisted telephone interviews and uh, read, as I said, 119 households. In addition, the households that took part in the CATI interview were contacted again by email six months after the consultation and asked to take part in an online survey. The extent of saved kilowatt hours of energy and CO2 equivalent has been estimated by using the default formula of the Austrian energy audit standard. The most important results can be summarized as following. Over 15,000 people have been reached. Over 800 household coachings were carried out by trained volunteers. Over 2,000 kilowatt hours of annual savings per household could, could be estimated. An average of annual saving, savings of 209 euro per household was uh, found out. And over 2 million kilowatt hours of energy savings in the whole project, uh, which means 630 tons CO2 equivalents of savings. Since the project addresses energy efficiency, mold prevention, the reduction of food waste, awareness rising for renewables and environmental friendly transport and mobility, it achieved an impact in the respect of environment and resource efficiency and primarily in the context of climate action. Accordingly, the final results of the monitoring show an increasing sensitization of the target group for low-income households. Thus, based on the results of the monitoring, the following key statements can be made. Firstly, the majority of people who participated in different project activities were very satisfied with the offer. 
70% of the consulted households were very satisfied and 30% were satisfied with the household coaching. 68% of the consulted persons who participate, participated in a workshop on the topic of climate mitigation in courses for German as a foreign language were very satisfied and 25% satisfied. Secondly, the results of the survey with participants of the household coaching show that the project has a positive influence on people's attitude towards the importance of energy saving and climate mitigation. More than 72% are sure that the behavioral tips they were given contribute, contribute to reducing their energy consumption. More than 72% were motivated by the advice to pay more attention to the topics of energy consumption and climate no, protection. Uh, how can you control? Already before it was difficult. But... Within the household, within the household coachings, the participant got also a starting package and was on these starter packages. It can be assumed that through the allocation and use of the energy saving devices within the starter package, like LED lamps, thermometers or hygrometers, refrigerator thermometers and hourglass shower coaches, the 800 starter packs issued will, will save almost 119 euro or 400 uh, CO2 equivalent per year. In total, the sum of all calculated saving items of the duration of effect, the duration of effect of one year are 2 uh, million kilowatt hours and 640 CO2 equivalent. So 18% of the electricity costs can be saved through, through the services of the project. The result in a relief, is a relief for those households and figures show that the project was an, has an impact on an individual household level. The participants in the coaching sessions received a series of energy saving tips. In the telephone survey, it was asked whether these had contributed to a change in behavior. Some of the energy saving methods had already been implemented prior to the counseling. For example, about 48 of the respondents had closed pots and pans with a lid when, co when cooking, or 51 had used their washing machine in an energy saving way. Approximately 61 said that since the counseling, they regularly switch off switch switchable power strips. 42% avoid using lamps with high power consumption and 51% now set the refrigerator to be less cold. The respondents were also asked about the receipt and implementation of various tips for reducing heating costs. The most frequently implemented tip was to change the ventilation behavior. It is better to open the window completely for a short time instead of keeping it open tilted for a longer time. We also focused difficulties. For example, in the test run of the telephone interview, it turned out that the questionnaire was too detailed and too complex for the target group. The questioning had to be adapted, adapted to the target group. Unfortunately, it was also not possible to offer the telephone survey in several languages. In general, it was a challenge to reach the target group via phone, but nevertheless, 119 households could be reached and, uh, the, and uh, the results of the monitoring could uh, be presented now. Thank uh, you very much. Thanks a lot, Andra, for uh, giving us this update and indeed with COP26 results that have just come out and with rising energy prices, I think it's crystal clear for all of us that we also have a pressing requirement to mobilize and engage those low-income households in climate actions as well. So thanks for bringing that 
to the attention. Our next speaker will be calling in from Greece. Uh, so let's give the stage to Professor Zizis uh, Samaras, who is director of the Lab of Applied Thermodynamics at Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. Professor Samaras' work deals primarily with engine and vehicle emission testing and monitoring, and he has carried out a wide range of projects on modeling emission from internal combustion engines. Today, I'd like him to briefly talk about one particular project which is the Mile 21 Life project, targeting more information and less emissions, and at the same time, empowering consumers for a greener 21st century. Professor, the word is yours. Thank you very much, Philip. To build a house, uh, it means, <laughs> in German, so. I but your mic just You're in the air. So did mine. Yes, you know what I did? Uh, I have to remove my pin because I pinned the presentation. So uh, if I can have the first slide, which I don't see, actually. Yeah. We're going to pull up your first slide, Professor, right away. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, while the slide, uh, yes, uh, comes up, thank you. Mile 21, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the participation of, of uh, the other institutions in this project that included TNO in the Netherlands, ICCD in Germany, uh, Emisia also in Greece, a company close to the university, and uh, four consumer organizations from across Europe, Auto Consumo from Italy, from Spain, from Belgium, and from Portugal. The target was uh, to uh, offer uh, support to the users in order to reduce fuel energy consumption, fuel and energy consumption of the vehicles and the real world conditions, provide also the possibility to record and self-report fuel consumption, and equally importantly, to be in the position to compare vehicles when they decide to change their vehicle to buy a new one or even a second uh, one. The target is really to provide real world fuel consumption vehicles since we know that the uh, published values coming from the OEMs, and according to the regulation, they are generally lower, up to 40% compared to real-world fuel consumption. Next slide, please. Uh, I will try to give answers following really the questions that were addressed to us. Therefore, the first thing is to tell you how we try to monitor the impact of, of uh, our project. We did three things. One was to have a flash survey for some frequent users of our platform. The second was to have a more detailed extended survey, in particular, in particular uh, uh, using scientific methods uh, for, uh, for the different users. And finally, to uh, make statistical analysis and more uh, deep analysis, I would say, of the uh, tool uh, that uh, was used and offered to the users for self-reporting of fuel consumption. Next slide, please. So having these uh, uh, tools in our hands, uh, a very uh, fast idea what we got. We had a, uh, a significant feedback from the flash uh, questionnaire, and this was expected largely because of business to reply. Uh, to this, however, the whole thing was relatively simple and straightforward. Uh, we had much lower engagement uh, for uh, a much fewer users, of course, a more extended tool, and we had an overwhelming uh, response to the uh, final uh, input of the data, analysis of the data, and the statistical, let's say, significance of this report. To give you an order of magnitude estimate, we started this, uh, this um, uh, surveys during the last three or four months because we are at the end of the project and we have something like 350 responses to the flash questionnaire, only 50 responses to the more extended questionnaire and about one, uh, 800 responses or input for the uh, self-reporting tool. Then the next slide will uh, uh, it, it brings up the fact that how uh, representative the answers can be and how we can make comparisons between the different countries. First of all, 
we have to show the coverage that we have in Europe. These are the countries that are involved really in this, uh, in this uh, exercise. We also uh, realize that fuel consumption is not a straightforward thing. It, uh, as you might expect, of course, uh, is difficult to assess. And also an additional complication was that the exact user location was not available to us for privacy reasons. GDPR is prevailing here. So expansion from urban areas that we are situated to uh, the countries and even more important to other countries is not a straightforward thing and needs to be taken uh, into account. The next slide, with the next slide, we give you an overview of the flash survey impact. We can see, and this is very comparable to what Andrea was saying before, that something like more than 50% of the response Respondents were very satisfied with the tool and our input. I have to tell you that I have a big question mark behind this because there is a general tendency, at least I'm not a statistician, I'm not a behavior scientist, but this is what I see that generally those who respond, they're very happy with the response, unless they are extremely unhappy with the response. We were in the first case, but there were four very simple questions of about 350 people. So the next slide. Uh, yes, attempts also to discuss and answer one of the, of, the, of the important questions. We try to use as much as possible the suggested from the Commission KPIs and the KPI web to reporting. And we tried to use it and apply it in this particular case of ours. Um, I'm afraid that we are not satisfied from this and we believe that we do need more tailor-made approaches. We do need to expand uh, the way that those tools are used in order to match the, the specific needs of each particular case. For example, here uh, it is asked, and I heard with, uh, from Laura before about the food uh, uh, tons uh, of CO2 saved or kilograms of CO2 per kilometer per person saved. However, uh, we can, of course, re we can report what we are measuring. Maybe I have forgotten to tell you that we do two things. One is we measure on some cars. So we are collecting information on fuel consumption. We're transmitting it to the central database. And then we are modeling. We are modeling the performance of the vehicle according to the real usage conditions. And we try to match and we try on this basis to provide, first of all, these estimates that are asked, asked here, but also tips or guidance to the user on how to improve fuel consumption. Now, talking about these, uh, these uh, numbers, we need an additional level of modeling with additional uh, uncertainty, if you wish, uh, statistical uncertainty. So we have to have the certainty that we know what the occupancy rate is of the cars in different areas, uh, how they are driven, if they are driven similarly or differently, the composition of the fleet, which is extremely important, important so on and so forth. We believe that we have to revisit, the Commission needs to revisit, life needs to revisit those particular uh, uh, tools that are being suggested. And with the last, oh, uh, there, there are two slides more. One, the next one. Yeah, we have been very much concerned about the trans transferability of the data. As I said before, because of the modeling exercise we need in order to transfer, we need to have a clear understanding that the situation where we're transferring our data is comparable to the ones that we start from. So for example, if we're talking about fleet composition from one country to, uh, of Europe to the other, we do have those data and we therefore can model. However, moving to other parts may be easier if we move to North America, for example, it's not that different from Europe, but if we move to China or to Africa, maybe things are extremely uh, different different and not comparable. And finally, in order to give with the last slide a, 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 an overall uh, approach despite on the, on the question, do we need, do we care, do we have to continue monitoring? Evidently, the answer is very simple, straightforward. Yes, for uh, we, we think two reasons. One is transparency. We need to know where tax pays, taxpayers' money goes and how it's used and also possibility to make comparisons of different solutions. And for this, we think that expanding a hub uh, like Cordis, but being uh, 
uh, larger and encompassing also life and other projects, we believe it's necessary uh, if we want to, to make comparisons of the different tools and the different projects that are uh, being financed. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope we're not too far away from the six men. No, that was perfectly fine. So thanks a lot, Professor Zizis, for pointing out that there's indeed much more than meets the eye. I learned, I learned uh, that there's quite an important difference between official and on-road vehicle or fuel consumption. I also heard your rationale and reasons for uh, monitoring impact. And then the very last speaker of this session, to my delight, is sitting with me here in Brussels. So it's my genuine pleasure to sit shoulder to shoulder to <laughs> Johannes Slezik, who has been a university assistant uh, for research and teaching at the Institute of, for Management Accounting at the Johannes Kepler University in Linz since 2017. Uh, since last month, Johannes joined the Energy Institute of the university as a researcher with a PhD. I tease him to uh, with the challenge to cover in administration kiosk application and there's ECRU on establishing community renewable energy webs so uh, very warm welcome to the studio I believe we want to kickstart the discussion by showing a short video correct precisely then I propose we have the video in the air and we have a look at the video of your house. Electricity production and consumption within a power grid need to perfectly match every second into problems up to large-scale power outages. In extreme cases, for example when heavy cloud cover brings photovoltaic production close to zero across a large area, our most effective contribution is to lower our own energy usage as much as possible. We wanted to see how much impact we could generate from PGAP. We notified our users about a date and time when their support was needed. We asked them to reduce their energy consumption during a specific 15 minute span and set for them a target level. The response to our expectations, with 43% of our users hitting the target. Afterwards, we surveyed our users about what they actually did to decrease their energy consumption. 63% of them turned off their electronics, 30% of them postponed using their major household appliances, like a dishwasher, and 27% even postponed cooking. This showed that households are receptive to modifications about their energy use and are willing to take action. Mobilizing this potential could significantly reduce the cost of providing electricity for all of us. That's a fairly so strong value proposition for PCAP. Uh, already. <laughs> Thank you very much for this introduction and for the video uh, that I was allowed to play here. So I'm going to talk on the one hand uh, about PCAP and on the other hand about ECRU. Both are actually Horizon 2020 uh, projects. And the PCAP is actually more or encourages individu individual motivation, whereas ECRU uh, encourages like a collective action towards uh, behavioral change for uh, energy consumption, energy efficiency. So PCAP, as we have just seen in the video, it makes the consumers actually uh, to a demand side manager, yeah. which means that um, consumers learn to take on a proactive role in this energy transition. So they can gauge with the PCAP uh, their own energy consumption. And through or with uh, push-up mes messages, they can actually change their uh, energy behavior, their energy consumption. So all in all, for example, like delaying a, a dishwasher, the use of a laundry machine, something like that. So, uh, uh, oh, and uh, sorry, I need the slides uh, here too. Uh, next slide, please. That's in a sense the title and the next slide. Right, and this is, uh, shows uh, the, the PCAP, uh, the platform, so to speak. Uh, and next slide. 
there you go. Uh, we had uh, our study, we used or involved uh, 2,500 households um, in four European countries, and we had two test groups and one control group, and we did receive us or, or uh, sh sh we were able to identify significant changes here, thankfully. For example, the average consumption was able to be decreased by 7%. Um, also, uh, behavioral change because of the push-up push messages was able to be changed by about 1.15%. Now, that doesn't seem too much, but uh, overall, in, in including the consumption, it actually is um, notifying. Also, customers kept engaged because of the, of the app and the push-up messages. There was also a household comparison possibility, and that also uh, led to a short-term short improvement. Um, and very interesting and very powerful, perhaps, uh, we also recognized a peak load shifting, which means uh, during energy, energy peaks, and because of push-up messages, we were able to shift those peaks. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. And this uh, peak app, in a sense, uh, this project led us to the eCrew project, establishing communities, uh, renewable energy webs. Mm. We are aiming to or looking for uh, new business models uh, for energy utilities in cooperation with uh, consumers and prosumers. Uh, so energy communities. We established three lighthouse communities in Europe, in Spain, in Germany, and in Turkey, and are uh, just about in this enrolling program. So we're using the platform of PICAP to uh, enroll it uh, into the lighthouse communities, uh, into the single households, uh, adapt the smart meters, and well, we're in the middle of this enrollment program, which means trying to get consumers and, and prosumers on board. And of course, um, in three different countries, this is a challenge. Uh, as we have already heard today, uh, we need awareness programs for mm -hmm. consumers to really join on the one hand, and also shared sustainability values, but shared in the sense mm, between the consumers and prosumers and the energy utility, so for them to somehow work together. Um, and with that, I already like to say thank you, and I hope I covered that in that time. <laughs> thank you, so much. that was indeed an endeavor, but thanks a lot for that, Johan. Also, thanks for highlighting those two projects, two important factors, I think, which are often overlooked. So the sheer potential of demand side management and also the role that consumers and prosumers can play in establishing uh, new uh, renewable energy webs. So thanks a lot for that. Johannes, you. we're a bit short on time, but I'd like to see whether we have any questions that have come in through Slido. Then we can pass them through our um, panel. Uh, let's see how do you all imagine the so-called bottom-up initiatives living up to the expectation I hear today to, ma to make impacts measurable. It's a good one. Any idea, Johannes? Because Well, uh, bottom-up initiatives, I think, are actually, uh, that, that's like the base, the necessity. So, I mean, of course, we have, we have two ways. Um, the energy utilities, they still, they want, the, to, to a certain degree, they need to be involved. Uh, and also, I think they want to be involved, at least in our lighthouse uh, communities, for example. And to some degree, they would like to show or have show a top-down um, uh, hierarchy. Yeah. But the initiative must come from bottom up, so we need to actually look at the consumers and the prosumers that engage, that are engaged, that uh, take on their responsibility uh, for this energy transition, for their proactive role, which means, um, yes, of course, those are bottom up initiatives and they are measurable, for example, uh, through uh, the digitalization, mm -hmm. Smart meters makes it possible to engage prosumers and consumers to make that impact measurable. And in that sense, energy utilities can actually use that as a 
as a powerful instrument working with the prosumers in particular, but also the consumers, uh, if such pl digital platforms are established. Thank you so much, Johannes. I have a question for Laura, if she's still with us. Uh, basically, on domestic content or local content, if, if, if I can call it like that, was your project able to uh, consider the distance of the food? Uh, for example, an organic tomato produced locally versus uh, imported? Very good question. Uh, we have uh, some researchers in the project that have been spent a lot of time on establishing a database. Uh, based on the, in which a lot of products are there that are, let's say, assessed for both their impact on health as well as sustainability. And sustainability does include all these indicators of transport, uh, every, every multiple indicators. And uh, based on that, we have developed the recommendations, like also like what is most important for chefs to buy yeah. Should it be, for instance, the Dutch tomato grown in the glass house, or should it be the one transported mm -hmm. all the way from south of France, but not produced in the glass house? So we have actually uh, created a very hands-on database that chefs, for instance, can, can look into and look up, like, what is for me right now in my location the best choice? That's a clear and, and concise answer. Thanks a lot for that, Laura. We have a lot of questions on our Slido, which goes to show that indeed we've been seeing a lot of rich presentations and a lot of content that also stirred a lot of questions. Unfortunately, we won't be able to cover them now. Um, let's just wrap up by saying I'm an engineer myself. I've learned two things. First and foremost, you can't manage what you don't measure. Secondly, what gets, gets measured gets done. And this is think again it's so important that we do monitor and measure behavioral change. I'm depleted so I like to hand it back to my communicating vessel mm -hmm. who will be filled with energy and passion. Over back to you <laughs> Jackie. Thank you very much and ladies and gentlemen join me in a round of applause to Philippe and the panel. Thank you for another very rich discussion. Uh, Philippe will be back with us for another marathon of moderating uh, tomorrow. But enjoy a well-earned rest, Philippe. And Thank I you. look forward to seeing you bright-eyed and bushy-tailed tomorrow morning. Likewise. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are almost at the end of day one. But before we close, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about how new European Bauhaus principles in life projects. So, let me welcome our guests for this closing session. Delighted to have with me and Angelo Salsi, who is okay. Head of Natural Resources, Climate, Sustainable Blue Economy and Clean Energy Department at the European Climate, Infrastructure and Environment Executive Agency, better known to all of you as CINEA, and Christian Strasser, Head of the Life, Energy and Climate Unit, also at CINEA. Gentlemen, welcome. We've had an incredibly rich day of discussions, today focusing on issues about mindsets and behavioural change and so on. But in a broad sense, Angelo, um, I want to go back to where we started the day because the commissioner, uh, Commissioner Sinkevichis, uh, was talking this morning about um, the Green Deal as a way to connect, to make it a positive, a human-centred experience, a cultural experience. How do you see this fitting with the broader framework of those very high Green Deal ambitions? Microphone, yes, yeah. uh, I have it. Uh, so the Green Deal, first, everything you hear is green. So I don't know whether it's a deal, but certainly it's green. <laughs> and uh, the, the Bauhaus, uh, how does it fit? Uh, uh, the Bauhaus is, the, is sort of uh, uh, underlined or, uh, or presented with three words, usually. So it's the word is sustainability, it's the word uh, affordability, and the word aesthetic, mm. OK? So if you look into the Green Deal, sustainability is the essence of the Green Deal. It is designed in order to reach uh, as far as possible this concept. I mean, there is no theoretical absolute sustainability. Everything you take uh, in one way or another, you have an impact. So, uh, but the sustainability is there, is in the main fabric of the, of the Green Deal. The second element, affordability, I think it's a great... Uh, it, it has always been there, the concept, but if you look at the just transition uh, uh, mechanism, so the logic of uh, uh, considering that the ecological transition has to be for everyone and not only for the uh, white Caucasian and rich people, uh, but it has to 
bring along all, also those that cannot afford, for example, buying an electric car, mm. uh, then uh, the, the, uh, the affordability element is again into the, into the basic genetics of the, of the Green Deal. And I think this is a great improvement of the narrative of the European Union. It has been there, but in a more disguised way before. Now it's really uh, up in the, in the narrative. The last element, which is really the novelty, if mm. you want, of the Bauhaus, is the aesthetic element. Not that the Europeans don't like nice things. <laughs> uh, we have a certain drive, if you want, for beauty and aesthetics, uh, depending from the fluctuation we have in our history or society. Uh, but indeed, putting it into the, in the, into the political it is a breakthrough yep. in itself. So Absolutely. Uh, and that's why that title of our event here, with the word beautiful in the middle of it. We don't often talk in EU policy circles about beauty, Christian, uh, do we? Um, how do you see it? Would you agree this is, that's the key element that was missing, perhaps? Uh, Clara Della Torre spoke this morning, uh, the Deputy Director General, uh, about connecting the Green Deal to our living spaces. Uh, and um, Ursula von der Leyen has talked about it as of the Green Deal. Is that how you see it? Would you be that poetic about it? Yes, okay, good afternoon. Um, the aesthetic aspect of it um, might play a role in all that, but I see the Bauhaus element as well from coming from the history, from the 20s of last century, in mm -hmm. fact, where it was a game change in terms of profound trans, uh, transformation. Something had to happen. And I think, and I come to a broader aspect here, this uh, profound transformation is also the key element today, because we are really at the verge of doing something in terms of climate change, you know? So the Bauhaus is also an element for me of this uh, profound trans transformation where, where we go and what we need to do. Uh, and indeed, the three elements of aesthetic is, we have it in the title of the conference, is uh, beautiful, uh, sustainability or sustainable, and in fact, the last one is together. Mm. And um, in the aesthetic part of it, we have in the clean energy uh, transition sub-program a lot of areas and a lot of aspects to do with buildings, with building renovations, etc. So in fact, in that sense, absolutely also aesthetic plays a role, and I think you catch the hearts with it. Yeah? Mm. So it plays a role where, in fact, do you, do, you invest something and what you do. And it's interesting you talk about catching the hearts because we had a fascinating discussion in an earlier session about incentivizing behavior and people saying, don't talk about carrots and sticks. Sticks are for pets, uh, not for human beings. And it shouldn't be about that. It should be about building a new culture, building a new ethos. For both of you, and Christian perhaps first this time, in terms of motivating ordinary stakeholders with a role to play, to really apply these principles, to, to if you like, get into the Bauhaus concept, yes. get it into their heads. What do you think is the key to driving that process now? And then we'll come on to how the program, the life program, and the sort of projects you fund can help. But in broader terms, what's the key to drawing them in? I think the key to drawing in is honesty, to have really a, co a communication with citizens, with stakeholders, which is true and fair, to bring them in, in fact, uh, because I feel a certain responsiveness. Yeah, people are aware of the climate change, are aware that something needs to be done, and I, in my view, prepared to do something. So, in fact, behavioral change can be achieved. We have to do it in a fair and honest way with citizens, explain them. The details we have heard today in this conference already about the different behavioral change uh, success stories from different projects, so I don't go into these details here, but in fact, uh, we, can, we, can, uh, we can achieve that. Yeah? Mm. And uh, I think the, the, the time is ripe for that. Absolutely. Uh, and you say people are aware, but Angelo, often I think many members of the public see this as a, uh, a negative. These are the things we're going to have to do and it's going to hurt. Do you think Bauhaus helps to convince people with this focus on improving our daily lives, on beauty, on our surroundings, helps to turn it from a negative story into a positive one? Well, we heard this morning about stories. Huh? We have to tell stories and give images uh, more than concepts. Now, the, the, the problem is that obviously the, the Bauhaus as a concept is potentially a very interesting element to, on which you can develop a storytelling yeah. and therefore creating images, positive images in the brain of people that later on they will try to emulate, follow or anything like that. But we have to populate that story. So yeah. we cannot stop at the concept and I think that's probably one of the most uh, powerful tools among the many 
have is uh, preach uh, like you act. So I would invite, for example, public institutions that are confronted with a, a choice. Uh, let's say I, have, I need a new school. I can do a new building or I can refurbish a very nice building which is completely empty. Which one do you take between the two yeah. things? OK, let's get down to brass tacks. Let's talk money. Uh, because the Commissioner said in his opening uh, video message this morning that funding is, of course, a key part of this story. Now, as I understand it, Angelo, we have 85 million euros dedicated to new European Bauhaus projects 2021-2022. But the idea is that many other projects will incorporate this as an element of, of context or priority. How is it actually going to work? And specifically, how do you see the role of the LIFE programme? Because also there will be money from Horizon Europe, from the single market programme and so on. How do you see the role of LIFE within this? I think the role of life is uh, to a large extent what you've seen already uh, during the course of the day. We had a number of projects that were not really designed up front to, to match all the parameters of the Bauhaus, but were touching one or the other. And, uh, and this morning during an interview I had, they asked me, how can one contribute to mm -hmm. the other? So life and, and the Bauhaus. And, and I go back to uh, my, my first reply to you. I think that life has a lot of stories and best practices and knowledge on sustainability, mm -hmm. whether this is energy related, the re circular economy, nature and biodiversity, whatever. Uh, while we are a bit less equipped in, in, in the part of the narrative on affordability and certainly even less on aesthetic. So probably what, uh, what we have to do in the, in the years to come, we have to populate the narrative of life to make it more cozy for those that want to design a project that targets, for example, even the, all the three aspects in one go. Mm -hmm. We did the same many years ago. They told us, ah, but you are not very welcome with research under life said, OK, fine, let's make it more welcome. So we started using a narrative mm -hmm. that welcomed the researchers. And so we have to do probably the same thing here. And I think that life will be a great instrument uh, for those that really want to push forward the concept mm -hmm. of Bauhaus with practical and mm. tangible examples. And as you say, we've heard a lot of inspiration here, a lot of examples of the principles, the values being applied, even though we didn't call it Bauhaus yep. until now. It's building on that. But, but Christian, if I was out there and thinking about mm, how do I, I, I'm interested in applying for some of this funding and so on, how are you, this is an enormous concept, new European Bauhaus, within something that people can tangibly see, yes, my project fits or it doesn't. Yeah. Okay, we have um, currently our calls, our annual calls running, yeah? And in fact, of course, I assume that somebody like you described now has an idea, has a concept what they want to do. And the first thing is, of course, to study the call documents because it's a huge information level there and uh, to see if the proposals fit into such calls. Yeah? And there are, I can tell you, regarding powers, even specific priority powers activities but in addition, of course, as we said now, many other activities around that are also related directly or indirectly to Bauhaus, to the Bauhaus idea. No? So setting up uh, a, a proposal needs time. Mm -hmm. yeah? The deadline for the current call is already end of November, so I can already say it's too late. For this year, <laughs> I would say it's too late. Yeah? Uh, the clean energy transition deadline is in uh, January, on the 12th of January. Uh, so set up, in fact, uh, so study your, your call documents, set up uh, a, 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 a consortium with partners, in fact, for that you need partners around. You can use the database of life where we have 6,000 projects, around 6,000 projects already in this database. We have also in the funding portal a database for beneficiaries, for partners, so that's important. Uh, and then, in fact, get advice from various sources. You can get advice from external consultants, we can get advice from national contact points, they help you as well, and also advice from us, from the Commission. Absolutely. In fact, where you can also also address your questions if something is unclear there. By the way, here I have to say that we are not advising people or beneficiaries on ideas or project topics. We just cannot do that because we don't have the resources for that. But more importantly, we cannot do that for, for transparency and fair treatment reasons. So we cannot really advise somebody, yes, your idea is very good. Uh, it will be... But 
It but you will be yeah. looking, as I understand it, Angelo, a last question, for innovative thinking, for projects that really are uh, identifying new ways of looking at issues, new approaches, because that is both crucial for part of the new European Bauhaus concept. It is, as we were saying earlier, transformational projects, but also delivered in a transformational way. How important is that innovative approach going to be, uh, not just now, but through uh, the long-running application of these principles? Well, I don't know if uh, innovative is, uh, is absolutely the, the right word or something that we should be looking forward uh, okay. uh, in absolute terms. Certainly, everything which is that brings us a step forward, and you call it innovative or not, it's a, it's a, it's a positive element. What, what I think here, what we're looking for is a new constituency or an additional constituency to what we already have under life. Under life, we, we typically have uh, all the world of the, the people taking care of nature and biodiversity and all the sectors of the circular economy, climate change, and so on. What we are missing to a certain extent is the world, for example, of architect, of urbanist. They do appear okay. uh, here and there, but it's not one of the constituency that you would immediately think when you think of life. And if you don't have these people on board, you hardly can really address or design a project which touches the three mm -hmm. elements of the Bauhaus. We have projects on uh, waste in the building sector. Fine, great. But this is just one slice of the, of the other thing. We have project on energy efficiency. Again, another slice. But you see, these slices are always divided one from the other and addressed in a, in a sort of a vertical way. I would like to see the more horizontal one, starting, for example, when we talk about soil, urban sprawl is something that damages soil. But urban sprawl is a result of urban planning. Urban planning is a result of urbanism, and so, so on and so on. So it's that connecting of the dots. <laughs> yeah. But to do that, and something we have talked about all day, it's about bringing all those disciplines mm -hmm. together, bringing in the people we haven't seen so much around the table uh, to come together to develop those ideas. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, that is all we have time for uh, today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, tomorrow morning, just a reminder, Bauhaus Radio starts at 8.30 sharp. Lots more interviews with change makers, with our policy makers. We will start the formal conference proceedings at 9.30 sharp. Uh, and we'll be focusing... For us because we're going to be focusing on transforming urban areas. We're going to look at topics, energy efficiency, the use of sustainable materials in buildings, and promoting sustainable transport. And we're going to start in the morning by hearing from Maria Gabriel, the European Commissioner for Research, Innovation, Culture, Education, and Youth. Uh, she will be speaking right at the start, so do join us on time. It only remains for me to wish you all a very pleasant evening. Thank you to all our speakers in the morning. Goodbye. Well done. Good evening.